we have reached the final in the Air Things Masters. Levon Ronian and Timur Jabo have been the strongest in the tournament and now they will fight to win the first major final in the Champions Chess Tour. The winner will take home $60,000 and qualify for the Tour final. So with two fantastic chess players in the final, we welcome you to the final two days of the Champions Chess Tour. Welcome to my humble abode. This time I'll be playing from Moscow, but here is where I live. And he found it! And he found it! He found found it. it. Oh, look at the bar! This is my usual work spot. I just want to see how he's suffering. Oh, 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 that I'm is serious. Oh. We need a very good mouse. There's the old mouse I use for all the other tournaments. It can be a little bit dark in here. This is a crucial moment now. I think Levon is bobbing faster than ever, Franka. <laughs> I'll certainly try to be in killer mode from the get-go. For winning is not enough, I, I need some more. It is a big day in the Champions Chess Tour with the first major final in the Tour, the winner. The one of these two who wins the final will take home $60,000 and qualify for the Tour Final. And to take us through the excitement in these two final days, Women's Grandmaster Ivanka Hauska and Grandmaster David Howell. And David, wow, what should we expect from a final between these two guys? I'm excited. Two mighty warriors. They've deserve to be here as well. They've been so impressive throughout. They've been by far the best two players of this tournament and anything could happen. It's hard to pick a favorite. Mm, and Ivanka, these two players, do you think they're feeling the extra pressure now heading into a final? I think they'll be feeling extra pressure and extra excitement. They'll be raring to go. They are so close to winning the Air Things Masters. Mm. And I do know that Levon Aronian is utilizing the power of Ponchik, ah. his dog. <laughs> he tweeted earlier on, together with Ponchik, we are very excited to make it to the final of the Air Things Masters. And uh, yeah, he had a very cute picture of the dog where I was like, ah. Fantastic. Ponchuk. It has been a lucky uh, dog, actually, for Levon Aronian, playing fantastically so far in uh, the Champions Chess Tour. First major Air Things Masters. We are waiting for that. We have it. <laughs> there we have it. <laughs> there you can see the cuteness and overload. It's, uh, you know, I just really like this dog. It's very ferocious. It likes aggressive openings and styles. And, you know, basically, Levon Aronian, with that power of the pup, he is really doing exceedingly well. All right, we're hoping Ponchik is ready to cheer for Aronian as he faces another fantastic chess player, Timur Rajabo. Uh, we did have two, have two very exciting semi-finals, but in the end, Rajabo and Aronian convincingly made it to the final. Having a lead from day one proved decisive in the semi-finals of the Air Things Masters. Rajabov caught Dubov's queen in enemy territory. And there we see it, the computer moves just below the board there. It does suggest pushing this pawn forward, taking away the remaining escape square for the black queen. And the black queen is trapped. It just can't move. Next move, next turn, white will just try and attack this queen, try to win the queen. Um, Daniel Dubov, he blundered, he missed this move. He actually, he's losing now. He sacrificed like uh, half of his pieces in every game. It made me happy because I am playing for, for the counterplay most of the time. So kind of happy when people are playing like this against me. In the other semi-final, Vashir Legraf came under heavy endgame pressure, but had an opportunity to save himself. Hang on a second, can he not just take the knight? and yes. take the pawn. He chose instead to keep his bishop, but it didn't work out for him. He only has himself to blame if he loses this. Look, he's still got eight minutes. Why did he not pause? That was the key decision. White's knight and bishop now ganging up against black's remaining pawn. It does look like white is winning. What sort of have you done to become so good in this online rapid format? I'm not surprised myself, but since you guys are surprised, <laughs> I'll try to surprise you more. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, Levon Aronian is striking back to us there. We're not super surprised, Ivanka, but he really has played impressing so far in the tournament. Yeah, he's been so admirable. I mean, I've absolutely enjoyed his play. He's played in a very classical, aggressive style. And yeah, we have to remember in this field of top 10 players in the world, you know, it's not really surprising that he's up there. He's a magnificent player, so absolutely well-deserved. And the same goes for Timur Rajabov. Mm, absolutely. Now, let's take a 
look at how these two players actually made it to this final. We started out with quarterfinals where Raj Albov beat Jan Pomniachi, Levon Ronian beating Hikaru Nakamura, one of the favorites. So they got through to those semi-finals where Raj Albov, well, quite convincingly in the end beat Daniil Dubov, Levon Ronian knocking out Maxim Vashiela Grav in an exciting semi-final. And here they are in the final facing each other. Now, there will also be a battle for the third place in the tournament. Daniil Dubo and Maxim Vajelograv facing each other today and tomorrow, so we'll keep an eye on that as well. But it is all about the final, David, and how will the final be decided? So the final will take place over two days. We'll have one match today, it'll be the best of four games, and another match tomorrow, also best of four games. The same time control as we've had throughout this tournament, rapid games with 15 minutes per player, gaining 10 seconds after every move. If after tomorrow's match, we can't separate the players, then they'll head down to tie breaks. They will play Blitz and Armageddon Chess to decide a winner. We will find a winner of this Air Things Masters. And we know what, it, what it's all about. Well, obviously, it's all about the honor, but it is also about winning those $60,000 that the winner takes home. Runner-up, $40,000. And this is why we also have that fight for third place. The winner of that match will take home $25,000. Fourth place, $15,000. It's a lot of money. And Yvanka, this is actually also what our question of the day is all about. Yeah, so, you know, that is an insane amount of prize yeah. money. So we are asking everyone at home, how would you spend $60,000? Mm. Get creative with your answers. Please tweet us using the hashtag ChessChamps and uh, look forward to seeing them. Don't just say, well, actually, I was going to say, <laughs> I'm just going to say, I would like to spend it on handbags, <laughs> luxury <Exactly>. holidays, <laughs> cars. I would do the luxury holidays, <laughs> if I'm allowed to in 2021. Yeah, mm. that's true. Mm. That's true. Don't, don't put a spoiler in it. I want to see myself in the Maldives. Fantastic. All right. Well, talking about 2020 not traveling, it has been a very hard year for everyone, but especially for Levon Aronian. He did lose his wife in a car crash in March, but despite all the trouble he had, he still manages to keep a positive attitude. Ah, whoops, this is heavy. So, wait, it should be released of this or how does it work? No? Oh, ah. yeah, well, it requires some intelligence or just chess <laughs> players. What's it like being here in Stavanger and competing in a physical tournament again? I think it's great, you know, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a chance uh, to compete with the best players in the world and uh, I think I've missed this a lot. Obviously 2020 has been a different year for everyone, but nothing compared to what you have been through with your uh, wife. Tragically, I lost her life in a car crash in, in March. What do you remember from that very horrible time? Yeah, well... Uh... You know, just uh, going to the hospital, having hopes, losing hopes. It's, uh, I think it's a lot to bear for anybody. She was very optimistic, always pushed me forward. And then you wrote this beautiful post about your love for chess, this difficult time, and also finding new love. I didn't want people to look at her thinking that this is just, uh, just a grieving man, uh, you know, bouncing back or doing something like that, because it's, it's not true. On top of all of this, Armenia is going through a tough period in a conflict with Azerbaijan. Yeah, since the war started on September 27th, I haven't uh, had any normal sleep or I haven't really uh, had time to really concentrate on chess because I, I care so much about my friends who are there in the war and about many of my relatives, family. It's hard to imagine what this year has been like for you with everything that has happened, but how are you right now? 
I'm, uh, I'm a bit anxious, but generally I'm okay. You know, my mother says something that I really love, and it's an Armenian saying. It says, God gives you challenges modeled to your size. He doesn't give big challenges to small people. He gives big challenges to big people. And I think I'm a big person, and I'm, uh, I know I can take it. He is such an inspiration, Levon Aronian. Yamaka, how impressed are you with him after this very um, hard year for him that he's still here fighting, obviously one of the very best chess players in the world? Yeah, it's just very impressive what he's doing. You know, it is you know such a difficult thing that he's been through, one of the worst things that can ever happen to anyone. And uh, he is still impressing over the chessboard. You know, for me, that's just admiration and I just think that he's looking like a rock and I, I have so much just uh I, I just know he's kind of becoming my idol yeah and uh David he is mentioning also a conflict um it is very special now because the conflict Armenia has been through has been a, a you know a conflict with Azerbaijan the country of Timur Rajabo now we are heading into a final with these two players from these two countries do you think that affects them at all um, it might affect them, it might be at the back of their minds, but these guys, they are professionals. Um, they just want to win on the chessboard. They will be able to put that away and just focus on playing their best chess. And um, obviously it just, I mean, that tension, it will be on their minds, but I'm hoping that that will give a bit more spice to the games on the board. And uh, Timur Ajabo, he also made a comment about the conflict with us, Barjan and Armenia regarding now playing Levon Aronian. I think from both sides, uh, we were always for the peaceful resolution of the conflict. Unfortunately, it had to be resolved in this way. But um, you know, we're used to it. We're professionals. I don't, uh, I don't really think about such things. I don't know what he will say about it. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to uh, be a chess professional and uh, just think about it. I'm very happy when we win, of course, and uh, especially when it's the national team that wins, uh, let's say, in, in our matches. And uh, yeah, but... Uh, I'm trying not to think about such things, trying to concentrate on the game. And it is now all about the chess. It is the final in the first major in the Champions Chess Tour, the Air Things Masters between these two guys, Timur Rajabov and Levon Aronian David. They've been two of the biggest names in chess for 10, 15 years. Now they face each other in this final. Who's the favorite? Oh, it's so tough to call. Um, I. Well, I think it might be Aronian. He's the most experienced guy actually in the whole field in this tournament. And um, I think he's the guy to beat. It just feels like he's peaking at the right time. He feels inspired. Some of his chess has been phenomenal. And I know Yvanka has a different opinion. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I have to take the opposite. So, but I'm a big admirer of Roger Boss' play. And he's been so calm, so collected, very powerful. He has even managed to just basically switch styles when he's needed to. He's been very chameleon, like play aggressive, mm. play defensive. And I've just been mightily impressed. Mm. And we do know with his online format, players are sitting at home all over the world. But actually, we ended up with two players in the exact same time zone in Armenia and Azerbaijan. It's getting to 6 p.m. for these two players. So, Ivanka, are we seeing the perfect time to play chess here now? <laughs> it could be. Yeah. It absolutely could be. These, perhaps it's no coincidence that these two are our top finalists. This is the ideal situation to play chess. And we see clocks ticking now one minute away from the first game in the final between these two and David. Two players we mentioned, they've been in the top for so, so long, faced each other many times. What are their head-to-head -head scores? Yeah, so we do see on the screen their scores against each other. These are the scores in speed chess, in rapid and blitz chess. And it's very, very close. Um, Timur Rajabov is actually slightly ahead here with six wins to Levon Aronian's five. But they have beaten each other on many occasions. Both of them are capable. Um, this one is so close, it's going to be too tight to call. Um, it will come down to who has the better nerves on the day. And here they are, they are ready. Timur Rajabov and Levon Aronian, they will play the final. And we also see Maxim Vajelograv and Daniel Dubo playing in that game, that match for third place, taking home more money than the fourth place. But it is all about the final. It's all about these two right now. Timur Rajabov with the white pieces, what should we expect? 
I think he's going to go for Levon with a very aggressive style. I think he's going to want to establish that he is on form. And uh, yeah, you can see he has just opened with the Queen's pawn. And uh, I'm expecting to see Levon again battle for the centre. Yeah, so Levon Aronian as black. He loves to occupy the centre. Black now fighting back in the centre with the pawn. And Black's now developing a bishop. Um, both sides developing a bishop, both sides fighting for the space, trying to get their pieces into the centre, into the game as early as possible. And Levon Aronian as Black has snatched a pawn. Black is temporarily a pawn up. Both players playing extremely quickly. Um, Timur Rajabov, meanwhile, winning back his pawn. <laughs> both players, they've definitely done their homework here. This is a variation of the Queen's Gambit, um, and one of the most popular openings in chess. Um, a lot of you might know the Netflix series as well, the Queen's Gambit, but this is the bread and butter for these two players. They've studied this type of thing before. And Timur Rajabov, as white now, is the first player to pause, the first player to think. Um, black, Levon Aronian with his last move, bringing that black queen out very early on. Um, to try and target some pawns. And White gave a check. Now we see a trade. White Bishop taking off, uh, uh, taking off a knight. Black has won a pawn. He's given check. White's king has moved. White's king will not castle. So much action here so early on. Um, and Timur Rajabov, he, he is the one thinking. White is temporarily a pawn down, but he's closing his eyes. He studied this position before. It's a very popular position. He was just trying to recall his homework. He was just trying to recall what he has studied. This is very tense. This shows both players want to win this, uh, this early stage. No solid chess here. No boring chess. This is all drama early on. Black grabbing a pawn, but both kings will become big, big targets. Well, get this, <laughs> David, because the players actually are repeating the same line that they played just a few days ago oh. in the preliminaries. So, yeah, this, well, this is just brilliant because we're going to get to see opening preparation in action. Yeah, so it will come down to maybe who has the best coaches, who has done the best research. Um, the players, they've been so busy over the last few days playing a lot of chess and um, they do work with other grandmasters. Those other grandmasters might have been putting in the hours, burning the midnight oil, just trying to figure out how to win from this opening. And we do see White's bishop retreat there. We normally don't want to retreat our pieces when we're going on the attack. But Rajabov um, had to do that and Black, White's bishop retreated. So Black's knight jumps forward. Those two knights now in the centre of the board, nicely centralised, um, controlling a lot of squares. Personally, I like White's position, but at the same time, Black is a pawn up. So Black has something <laughs> to hold on to. Are they still repeating this game? They're still repeating this. It's all going to hinge now on this next move. OK, we have a change because uh, he has moved his rook. And in the earlier game, he moved the queen. So that's it. This is the improvement that uh, yeah, White has in store. Yes, and we do see Black's king there. It castles itself to the right side. It goes, tries to hide in the corner. It needs to seek safety. Um, the onus is on White, remember, a pawn down to justify that sacrifice. Um, this is very, very tense. How did that game end um, between the last time? draw. Okay, so they did draw in this opening previously, but I do think a draw is maybe one of the least likely results because this is so complex. Um, you see White's king there at the bottom. It's just a bit oddly placed. Um, it hasn't castled. White's rooks, meanwhile, are very active. And White there pushing a pawn at the corner, um, <laughs> trying to maybe create some targets against the Black King this time. Um, and Levon Aronian does not panic. He moves his rook, um, the black queen and the black rook in the middle there, lining up against White's knight. Um, Timur Rajabov, we've, we've likened him to a Jedi knight, a Jedi warrior uh, in the past. And here he's just closing his eyes, trying to recall, um, recall what he has studied. Uh, both players, imagine we're on move 19 and they've both got more time on the clock than they actually started with. Um, and we are still in known territory. Many, many games have been played in this position. I have to say, most of the games in the database that I'm looking at have ended in a draw, uh, but occasional there have been some white wins. And again, Rook moves across to deliver a check. We've seen that before. And it's very important that the king doesn't hide itself in the corner. Instead, it moves towards the centre. Yeah, so Black's king, it was in the centre a few moves ago. It moves back towards the centre now. Um, and if we bring up the analysis board, we can see where the tension lies at the moment. Um, it's all about this line. Black's queen and Black's rook um, here, they line up against the white knight in the middle of the board. 
White has to do something about this knight. Can he protect it? He says no. He gambits this knight. He sacrifices this piece. He's saying to Levon Aronian, go for it. I dare you. Take this knight because then White would win. White would attack the queen. And when the queen moves, White's rook would win the opposition rook. That is why Levon Aronian in this position did not get greedy. He did not take that knight. Have we seen this position before, Yvanka? We have seen this position before. <laughs> yeah, this is still very much known. And uh, funnily enough, every single game played has ended in a draw. Wow. So I First started... time for everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still not a very peaceful position, despite the result of that. There's still a lot of danger for black to navigate, especially with that king that can be a little bit exposed. Yeah, both kings could potentially be exposed. And um, meanwhile, I said the tension was all about that knight in the middle of the board. White's knight has retreated. It was under attack. Um, the white knight trying to trade itself off for black strong knight. And just look at Timur Rajabo. We've seen him in this position many times uh, during the tournament, closing his eyes, getting into that zen motion. But never this early in a game. It, it's definitely it must be the final, the, the tension already starting he's already feeling it yeah this is the big thing you know you do have to calm your nerves you do have to not get overexcited because the ideal state and Rajabov has so far been so good at this mm -hmm. is just to be calm a little objective and just understand the position and recognize what you have to do and you can only really do that by following David's advice and uh, talking to your pieces mm. this is so important and uh, there we see the king has recentralized itself. <laughs> This is uh, very deep, <laughs> very nuanced stuff here. Um, both players, having studied this position before, clearly it has come up um, in games in the past, so they've done their homework, but these are deep moves. Black actually spent so much time with his king already in this game. We've only seen 22 moves. Black's king, it's had the time to castle itself and then <laughs> bring itself back towards the center already. Black's king just teasing the white army, maybe just saying, okay, you can't target me on that side. Um, you can't target me in the middle anymore and the Black King going on a bit of an adventure here. But I don't know. Somehow it does feel like Rajabov maybe is a bit less uh, familiar with this type of position. Well, he's we see it on the clock, don't we? We see it on the clock. He yeah. spent two minutes more. And you can see by his posture there that he's desperately trying to recall his theory. Because despite these funny King moves, this position is still well known, still uh, has been played before. And... The, the common move there has for white now is to be to capture the knight in the center. But if, a re well, okay, we are following the realms of well-trodden paths. Yes, um, this is the thing about chess. Sometimes we see a new position as early as move three or move four. Here, we're already on move 23 and we st we're still within the realm of established, um, established theory. And we've seen games in this position. Um, that's the beauty of chess. You, you never know what to expect. You never know what you need to study in advance. Um, a lot of players like to freestyle, but these players, clearly, they have done their homework. And there, white's queen. Um, it shifts herself to the edge of the board, giving check to the black king. Um, Levon Aronian needs to maybe move that king or block the check. I would prefer to block that check. Um, when, you're under, when you're in check, there's three ways to run away. You can block the check, you can capture the piece that's checking you, or you can run away with the king. Levon Aronian chooses the blocking option. Um, that he's offering a queen trade, and that is because if we do a count, black has an extra pawn. So Rajabov, he will not trade the queens. Mm -hmm. We do see the bar giving an advantage to white in this position. Um, is he better in this position or is it not that significant? I would say it's not too significant right now. It's still quite an early stage. Black has an extra pawn. So although white has decent chances, um, it might not be enough for a win. It's just enough to compensate for his mm. lack of um, that pawn. Um, I think it, it will come down to whose position is easier to handle or more natural. The moves are more natural. Um, the plans are more natural. Um, I think this one is still definitely in the balance. What about yes. you, Ivanka? Who do you prefer? I, I prefer white because I really like my king to be safe. Um, but there is the material deficit. But I really love this next move, centralising the queen. And I suspect that this queen has relocated to the centre. Well, not only because it was under attack, but, you know, it's perhaps eyeing up that pawn on the right side, which is totally alone. It's isolated. And if I can win it, I will. Yeah, so this pawn, how do you want to win it, Yvanka? You want to win it with your queen? Yes. With my queen or my rook? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fast. <laughs> so the queen can attack this pawn, this lonely, isolated pawn at the corner of the board, um, or the rook can come to attack it. So white does have ideas of his own. Also, 
if this pawn disappears, note how white has already prepared for a potential pawn race. White's pawn is very far advanced. So if it's, if it's rival, this black pawn disappears, the white pawn will race towards the end of the board. This is white's plan um, to win this isolated pawn. Meanwhile, black is trying to trade the queens. He's begging for a queen exchange. Um, he's just saying, I have this extra pawn temporarily. If he can get rid of this queen, then he might be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a critical moment for Timur Rajabov. Does he save this queen or does he allow the trade? Yes, very interesting position. Um, and funnily enough, we are now in new territory. This position has never been seen before, but it has been analysed in June 2020. I mean, I, this is the beauty of modern day chess. You know, we're so advanced with technology. We can actually see, see that someone has been analysing the position, but not necessarily who. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, Timur Rajabov, he chooses not to allow the queen exchange. We do see the, below the players' cameras the computer suggestions and the computer's top three suggestions are to avoid a trade of queens. So White should not allow the queens to leave the board. He is a pawn down, remember. Um, so Timur Rajabov, again, closing his eyes. Is he trying to recall something he studied before? Was he that guy on the chess database who has analysed this with a computer engine? Was it one of his coaches, maybe? Um, Maybe he's trying to recall something. Personally, I think he's seen this position before, but um, he might uh, just as likely be just trying to work things out, trying to find the best square for White's queen to run away to. Yeah, you have to also remember that how playing with the white pieces is like having the serve in chess. And uh, basically, you don't really want to be kind of tricked into a line where you have to kind of agree a draw. So I think Rajabov will be looking at ways where he can avoid repeating the position three times because then that would be just a draw. And uh, you can see Levon Aronian looking so calm and confident there. And uh, Rajabov desperately trying to recall his theory. Yeah, and Aronian still has more time than he started with. They started with 15 minutes. Levon Aronian is black. He's got 15 and a half minutes after 26 moves. Mm -hmm. um, imagine these players, they have such great memories, um, but they also work extremely hard. That's how Levon Aronian, he's able to gain this small edge, this small advantage at, on the clock at this early stage. And there we see Rajabov, meanwhile, not trading the queens. That's a good decision. Will it be the best square for the white queen? We will find out. But either way, it's a good strategy to keep the queens on, keep the tension as long as possible. You were talking about, David, uh, this game, the way it's progressing. It could be all about what coaches has done the best job looking deepest into this exact position. Do we know anything about the coaches of these two or what players they like to work with? Yeah, it's a bit of mystery mystery, I guess, yeah. behind uh, both of the players, their coaching teams. I know that Lavon Aronian, he, in Armenia, he is the big dog. He is a bit of a celebrity and all of the younger generation, at some point, he's worked with them, mm. partly to help their own, help their careers, but also to kind of give him this fresh uh, perspective, this inspiration and that youthful energy um, that they bring. And um, I know in recent years, he has been working with some young Armenian grandmasters. Wow. Um, I don't know about uh, recently, but either way, he does have a support network around him. Timur Rajabov, meanwhile, he's great friends with some Indian chess players, some Russian chess players. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly who is helping him right now. Maybe Ivanka knows more, but... Uh... Yeah, so uh, I, I also know with uh, Aronian that, you know, the Aronians and us, actually the Azeris are actually a very close-knit chess community. They all help each other out. And uh, you can watch them at Olympiads and you kind of very, you almost envy their kind of oh. team spirit. So, but I do know that uh, um, Rajabov is very good friends with Sergei Karyakin. Yeah. And uh, I think the two have worked together in the past. And I also wouldn't be surprised if there's some as, as a, as a Bajan players helping mm. Rajabov out. You know, like I said, there is something beautiful about their team spirit. Yeah. Both of these players, I mean, the, um, their countrymen, they're so kind of uh, proud and they have these training camps quite regularly just where they uh, the Azerbaijani players they can train together all the time I know in England it's like the opposite we're lone wolves mm. but maybe that's why these guys uh, they're doing so well they have such great support around. It's, it's like we see in the Queen's Gambit as well where uh, the American team they're just not working together and, and they're so envious of the Soviet team where the players are always working together helping each other if one player is in a final and it's eventually when the Americans start working together that Beth Harmon is starting to do very well. 
Yeah, I mean, that is the ideal, actually, way to learn chess. I mean, mm. I've been asked that many times. And uh, the words of a trainer that he's once told me, he said, you know, you've got to have fun with chess. You've got to improve your enjoyment. And the only way you can really do that is by working together with other people and just making sure chess is as much fun as possible. You know, find some sparring partners and just get playing. Because honestly... If you're studying chess by yourself, it's a bit difficult. It's not easy to do. You have to be a super focused individual. And I think, especially in the West, we kind of admire these lone wolves, like your Bobby Fischer type. But it's not the most optimum kind of way of studying. Mm. Yeah, and I think this is a tip for everyone at home as well. Um, if you're just picking up chess, if you've only, if you've only uh, come to it in the last few months, the best way to learn is to play with others and discuss the ideas afterwards, discuss um, what you were thinking, try and listen to what they were thinking. You'll take on board new ideas, especially if you've both got different styles. Um, if you're an attacking player, try and talk to a defensive player, see what they're thinking, pick up those defensive skills. Um, and the more you learn, the more you I mean, discuss with others, um, just the wider and broader your chess skills, your chess knowledge um, will become. So um, meanwhile, on the board, we do see the queens doing a merry, <laughs> merry little dance. Um, black, Levon Aronian, he's begging for a queen trade. He's been trying to force that queen, uh, the queens off the board for the last five or six moves now. Um, and <laughs> Timur Rajabov, the white queen, keeps retreating, keeps <laughs> running away, keeps saying, no, no queen trade for you. Um, but who will, who will prevail? Will white be able to keep the queens on the board and get at the black king? Or will Levon Aronian manage to force an endgame? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, could we do that? Could could Rajabov be like, um, well, sorry, Aronian be super pers persistent? <laughs> just go, yeah, swap of queens. I'm going to chase your queen around the board and keep it going until the end. Or is there some trick? Yeah, so if we do bring up the analysis board, we can see what Levon Aronian is thinking about right now. We've mentioned he's been begging for this queen trade. Maybe he'll bring his queen down again. <laughs> <laughs> this tension. Um, the black queen defended by the rook at the top of the board here. And if wherever white's queen runs, um, if it goes up the board, the black queen will follow it. If it goes back, the black queen will continue to follow it. We've seen um, wherever the white queen goes, the black queen will keep chasing the white one. Um, <laughs> it's like a game of cat and mouse right now. <laughs> the queens can, I mean, can white find a safe square to avoid this trade? It's not easy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really like this, actually. <laughs> it's not often you see the queens insisting that, hey, you're going to swap off. Because the thing is, you know, Rajapov is a pawn down. And once the queen gets traded, then the danger to black's king gets minimised. So you really do want to keep the, the queens on the board. Um, but yeah, do you think we'll see it? Do I... you think we'll see? I, I, I'm kind of, I'm hoping that we're going to see a queen I, chase. I think the queen chase is uh, is about to continue, um, Levon Aronian, as black. The main problem is um, you are a pawn up, yes, but the black king in the middle of the board is not going to feel entirely safe until the queens disappear. Also, we did mention that isolated pawn, black's corner pawn up there on the top right-hand corner, um, that will be a weakness as long as the queens survive. Um, it will be a target. It's just hard to find an alternative plan for black apart from trying to chase the queens um, apart from trying to trade off those queens, um, blacks, you notice blacks pieces as well. They're a bit more passive than whites. Um, blacks bishop there at the top of the board, a bit blocked in, not doing anything. Blacks rook in the top right corner, not, uh, top left corner, sorry, um, not doing anything either. Um, yeah, normally when you have a weaker king and when your pieces are a bit worse than your opponents, a bit less active, then a queen trade does save you. That's why Levon Aronian um, has been angling for that over the last few moves. But meanwhile, he is thinking here, his first really long think of the game. So maybe he does see an alternative um, to that queen move. Maybe he's being a bit more ambitious. Maybe he's thinking, OK, I'll let you keep the queens on the board. <laughs> You've run away enough now. Um, it's time to find something else. Mm -hmm. um, critical moment, I do think. And yeah. both players spending that time finally um, as we get to move 28. They've played mm -hmm. so quickly so far. Yeah, it's kind of reflective of their styles as well. I, I do know some previous world champions when kind of faced with a surprise. One of the things that they would do is they would respect the value of that surprise and uh, just agree the draw and then go back to the drawing board. But, you know, now we have a different type of tournament. Like in those days, you know, you had these super long tournaments, maybe with 16 rounds or so. And now it's like, OK, well, chess is pretty much faster. So... Would you just agree the draw and kind of uh, leave it to the seconds to work out the improvements for game I, three? I, 
I mean, personally, I like to fight on the chessboard. I think these players like to fight as well. Um, and I don't think we'll see the position repeat itself three times. I think one of the two players will show that ambition and continue the game and continue trying to fight. I think both players have reason to fight as well. Rajabov, he does have that the white pieces. He does want to kind of lay down the law and say, OK, I've got that psychological advantage very early on. But meanwhile, Aronian, he is a pawn up. So he does have something to cling on to, um, something to play for. He's about to make a move, it looks like. Okay. Well, there we have it. He has varied. He has not continued with the queen chase and instead developed a bishop. So now, the, now white really has to do something because if the development is allowed to continue, then black will be absolutely fine. And uh, how would I, how would I kind of? I'm thinking about what I would do as if I was if I was white. Whether I can be so bold as to just go pawn hunting. Yeah, and. Um... OK, let's bring up the board. Which pawn do you want to hunt down, Yovanka? Do you I want to a capture a pawn immediately? I have a choice, right? I can, I can capture the one pawn with my rook. Let's go for that one. So white can take a pawn now, actually eyeing up the black king as well indirectly. This bishop is now pinned. It cannot move because then the black king would be under fire. Um, I think Levon Aronian, maybe his idea is to start using his own rooks um, to find those open lines. Maybe this rook will head across to attack the white queen. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the other rook will head across just to try and trade itself off for White's most active piece right now. Um, we could see some trades if this happens. Um, if White... Okay, oh, well, yeah. we're, we're we had it. it. <laughs> yeah. There's always some relief, you know. There's, they kind of say that the secret aim of a gambiteer, a gambiteer is someone that uh, sacrifices pawns, mm. is to win back your pawn. And you get a thrill when you're kind of like, yes, I'm not a pawn down anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the game can begin. Mm. I mean, I, I, the one thing that did concern me a little bit about being greedy and grabbing that pawn is the fact that the white king isn't entirely safe and that's something that in a, in a type of position like this I'm constantly aware of because yeah you can see it there the, the rook is now attacking the queen the queen must move and uh, the white king can be vulnerable there isn't any too much defenders there yeah, so especially if the queen moves later on, it's not possible at the moment, but later on you could imagine the white king getting mm. trapped on the back rank. It doesn't have too many escape squares. Um, for, temporarily, the queen covers this check. Black cannot give this check, but you could definitely imagine a scenario where white's king starts to become just as much of a target as the black king, um, whose king will be weaker. It's not clear. Levon Aronian giving back his extra pawn and now with this last move, starting to launch a counter-attack. Suddenly, White's Queen is the one under fire and White has to make that decision um, where to run away to. So it's, it's heating up in this game, then? It is heating up with, uh, with, the, with uh, the pieces all developed. It definitely is heating up. And it's all going to be about peace activity and king safety. Mm. Um, I, I basically think these two phrases, as soon as I get a, a position where there's just rooks and queens on the board, I'm like, OK. King safety, peace activity, maximise. And by peace activity, I actually mean that every single piece is actually working together. I don't necessarily want, as White has at the minute, White has a rook on one side of the board and the rook on the other side. They aren't coordinating so well, so I wouldn't necessarily say that they're especially efficient. Um, instead, what you want to do is you want all of your pieces to be almost lined up like black is. Like you know, those two rooks together, then the queen are nicely... As, but uh, the only spanner for black is the king's safety. If that king were somewhere, maybe I could re re change the pawn structure or something <laughs> and just put it hiding away somewhere, then black, I think, would be almost better. But with the king in the middle of the board, it's never going to be easy. Yes, and white, white queen has run away from that attack from the black rook. Now Levon Aronian, he needs to continue somehow creating threats. If he does take a timeout, if he does play a slow move, then suddenly the pressure will be back on his king. Um, White will be able to re-centralise that rook on the right side now. He'll be able to bring it towards the middle maybe and attack the black queen. Um, as Yovanka mentions, black's pieces, they're nicely huddled together, these black pieces. Um, look at this. They're all kind of in close <laughs> vicinity. But maybe the issue is this pin. This bishop cannot move. Maybe black wants to somehow get his king to safety. It's hard to do that. If the king steps backwards, then suddenly this pawn is undefended. It's very hard for Black to find a move at the moment. Um, I personally would expect him to maybe try to trade this rook um, for White's rook. This White rook is just too active, staring at the Black King. Just get that rook off the board. When in doubt, just get rid of your opponent's strongest pieces. And we might see a trade of pieces here. Um, other alternatives might be to try and improve the Black Queen. Um, maybe you want to trade off the other rook 
on the other side of the board, Black's other rook could swing across and offer a trade. I think Black here, the pressure might be on him temporarily. Um, so he does need to start thinking about how to get rid of White's best pieces. Mm. I love watching these two players play because it's right now, it's so intense to look at them. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, you can definitely see them thinking hard, both of them. And the Vonneronian is now thinking about his next move. Two minutes here. Yes. I mean, the thing is that if, because the kings are so unsafe and the dynamic potential of all the pieces, as David mentions, is so great, you really have to walk a bit on a tightrope here. One mistake could be fatal. So that is why you want to take care of every single move that you make. And uh, I think David really summed it up beautifully. There's one piece that is really disturbing, black. So I think definitely I expect to see a trade of those rooks. Mm. And uh, I'm just puzzled as to what else Levon could be thinking about here. Um, this is a big time investment, almost three minutes on this move now. Um, I mean, he just needs to be maybe taking a step back, stop calculating these long variations. These players occasionally, they do um, think very, very deeply when actually just taking a step back and playing a simple move, getting rid of your opponent's most active piece. That is enough. And Levon Aronian, in his semi-final against Maxime vachel he did play some fantastic chess, but he did get low on time. Actually, both these players did get low on time in their mm -hmm. semi-finals. So if it does come down to a bit of a scramble at the end, um, a bit of a race, um, it's not clear who that would favour. Levon Aronian, meanwhile, I think he does need to make a move quickly. Um, Black is potentially going to be under pressure and he cannot be under pressure on the clock as yeah. well. Well, I can actually guess at who's going to be the one to favour in the terms of time travel because we've seen Rajabov play the most amazing move with one second left on his clock. <laughs> that is some serious calmness there. That's kind of like almost training Ice at man. some Buddhist monastery there for the one, one year. No, no, this, this was seriously impressive. And uh, it's difficult to match that. I've never seen anyone so composed before. Uh, and uh, yeah, he is looking composed, Timur Rajabov, with White. Yeah. I asked this earlier and you preferred uh, White's position, Rajabov's position, Yovanka. Is that still the case? Yes. OK, I've, uh, I've committed myself. I'm stubborn. So yeah, I'm going to be White. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> white. <laughs> well, but uh, White is a lot better on the clock as well. Levon Aronian now down to five minutes, going to take under five minutes very soon here. Yeah. He has to make a move. Yeah, I do find this uh, this pause a bit strange for uh, Levon Aronian. Remember, he was a pawn up for a long part of this game. He gave that pawn back just two moves ago. And two moves later, he suddenly spent a huge amount of time on the clock. He, maybe he just didn't come up with the right plan or maybe he wasn't sure exactly how the game would pan out. But it just looks strange to me to give back the pawn and then start to think. Mm -hmm. um, it, it should have been the other way around. Think before you give back the pawn. Um, Levon Aronian here, he needs to move. I think black is fine as long as he trades off that white rook at the top left of the board, white's most active rook. If he trades it off, I think black's okay. If not, I'm starting to get worried for Levon Aronian. Okay, super exciting now then to see what move Levon Aronian will choose. Thinking for five minutes and he is under five minutes now on the clock and he is uh, thinking intensely about this. Team Rajabov not getting distracted by that crazy shirt of Levon Aronian here. I love his uh, style of uh, clothing. Always uh, something to talk about when we see Levon Aronian <laughs> coming to his computer. I have to say my favourite t-shirt of Levon Aronian was one with a picture of a cat with the words catastrophe. And I thought that was very <laughs> brave to be wearing to a chess game because you don't want your brain to even be thinking about the words exactly. catastrophe. Yeah. And there we see a tweet from Alan McCoy and he's saying, after three days, I think we now know Rajabov's lucky shirt and jacket combo. I do, <laughs> he does have this lucky, a lucky jacket. Exactly. Um, maybe it's just this routine. All players need a routine and mm. to feel confident when they get to the board. And OK, Timur uh, huh. Levon Aroni did not go for that rook exchange. Instead, he tries to trade the queens. We saw this happen a bit earlier on. The queens chasing each other around the board. Um, now Black offering a trade of queens. Would you go for it? Ivanka, I think there might be... Well, the thing is, OK, so the, my eye is drawn to the fact that there is a pawn that is on prees. And, you know, I am a pawn grabber. So the first move that I will be looking at is the most materialistic move is, OK, well, first of all, let us grab the queen and then snatch the pawn. Um, but that kind of goes against the instincts of the position, which is to keep the queens on, because everything kind of centres around the king. 
So I, I, I would be, I must admit, I, I don't think I would trade queens. Okay. I, I'm not going to trade queens because I think the big riding element in this position is just to attack. Yeah, and if we bring up the analysis board, we can see why maybe trading the queens isn't such a great idea. OK, he does give check to the Black King um, and the queens try to... Uh, <laughs> Black goes for that queen exchange again. Yovanka did mention if the queens do leave the board, maybe White can get greedy. This pawn is undefended at the side. White could grab this pawn, but maybe it's not such a relevant pawn right now. Black has options, for example. Black could try and win back a pawn. Um, OK, maybe this isn't the only way. There are other ways to try and win back this pawn. But either way... If this happens, if the queens disappear, then black will be breathing a sigh of relief. Black will be much safer. If white can keep the queen on to somehow get at the black king later on, then I think he'll be happy. The issue is, how do you do this? Black's queen also potentially dropping down to giving check mm -hmm. to the white king if it's allowed to. Um, this is tense. Can Rajabov keep the queens? I'm not so sure he can anymore. I'm not so sure he can, but however, this uh, white queen is defended. It is defended, and so that means that if a queen trade does happen, well, then you can start putting pressure on that weak pawn on the left side. Once you start honing in on that pawn, you're going to be an extra pawn up, and that's going to be good news for uh, anyone. Yes, and... Um... Ah, I'll see the thinking's <laughs> back. The Zen mode for Timo Rajavov. Will he now take the queen? Uh, it's a big decision now for Timur Rajabov and he does have a bit more time on the clock, but um, this is crunch time. And OK, mm. he doesn't trade the queens yet. He goes for the pawn immediately. Um, we highlighted that pawn. It was undefended. And why not? If you don't see any consequences, sometimes you can get away with uh, taking pawns. And mm -hmm. you like that move, Yovanka? Uh, uh, it's... Well, okay. What what am I what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of some checks because yes, the queens might leave the board, and I'm afraid that black might get in some checks. In which case, I'm trying to work out what's going to happen with the consequences of this uh, pin. So if we, we can have the board up and ready. Yeah, so if we um, yeah we bring up the board, we can see. I think it's very likely to happen as well. If the queens disappear, the queens can be captured. Um, and now you want some checks, Ivanka. I'm thinking of some checks or perhaps the kind of cage in the king. So attacking the king. The king mm -hmm. only has one square to run to. Maybe another check. Mm -hmm. um, attacking the king as well. Maybe eyeing up some pawns a bit later on. White's king continues to step forward. Maybe the white king is actually safe here. No more checks. And remember, black's bishop cannot move. Black's bishop is trapped. And well, we're we going to see a trade of queens. It has happened. And uh, now... You know, one of the things that's really annoying for, for Black is this pin. Hmm. You kind of, that, that rook on the, on, the, on the left side of the ball, that very far advanced rook, that really needs to be removed, I think. Yeah, it's time to get rid of it's that time, white rook. Yeah, it's, you know, either you're going to step back with the king or you're going to, you yourself, advance with your rook as far as it can go and just get mobilising because if... Whilst that pin remains, there's two pieces. That if you do some maths, that rook, that white rook is worth five points and it's holding down a rook and a bishop. Mm. And I don't like that. that. The maths equation doesn't quite work there. I'm not very good at maths. <laughs> <laughs> but there I go. I'm very good at that. So, and that's, I think, why we see this king, king retreat. Yeah, so black retreating the king, freeing up the black bishop to now move. It's no longer pinned. It's no longer tied down. White's Rook um, is attacking it, but once it moves, White's Rook might look less impressive. And um, I mean, I like that move by Black, by Levon Aronian, but it, the last few moves have cost him a lot of time. They've also cost him a pawn, remember? Black was a pawn up just six, seven moves ago. Now he's a pawn down. And Timur Rajabov playing so quickly, calmly. Um, if he, a White can somehow utilise that corner pawn, White's extra pawn is that one on the left there, on the left side. If he can later utilise that, start pushing it forward, then he has great chances to win. It does feel like Levon Aronian maybe could have done something similar, but kept equ material equality, not given that pawn for free. Um, I, to me, it does seem like I think White will have great winning chances a bit later on, and that is reflected in the computer evaluation of the bar, um, giving White almost a one-point advantage, and that's exactly because he has one extra pawn. One point. Yeah, and we can see the bishop retreating. So now um, what we're seeing Rajabov do is just try to consolidate the position. And he, he's trying to protect absolutely everything. It's actually been a very effective uh, strategy, especially when you're under time pressure, just to kind of consolidate all your pieces, huddle them together and protect everything. I know I've heard you talk about this yes. technique. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat sometimes. I do 
kind of worry that I'll blunder if I don't have too much time on the clock. So I like to keep everything protected. And White's bishop there drops into the middle of the board, protecting one of White's pawns. But also that bishop is now nicely protected by White's rook. Look at this, White's rook defending this bishop. The bishop defends a pawn, everything nice and safe here. The rooks, they can take care of themselves. They're big boys, they're big pieces. Um, but maybe White also has another idea to drop the other rook onto this square along this line. Imagine those two rooks lining up mm. together, creating havoc. Um, rooks love to team up together, uh, especially on those open lines, especially on that rank. We call it the seventh rank um, when there's lots of pawns, lots of targets. So um, I love this move by uh, Timur Rajabov. Bit of a defensive move, but a very sensible one, a practical decision. He yeah. just wants to put his king maybe in the center here on a very safe square. Um, the pressure's back on Levon Aroni, yes. one minute, and he has to justify being down a pawn. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the tension is rising. And uh, of course, our two players have a lot of support on Twitter. Mm. We have a tweet from Bowden Mandrik. He says, Timur Rajabov, Levon Aronian, battle of two greats. Odds 50-50. Anything can happen, but there will definitely be beautiful chess. And I agree with that. I, th I do agree that anything can happen. They've been so impressive. And what a move from Levon Aronian. <laughs> He's just like, I'm not going to play passively whatsoever. I'm going to throw my rook into the middle and I start attacking pawns. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I spoke about how most things were defenders for White. He just wanted to hold everything together. One thing that isn't protected for White is that pawn there, White's very far advanced pawn on the right flank. Um, and that is what Levon Aronian is going for with his rook. He's just trying to snatch back that pawn, but it does take a long time. It's going to cost him at least two or three moves to do that, to win that pawn back. Meanwhile, perhaps White is going to just forget about that pawn there on the right flank. He's just going to start racing his pawn on the other side, on that left. Um, his that pawn is, is a passed pawn. It has no rival. It, it will start to run very shortly and it will run fast. Mm -hmm. It might become a queen a bit later on. Um, Timur Rajabov, he's just weighing up now. Does he gambit that black, uh, white pawn? Um, does he let black go for it with his rook, costing that time, uh, yeah. costing the moves? So when you say gambit that pawn, what do you mean? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Um, so gambit's just another word for sacrifice. That's right. Hmm. Yes. So uh, it's uh, usually a kind of indicative of, uh, a, you know, you have a style in mind. You, if you want to gambit your pawn in the opening, that kind of means that you just want to throw your pieces forward, hmm. start attacking. Sometimes you're forced to gambit things just defensively just to kind of hold the position together because your position was quite bad. Mm. And so you're like, have a pawn and let me harmonise my pieces. Ooh, I'm getting the <laughs> puns in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Queen's gambit. <laughs> yeah, so normally a gambit, you give it up, but you have something in mind. You yeah. have something very specific in mind to get in return. And Timur Rajabov, he does not gambit that pawn. Um, instead, he pushes another pawn forward to protect it. White's pawn's now <laughs> flooding forward on that right side. Um, personally, I think that might be a bit weakening, um, but Timur Rajabov, he did snatch a pawn earlier and sometimes greed is good. Uh, okay, well, we can see, you know, Levon Aronian is actually targeting that pawn immediately. You thought it might be weak. Levon Aronian agrees with you and you can see the stretching is now in play. <laughs> Levon Aronian is getting ready for time trouble. He's just gone under the one minute mark, which does mean that players tend to panic. And uh, yeah, we have a beautiful pawn chain there on the right. <laughs> Yeah, Kaya does love her pawn chains. And <laughs> if we bring up the board, we can see white, <laughs> white pawns here, all on white squares lined up together. But they are on white squares, remember. So they have no control of the dark squares. And maybe with Levon Aronian's last move, pushing this king forward, does he want to go on a king march? Does he want to walk this king into the heart of enemy yeah. territory? Uh, maybe there's a very nice, safe square uh, for the black king. Meanwhile, white's king, um, white's king has stepped forward and the black has just placed his bishop. Look at black's bishop, actually, eyeing up this pawn potentially eyeing up pawns on the other side. White's bishop just looks like a pawn right now. It's yeah. blocked in by its own pawns, its own foot soldiers. Um, maybe the last few moves weren't so great by Timur Rajabov because I think now suddenly this white bishop, it's just not looking very impressive. Yeah, I agree with you there. You know, suddenly there was a very nice coordination with that bishop move. In fact, that pawn move that he made where he opened up his own bishop and got it to a beautiful square. And I'm just loving the coordination. And this is why Rajabov played a very... A move that actually would never have occurred to me. He kind of signaled the retreat and he's like, well, first of all, let me consolidate and perhaps exchange rooks in order to just kind of get rid of this kind of initiative that Black has. And uh, Lerone Aronian is like, no, I'm going to get active. So the Black rook now is a big nuisance.
Yeah, that black rook is deep in the heart of uh, white's territory there. It's actually going to try and harass the white king maybe from behind or from the side. Black's rook, it's very flexible. That black rook at the bottom, it can go to the, to the right, uh, to the left. It can do all sorts. It can just cause trouble, um, just cause distraction really. Um, and stop White from fulfilling all his plans. Timur Rajabov, he still has this extra pawn, but suddenly the last few moves, he's had to retreat one of his, one of his most impressive pieces, the White Rooks, looking very passive there. The White King steps forward, meanwhile. Um, a bit of a brave move there, allowing a black, the Black Rook to check from behind. Levon Aronian says, no, you would have blocked that check. So it's time for the Black King to activate itself. The Black King is going on a journey on those dark <laughs> squares. Remember, White has no control over the dark squares on that right side of the board because his pawns are all on the opposite colour. Um, so brave one there by Levon Aronian. We might see the Black King later start to penetrate into White's half. Um, meanwhile, Le uh, Timur Rajabov, being a pawn up, offered a trade. And Levon Aronian says, no. I know you're a pawn up. I know you want to simplify things and use your extra pawn later. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make it difficult. That black rook now eyeing up white's extra pawn. Yeah, definitely. One of the things you do have to remember in these kind of rook endings is that if you're given the choice active rook, active king, always go active rook. Don't just swap off because you, activity counts for everything. With one rook, you can actually terrorise your opponents. And uh, sometimes it's a bit unfair. You're <laughs> thinking, <laughs> why did you have to play so actively? But uh, the clock is ticking and Rajabov has two and a half minutes to Aronians just under one minute. <sighs> Tricky. Would you be getting nervous now, Yvanka, with less than a minute and a pawn down in Aronian's shoes? He looks pretty calm to me. He but... looks very calm. I mean, and in a final. In yes, a final. Uh, yeah, with sixty thousand dollars at stake, definitely, I would be getting nervous and I would be looking at uh, the most active moves and perhaps even trying to calm down because. There is a rush of blood to the head and uh, here we can see there's suddenly a lot of tension in the position because there's a lot of pieces on prees now. Yes, that's right. And Timur Rajabov, he might have a think here. This is a key moment if we bring out the board. This bishop is in a pin. White's bishop is pinned. It should not capture the opponent's bishop because then his rook would be attacked behind it. That's why he brings his rook across. Could we see a draw about to happen? We might see lots of trades on this square now. We could see all the pieces disappear on this square. Black would win back the pawn that he is down. OK, we're going for this line. We will see rook and pawn, four pawns against rook and four pawns. This should be a draw. Let's go back to the players. Um, we might see their faces. Are they happy with the draw? Will they, steep, will they keep trying to squeeze out mm. every chance they can get? Um, it's very balanced now. All the pawns are on the same side, so it's hard to push them forward and make a new queen. Um, Timur Rajabov attacking a pawn here. And he actually offers the draw immediately. Oh. And the players... It is a draw between Timur Rajabo and Levon Aronian in the first game, in the final. Timur Rajabo with the white pieces, is he the one who should be maybe the most disappointed with a draw here? Or do you think it's just an OK start for both of them? It's OK for both, but if anyone's unhappy, it is Timur Rajabov. Not only did he have the white pieces, he had an extra pawn for most of the game, uh, especially that second half of the game. He had a lot of extra time as well at mm. the end. Maybe a missed opportunity. Him. Mm, you did say, Ivanka, looking at this position from the beginning, it is a position that always ends in a draw. <laughs> so the history hasn't changed. Yeah, exactly. It got its fair result. Yeah, but what an interesting game. You know, the players had the chance to kind of repeat the position with this queen chase. Very unusual. But instead, they chose to play it out. And it did seem like Rajabov was getting the better of things. And with this extra pawn, I think he'll be feeling a little bit disappointed that he didn't perhaps put... Aronian under greater pressure. Mm, so where? So you were you were liking White in this position. Mm -hmm. You were liking Rajabo. Where did, maybe did he go a little bit wrong, not being able to fight for the win here, David? Yes. Yeah, so we did see a position where White had an extra pawn, and Levon Aronian, his last move is attacking White's pawn at the side of the board. The rooks are very kind of nasty pieces. They do have these long range attacking abilities, and here. Timur Rajabov, he went on the defensive. He pushed this pawn forward to defend its fellow. But he did create some weaknesses and allowed Black to push forward, attacking this pawn. And suddenly Black's pieces started, started to pour forward. I do feel maybe Timur Rajabov, he mistimed it. He had the opportunity to maybe activate his rooks. Potentially, he could have moved this other rook um, to create some trouble on this side of the board. I think it was just time to start forgetting about his pawn on the right here, start trying to push his pawn on the other side. This pawn is where his strengths lie. This is the side he should have been playing on. He played on the wrong side of the board, and a few moves later, um, the game was drawn. Uh, White just had nothing to do. He actually lost this pawn a bit later on, and yeah, they had to agree to peace. 
at the end of that game. Just a few minutes, we will be joined by a very special guest in the studio from Nigeria, a 10-year-old chess prodigy, Chani Adewumi. He's going to talk to us about his chess, and we're looking forward to that. After one game in the final, the first final match between Aronian and Rajabo, they are still equal. The first game with Rajabo white piece it, it ended with the draw. So still, the tension is there. Everything still to play for as Aronian in 15 minutes will be with white pieces in that second game. So much excitement to come in the final. All right, um, the players. Uh, Funny people they are. Uh, <laughs> some of them, they are great chess players. But the question is, can they also uh, do some nice cooking? We asked them um, how they are in the kitchen. All sorts of meat. Steaks, uh, hamburgers, fries, some meat. I made with my sister before chocolate cakes, cookies, pineapple pie, mac and cheese. So very simple stuff. There is no specialty. I sometimes make omelets with some vanilla soy milk so that it gets a nice um, sort of uh, yellow yellow color and some, some decent taste. Uh, that's, the, that's the closest. I really suck at cooking. I just cook like I would say to, to survive. Some meat, uh, salad, pasta. I hate it, I hate it. My specialty would be like eggs and uh, fried eggs and stuff. I do cook, uh, but I never get myself into much trouble. I do like the occasional uh, cut the buff. You take it to the oven, then you turn it upside down every three minutes until it's cooked to your liking, with some olive oil, of course. In my best days, I used to be able to do pretty good egg, like to boil it pretty well. If it's well boiled, it spills off very easily. So let's not, not laugh about my boiling, uh, egg boiling skills. There are various techniques. So first of all, you can uh, put the egg in the cold water and start boiling it. Then you can also put the egg only when the water is boiled. Boiling an egg is, is a particular art. Ah, David, are you impressed with their cooking skills? I'm impressed. Boiling uh... <laughs> an egg. Yeah, exactly. Still more than me, so... <laughs> All right. Now we are very excited. Uh, in very um, just a few seconds, minutes, we're going to be joined by a 10-year-old chess prodigy from Nigeria. He now lives in the US. Tani is his name, Yovanka. And, and who is he? Yeah, he has a very impressive backstory. He moved to the US. His family were fleeing Boko Haram. And uh, because of the troubles there, he had to move to New York. And uh, of course, you know, he left behind everything in Nigeria and you move into poverty. And yeah, what is what is amazing about him is that he was actually living in a homeless shelter and he learned chess and he won the New York State Chess Scholastic wow. Championships at the age of eight, just after only learning the game for a year. Wow. Unbelievable stuff. And uh, yeah, basically, he's a child with a star and ascendant. You know, mm. he's doing better and better in chess. And there you can see we have this amazing tweet from Bill Clinton. Mm. Refugees enrich our nation and talent is universal, even if opportunity is not. The story made me smile. Tani Tarula, you exemplify a winning spirit in chess and in life and kudos to your hardworking parents. You should all stop by my office in Harlem. I'd love to meet you. Ooh. Wow, can you imagine that? You know, that is just absolutely brilliant that he, yeah, that Bill Clinton is taking notice of his story and that anything is possible. Fantastic. And we are now so, so excited to welcome Tani to the show. Hi, Tani, how are you? Oh, struggling a little bit with the sound here, I think. Um, we are waiting for Tani to join us. I can see the Christmas tree in the background there. That's an impressive tree. Yeah, yeah very nice. Uh, very nice. It made, made me feel very festive mm. there. Mm. Oh, was, uh, was... ah, there we have it. Oh. Hi, Tani. Hi. How are you? Good. 
Good. We are so, so excited to have you join us. We are so inspired by your story, Tani. And uh, Yovanka just uh, told us, we know at only 10 years old, you've been through a lot of uh, hard stuff in your life. Now, what has chess meant to you? Uh, chess is a game of opportunity and you have to, every single move that you play, you have to get your chance. Even if it's the first move, you got to play. It's like an opportunity game. You, there's chances 50-50. You're going to win or you're going to lose. You want to win, but I mean, it's just <laughs> opportunity. Fantastic. And uh, we know you're 10 years old now. For how many years have you been playing chess? Around, I guess, two now. Two now. Two years only. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, but you've quite explosively become very good at chess then. Um, what do you think it is that make you so good in chess? Um, probably my talent and the work I put into chess at, and probably the way I play on the board and uh, thinking and uh, the cycle that I do on the board. Fantastic. And actually we talked about it. Uh, Bill Clinton invited you uh, to come play. Have you actually been uh, visiting Bill Clinton? Yes, I have. Wow, what was that like? <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of, like, a lot of statues and I was, like, so curious. What is this? What is that? What is this? <laughs> and that is this. It was a lot. So did you play chess with him? Um, yes, we played a few, few <laughs> games that I, <laughs> uh, I crushed them. <laughs> you, so you actually, you have crushed uh, a former U.S. president in chess. That must be, that must feel fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> then we can actually see. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> Wow, that's a lot of statues. Yeah, you're quite right there. So I just have to ask the question, who is your favorite chess player? And oh. What is your chess style? Mm, uh, <laughs> I could say Haikaru, but Magnus, Levon, I guess those are my three best. Mm -hmm. And your style? Aggressive. Aggressive. Ah, ah yay! We love watching aggressive chess. Yeah, David. Actually, actually, Tani, I've seen quite a lot of your games and I'm a big, big fan. What are your goals in chess? What do you want to achieve over the next few years? I want to, I want to become the youngest grandmaster. I'm working to it. Um, 2100 USCF and um, I don't know what my feet my fee day is right now. It hasn't updated, but I'm still trying to get some arms and get the GM youngest GM title. Yeah, but actually, so we know that 2020 has been a strange year. Probably you haven't been able to play too many over the board tournaments. So what should we expect from you already in 2021 then? 2021 should be a blast. I mean, I have played a quite bit of tournaments in 2020 over the board. Like I'm going to also play one today. Oh. Um, but uh, yes, it is tough going around, but um, I do play some over the board tournaments in 2020, but now it's 2021. So new fresh start. And how are you it's training? So You're just like people are still referring to 2020. Oh. It's, what, it's just two days in 2021. Just two <laughs> days. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and then how are you training? I mean, what is your favorite part? I'm probably studying openings and getting prepped for my opponents. If I don't know them, I just, and then I just prep, 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 and um, see if I can beat them. And I also do my prep over the board so that I could get a mindset, not I'm playing, I'm studying online. It's like, I'm going to play an over the board tournament and you're studying online. It's like, you're so used to the computer all the time. You're like, when you get to the board, you're gonna be like, oh, where's the computer to play? Ah. And then if you do the studying over the board, then you'll be like, okay, it's going to be more usual to you. And Tani, have you been watching this tournament? Who do you think is going to win in the mm. final? Uh, <laughs> yes, I have been watching the tournament since day one, but um, I don't know. Levant, Timor, um, it's a draw in the first round, so I don't know what I'm voting for, but I don't know. Maybe Levant will win, I don't know. Mm, so we have a little vote, sure. vote for Levant there then. I know yeah. it, it is hard. They are two very equal players. Um, now, um, uh, Tanya, I also know, is it true that there is a book about you or you uh, together with Raisha have 
come out with a book, is that right? Yeah, it's up on there. Oh, you have it? Yes, should I get it? Yeah, do it. Okay. This is definitely a book I want to get. I bet it is very inspirational as we see Tani going to grab There's the book. different book. There's the, this one, There's this is the for kids book, Tani's new home. Wow, wow. Um, yeah, that's one. And then this is the London book, if you're Europe or London, wow. to get this book. And then these are the, uh, any, just any book you can read. This is like it says up here. That looks like Young a very Reader's cool book. Edition. It says Young's Re Young Reader's Edition. My 17, 16, 15 limit like that. And then these are adults. Uh, the three of you should read it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I am definitely ordering those books uh, right after we finish broadcast today. Fantastic. And Tani, finally, uh, just 10 years old, you're already doing so good in chess, aiming to become the world's youngest grandmasters. Now, what is your tip for other young people watching this? If they also want to get really good in chess. Yeah, probably that um, talent beats hard i mean hard work beats talent if talent does not have hard work and if you have talent don't think it's just an easy path to success you also need to hard work there's no easy way in life like you it's just it's you if you take the easy way then like in the future it's going to be a thousand times harder take the hard way in the future it'll be a thousand times easier wow i agree all right tony um, thank you so much for joining us. We are looking so much forward to follow your journey to the top of chess. I bet we're going to see you there someday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Best of luck in 2021. Best of luck, Tony. Yeah, happy 2021. Whoa, yay. <laughs> Fantastic. What an inspiration, Yamaka. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's such a positive kid and yeah. I just love his answers. You know, he loves to play aggressively. He has three favorite players mm. and uh, he just... And he recognizes the best way to improve is just to have discipline. And uh, that is a big talent in itself. Fantastic. And aiming, David, to become the youngest world champion of all time. What will it take? Uh, I mean, he sounds like he's got the talent, he's got the hard work, the eth that work ethic as well. And I wouldn't bet against him. You know, he's got that wise head on young shoulders. And uh, yeah, the world is his oyster. He could do anything. All right, Tani Adewumbi. We had a fantastic talk with him now as we are looking for into the second game in the first final match between Levonoronian and Timur Rajabov. Levonoronian here will have the white pieces in this second game. And then what should we expect, David? Mm -hmm. I think Levon, he knows he rode his luck slightly in that last game. He started to play a bit slowly as well towards the end. He was very low on the clock. We'll see Levon try to be a bit more aggressive and be a bit quicker, a bit more confident in this game. And we see a very quick start. We see the Sicilian defense, one of the most aggressive openings in chess for Black. Black often tries to counterattack in this opening. And we do see a very early trade, a bishop for a knight. And this game, I just have a feeling We'll see less quick moves at the beginning here. Both players just creating their own different plans. This position has been seen before, but there's so much room for creativity. It will be about who understands the position better. Um, Black also has a set of double pawns now. So long term, it will be about deep strategy. A bit different from the last game when it was more about direct threats um, and you know react, counter react. Um, this one is setting up nicely. And the one thing I should note though, is Timur Rajabov. He's a big expert in this opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that actually comes to my mind is that uh, Levon is opening with the king's pawn as opposed to the queen pawns. Whenever I see him, you know, he was so successful against Hikaru with a queen's pawn. And now we see a, a shift. Yeah, so um, Levon Aronian, just over the last couple of years, he has started trying these new openings. He started experimenting a bit more. He does have this universal style, remember, Levon Aronian. He can play any any type of position to a great standard, to a great level. And he does like to occupy the center. He's a very classical player. We do see White has a nice pawn in the center there. White's king is the first one to find safety as well. White's king castling. Um, Timur Radrobov needs to start developing those pieces. So far, only his queen has moved 
Mm. All of those black pieces along the back rank, especially on the right side, they need to start jumping forward, clearing the way for the black king to castle. Um, that being said, center is relatively blocked. So black does have that time. Black's king won't be under fire immediately. Um, there we see Timur Rajabov developing his knight, bringing that knight slightly forward. It is blocking the black bishop right now, the dark squared black bishop, but the knight will move again. And T uh, Levon Aronian going on the attack with his corner pawn. That, we call it <laughs> Harry the H-pawn. That is always a signal when Harry jumps forward two squares. That is always a signal mm. that white wants to attack. Mm -hmm. um, aggressive start here by both players. Both players playing very ambitiously. Um, this is going to be a deep, long, complex fight. Yeah, in fact, uh, this is quite a relatively new idea. It's been played by Fabiana Carano, one of the world's best players, and also Rishi Anand. And uh, yeah, they are following the games by playing that pawn move in the centre. Yeah, so now Black just gaining a bit more space in the centre and Levon Aronian ignores that. He starts to play on the wing. Um, that white pawn <laughs> pushing itself way up the board. Um, looks like a bit of a lone warrior right now. Um, it doesn't have too much backup, but the idea is to cramp the black position. The uh, white is anticipating that black's king wants to castle on that right side. That is why he's just preparing a potential attack later on and taking away squares from the black pieces. Yes, and uh, funnily enough, white, there's only been three games played in this exact position. And funnily enough, white has won all of them. So different moves have been tried. Um, one game... Black went backwards with the knight, so he retreated it to the start position. Another game, someone advanced the center pawn, just one square forward. And then another game, well, Black tried to block the pawn with his own pawn. So there we're going to see that he's just developed the bishop by advancing his pawn one square. Wow. So, and yeah. Another quick response by Levon Aronian. He has done his homework. Look at that. He's got nearly 16 minutes. He's got more time than he started with. And a mysterious move there. Um, but there's a very direct idea. If we bring up the analysis board, Levon Aronian, he wants to go on the attack immediately. This white knight, it looks like nicely placed, but it did retreat. And the whole idea is that white is more ready than black. Therefore, he wants to attack. He wants to push this pawn forward. For example, if black just plays a developing move, white wants to push forward with this pawn. He wants to open up this line for his rook. Um, he's hoping that the black king in the middle of the board, it will become a target. Levon Aronian, he wants to push this pawn forward, open up his rook and go on the attack. Um, mm -hmm. This is heating up nicely, this game. Yay, heating up in the final. Now, a few minutes ago, we did have Tani joining us here in the studio, a 10-year-old chess prodigy aiming to become the youngest grandmaster. Okay, uh, let's take that move first, David. Is it um, dramatic? Yeah, black just blocking off Harry the H-pawn there, blocking off white's corner pawn, um, stopping the advance. A bit of a waiting move there by Timur Rajapov. Let's see whether Levon Aronian tries to explode the position open with that pawn move that I hi highlighted, trying to open up his rook. And I think we're going to see that. I mean, Quite likely. I definitely think that this is the big idea in White's position, just to explode open. And in fact, that was Vichy Anand's approach in the position, just to kind of get things going. And uh, he absolutely beat um, Boris Gelfand, another one, another one of the world's top players. So this is high level stuff. And I'm just trying to gauge the players' reactions to see whether who is comfortable and who is not. And to me, it looks like uh, Rajabov is trying to recall his opening. Yeah, he is thinking for one minute there and then I can ask my question. So Tani, at 10 years old, aiming to be the youngest grandmaster in history, what will it take? What, who does he have to beat? Well, he'll have to beat nearly everyone in his way. He will have to really work. The way you don't just become a grandmaster overnight. You have to, first of all, try your hand at certain levels of tournaments. And uh, once you progress there, it's almost like a computer stage. You have to level up all the time. And uh, then you'll, you'll play stronger and stronger opponents. He'll also have to face some of the strongest talents in his own age category in the world. Mm. And uh, once that happens, then he will be playing in the big tournaments and and then it becomes about becoming an international master. That's uh, stage two or so. And then a grandmaster. And that's you get the grandmaster title by, by three performances at a certain level. Once you've achieved those three performances and you've achieved the rating requirement, then he'll be there. And yeah, Tani, he's um, 10 years old and about three months. And the record 
for the youngest grandmaster in the world is 12 years and seven months. So he still has a couple of years to do this, more over two years to become a grandmaster to beat Sergei Karyakin's record. Mm. Um, so it isn't world champion Magnus Carlsen, it is Sergei Karyakin the youngest. Yes, I think Magnus Carlsen, he became grandmaster at 13, um, Karyakin at 12 years old, and a couple of Indian uh, grandmasters yeah. as well also became grandmaster very young. So Rajagov himself actually became grandmaster at 14. Ah. So he does have some two years. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> it involves a lot of work and a lot of travel. And uh, yeah, we also have a very nice tweet from Aid Kao, who says, thank you for featuring Tanito Lua. His story has really inspired a lot of us to take chess more seriously. Much love from Nigeria. And uh, Tanya actually messaged us after we talked to him because uh, we talked about uh, Bill Clinton uh, reaching out to him. And uh, Tanya mentioned that he did go there. And he's not quite sure if he actually played Bill Clinton. He's not sure if he remembers correctly. So uh, he's saying that he, he didn't actually play Bill Clinton. He got it mixed up. Uh, but he wanted us to mention that, that he didn't actually play chess with the Bill Clinton. But nonetheless... Such an, in, um, such an impressive 10-year-old fighting to become one of the best chess players in history. And he's already achieved more than most people mm -hmm. achieve mm -hmm. in their lifetime. And, Definitely. Um, he's got books about him. I heard there's a movie as well being made about his young career. Yeah, and, yeah inspiring stuff. Inspiring stuff. Who's the most famous uh, player, chess player you've ever played? Oof. Like celebrity I'm talking about. Maybe Woody Harrelson. Oh! Um, he's, yeah, he came to the uh, London Chess Classic one year. He also came to the World Championship match um, with Magnus Carlsen and uh, Fabiana Caruana in 2018, also in London. He films a lot of movies there and he popped along. Really nice guy, actually. And he's a very good player. Very, very good. He's very direct. He always goes for checkmate very early on. <laughs> <laughs> he tries to go for the four-move checkmate, uh, scholar's mate. But, um, yeah, Woody Harrelson. How about you, Ivanka? <laughs> he tries to go for the scholar's mate. He tried to, check, <laughs> he tried to checkmate me in four moves. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I saw it. I defended. <laughs> um, uh, oh... Yeah, that's, a, that's a difficult one. I mean, I recently played against Crystal Palace football defender Martin Kelly, but I don't think I've played any top celebrities. So, yet. yeah. Yet. Yet. Yes. Soon. Um, I think the strongest player I've ever played has to be Peter Spidler. Mm. And uh, oh, Hikaru. Hello. How could I forget? Hikaru, yes. Uh, I played him when he was, wasn't quite at the peak. Uh, he is now. Mm. But that was a very exciting game because I was winning. It was like... Uh, and he was so nice to me after the ball, after the game finished. Fantastic. We analysed it and it's so nice when you have a player like that. Well, I can let you know who the most famous player I played chess with is. Ooh. David Howell. Ooh. We played uh, uh, hand brain and uh, well... You it, won, Kaya. Exactly. Your team beat me. My, yeah. my team won. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's the beauty of chess. You get to play um, so many strong opponents, so many interesting opponents. And also on chess24.com, you do have the opportunity to play some of these guys. Um, they do have banter blitz sessions. They challenge the public. And if you're a premium member, you can send them a challenge and hope that they pick you. It helps to have a quirky uh, username. <laughs> it makes it more appealing for them to pick you. But yeah, these guys, yeah. they're more accessible than ever. And you don't see that in any other sport. Uh, mm -hmm. The best players in the world playing members of the public. Mm. All right, so we do have a few moves on the board. Um, is it drama yet? It does certainly look dramatic because it's, it seems so unorthodox, this position. You know, White has done some very unconventional things on the right side by advancing the pawn, then moving the knight to the corner of the board, and then suddenly ex chess explosion in the centre. And now Black has reacted in the most direct way possible by advancing the pawn. But in fact, this has all been seen before. And we are still repeating the game Vish Vishwanathan Anand against Boris Gelfand. And in, this, in that game, White retreated the bishop of two squares. Oh, two squares? Two squares back on the same diagonal, yep. And uh, the game continued with uh, Black developing his bishop on the king's side, yep. And uh, again, there was a bishop trade, yep. And uh, the game actually continued with Castle... Um, special move castles and uh, yeah I think white eventually won so it's interesting how a level on Aronian this this variation hasn't actually been played much there's only, there were only three games and so I'm just kind of curious as to why Levon Aronian is thinking yeah, considering does, considering like how few games there were yeah it does look like maybe um, despite the fact this has been played before um, neither side is fully aware of that game or fully familiar with the ideas maybe they're also just bluffing a bit maybe they know that um 
they've studied this position or their opponent studied this position. They just want to cause that first surprise. They want to go for that surprise value. Actually, the game continues in that fashion in the same way that um, Yavanka highlighted there. We could see that trade of bishops, black's king, castling towards that right side. Personally, I like white's chances purely because white's king is already castled. White's just more ready uh, for the action. Um, it does look like we're heading down that line. Um, we're looking for white's bishop to move forward there along the diagonal to challenge black's dark squared bishop. Normally when your opponent has a set of bishops, so black here has two bishops, white only has the one bishop, um, normally it helps to trade off one of those bishops. It just weakens your opponent's um, control over that colour complex. Uh, and we're yeah. going to see it. He's trying to neutralise the double bishops and we're going to see the exact same trade. So if black castles, we are following move by move. <laughs> I do really love it when this happens because do you think that this is some perhaps now, you know, I, I was a bit surprised that Levon wasn't playing as fast as I expected him to, but maybe this is a trap. <laughs> maybe. Uh... Because, uh, you know, <laughs> if you prepared a trap, it's always good to kind of well, pause. just to pretend that you haven't seen the position before and that all is going well, absolutely everything, and then kind of encourage your opponent to play into it. Yeah, actually one of my favourite traps is in a different opening and I get it all the time in my online games. I've tricked actually dozens and dozens of other grandmasters. Um, I've beaten them in, I think, 15 moves just because they all fall into the same trap. And the way I do it is I pause. I spend 20, 30 seconds just pretending as if I don't know what to do. They assume I haven't seen the position before. And then if they play the most natural moves, they walk into that trap. And maybe that's what these guys are doing. But it does seem to me as if they're familiar with that game. They just can't recall what they've studied before. And we do see the bishops leave the board. The dark squared bishops have been traded off. Black's king steps forward. Again, the only reason I slightly prefer white's position is because black's king is potentially more of a target than white's. White's king uh, looks nice and safe. That white knight in the corner there, uh, the white rook next to it. And white's queen just steps across. She's heading towards those dark squares, which have been weakened. White's queen now just taking a step across. Notice her future path. She wants to jump up to this square, maybe attacking the black king along this diagonal. Now the dark squared bishops have gone. She knows what squares she wants to travel on. Um, the queen is going to occupy the dark squares, try to get at this black king, potentially as well. The pressure of this rook along this line might be very, very useful. This knight will also try to jump into the game a bit later on. It can't right now, but a bit later. Um, white has a lot of potential ammunition for the attack. I think that's why maybe black... Timur Rajabov, he's the one under pressure now. Yeah, and did you note how quickly he played that queen move? Because this is now diverging from the game that I mentioned. And I'm very curious, this could be just a coincidence, but this game, this exact move was analysed just now, wow. today. Oh, was it? <laughs> well, that yeah. must be so one it, of these two. Exactly. It could have been perhaps been some observers who were like, let's have a look and <laughs> let's try it out. Or it could have been the preparation this morning where they checked it out. You sure it's not you analysing this? <laughs> <laughs> no, 162 visits. <laughs> wow, 162 visits. And um, yeah, so Black does ignore that potential queen check and brings out the bishop instead. Black's bishop is nicely centralised there um, on the light squares. That bishop is not a problem piece. That bishop controls lots of squares. It's the dark squares that we're focusing on, uh, focusing on right now. And um, I actually see a little trap in the position. I don't think this will actually happen on the board but it's the type of move I'm always looking for. Um, if we bring up the board, we can see <laughs> I would want to go and sacrifice my rook right now with white. I'm always looking for attacking ideas. And for example, bringing the rook up the board, offering a sacrifice. This is the type of trap that I love to set for my opponents, but Timur Rajabov, he would spot it. If Black's king captures this rook for free, it's checkmate. The king would be trapped. Um, okay, Timur, uh, Levin Aroni, he doesn't sacrifice his rook yet. He gives a check immediately. He gives check first. So similar ideas. It's all about the dark squares. Black's king is under attack. Does he run away or does he block with the pawn? Um, tricky decision here for Timur Rajabov. Personally, I think he should block with the pawn. He needs to take some control over the dark squares. So this is the move I'm looking for. Timur Rajabov pushing the pawn forward to block the check. All right. We did, uh, when we had Tani visiting us here uh, um, a few minutes ago, he said he was an attacking player. What is the style of these two? They both love to attack when they get the chance, but they're quite universal. They can deal in any type of situation, and that's why they're in the final. We saw Timur Rajabov against Daniel Dubov. He was playing an attacking genius, so he was able to play a very solid 
kind of defensive style and um, just completely uh, neutralized Daniel Dubov. But Rajabov, he does like to counterattack. He's mentioned that in videos before. He likes to let his opponents march forward and then he fights back later on when they've extended too far. Um, Levon Aronian, he likes to control the center. He likes to set traps, likes to surprise his opponents um, with very creative little tricks here and there. But also, he's a very good attacker and a great defender in the end game. And talking about <clears throat> the attacker, Daniel Dubo, who is playing the third place match right now, he won the first game against Maxim Vajelograv. And we do have that game on bottom of the screen. And it looks like in the second game as well, Dubov is doing fantastically, probably with some attacking chess. So he could be now the favorite to take on that third place. After mm -hmm. losing to Timur Rajabov in that semi-final, uh, because Timur Rajabov was just fantastic. Yeah, he yeah, was right, uh, Yeah, he was just fantastic. And what I really liked about it was the psychology, because we all know that uh, Dubov has been christened the chess wizard. <laughs> <laughs> he plays magical games. And uh, Maxim Vashilograf is mu very much a tricky player. So mm. I can see those two styles kind of complementing each other. But uh, on the subject of uh, chess wizardry, mm. <laughs> don't you think that uh, Rajabov does resemble a certain oh, magician? Yeah. And uh, we have a tweet from Logan who says, Rajabov dresses like Severus Snape. Ah, mm. <laughs> from Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, he's actually one of my favourite characters. So, I, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because he, well, probably shouldn't say what happens in the Harry Potter movies. I guess everyone's seen it, though. He turns out to be a good guy. Yes. Oh, I'm so happy. Misunderstood. Yes. Yes. Severus Snape. I actually agree. Yeah. A magician sitting sitting there. Timur Rajabu. Also been compared to um, uh, the Star Wars characters, the... The Jedis. The Jedis. Just because he's been so calm. Mm. I've never seen anything quite like it, actually. You know, just to play with two seconds on the clock, one second on the clock. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant moves and played ever so calmly. And he kind of told us yesterday that the kind of secret to that is he looks very composed. Internally, he's having heart attacks, but that doesn't matter because he just looks so focused. Mm. And it is um, Levon Aronian thinking now for two minutes. He's got his down to seven minutes on his, on his clock. That's two minutes less than Timor. Uh, it definitely seems this game is going a lot slower than the first one. Yeah, in the first game, they played pretty much 28 moves mm. just without blinking. Um, they just sped to a very complex position. And this one is also complex, but they haven't played as quickly. Both players still getting to grips with the position, trying to come up with long-term plans, trying to just get a hang of what they're aiming for long-term. Um, I, I do think that Levon Aronian, maybe he's just thinking a bit too long here. Um, there's no immediate breakthrough for White. There's, uh, in every position, the first things we look for, remember, are checks, captures and threats. There's no real direct way to play this position. So when in doubt, just improve a piece. And mm -hmm. you see White's two pieces at the bottom left corner there and not doing anything. That White Knight and the White Rook. I would just bring that Knight towards the centre. Okay, he plays it, but it did cost him about three minutes. Um, if he asked himself those questions, if he asked himself that question, is there anything direct? Are there checks, captures, threats? He would have said no. And then he would have realised, okay, there's nothing else to do but improve a piece. So it does look like he's fully... Uh, he's not fully yet in the right rhythm. He's not feeling too confident. Otherwise, he would have played that move instantly. Yeah, uh, it does look like, like the most natural move on the board, like you say, because White really wants to begin clamping down on the position, perhaps doubling up the rooks on that one open line and just putting enough pressure. I mean, the big thing to consider, though, is, is it just too risky for Black to kind of go... Let's roll the dice, let's throw them in the air, <laughs> shake it all about and open things up. I would never, ever think about doing anything like that. Just, uh, but still, that's the move to, ca to calculate at least. It's possible. And um, Timur Rajabov going back into that meditative uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> well, that body language. I mean, he is just so uh, kind of calm and zen right now. Um, if we bring up the board, we can see what he's thinking about. He's trying to decide. Does he open the position? Does he push his pawn forward, um, trying to maybe capture this pawn, opening up a line for the black rook? Um, but the potential is that his king might become weak. This is, I think, is the pawn push you were... This was a pawn Ivanka. push because that is the most thematic thing to calculate. When you calculate um, in strategical terms, the only move that you're going to be calculating is pawn pushes. So you have the checks, the captures, attacks, and uh, then, this, then this one. But this one is really... 
<laughs> the hottest move that you can play on the board because if it goes wrong, it is going to be a disaster of the most majestic proportions. Um, I personally would not touch this <laughs> with I, a primper. I would a, be tempted. I you would, would be, be tempted. tempted. Um, and the reason I'd be tempted is because Black has the bishop. It's the only bishop remaining on the board and bishops... <laughs> oh, well, there <laughs> you go. The He's playing with fire. They, we are going to see red hot action now because the position is being blasted wide open. Yeah, and bishops, they do love these open lines and that's why you try and get rid of as many pawns as possible because then the black bishop would gain in influence. It would gain in power. Um, however, we did mention the black king. If whites, rooks or knights somehow get at that black king, the black king is far more open than its counterpart than, uh, counterpart than this white king. This white king nicely safe and tucked away. Meanwhile, Levin Oronin finally speeding up, bringing his other rook towards the centre. All of white's pieces are almost perfectly placed. These two white rooks in the middle, this white queen's very active. This white knight has potential. It might jump into the square if we see a trade of pawns a bit later on. The only one to improve for white now is this knight. Knight's in the corner and not great pieces. Meanwhile, for black, it's hard to find a productive move. Um, this rook not doing anything. The queen blocked in. The knight, that doesn't have anywhere to jump to. Mm -hmm. More importantly, though, the king. This is the one we're looking out for. If the black king gets under attack, it will spell the end. It will spell disaster for Rajabov. If it survives, then it means the game is going well. Then black might be the one in charge. Yeah, I agree with you there. And uh, my instinct there is uh, actually, if you look at those white rooks, Levon has done what he does best. He plays in the center. It's going to blast everything open. But I would be looking at closing the position down and uh, just kind of trying to say, OK, fine, you try to open. Now I'm going to try to close because I'm not maybe ready for such a big opening. So in order to close the position down, I guess that would mean not go opening up lines, not allowing a trade in the center, and that would be pushing forward with the pawn, suddenly blocking this white rook, mm -hmm. um, this black pawn, very strong here. This rook would be blocked. Oh, sorry. This rook would be blocked. Um, this other rook would be blocked as well. Um, this would be a very sensible move, a very logical one. Maybe Levon Aroni, he'll try and keep pushing forward. He'll try and explode the position forward, uh, open for his rooks. Um, anything could happen here. White suddenly threatening <laughs> things, trying to jump in with a knight. Um, I think if we see those two moves on the board, if we see both sides push for pawns forward there, there will be fireworks. Yeah, sure. I think I agree with you. I think there's going to be huge fireworks. I mean, this is actually, you know, I did suggest that pawn opening, but uh, I just love Levon Aronian's response to that, just calmly centralising the position. And uh, this is now a situation where Rajabov has to find the only move to stay in the in the game, I think. Because I, I, I yeah, I, I think so. We're on territory like that because the position has the potential to open. I'm not sure Rajabov has the means necessary to, okay? And we've seen it. We have seen the closing of the position. And now can Levon find the move that troubles Black the most? And I, I love your response, just pushing that pawn forward. Yeah, and we do see it actually there just below the player's cameras. We see the computer suggestions, the top engine moves. And the best move for White is pushing that pawn in the middle. We did highlight it a moment ago. It's actually the most natural move as well for a human, I think, just to open things up, to make use of the White Rooks. And he's found it. He's going for the kill here. Levon Aurelian on the attack, trying to open up those White Rooks. Um, that Black King still looking very airy, very weak, not much protection around it. And therefore, Rajabov, he sacrificed a pawn. He's closed down the middle of the board, but it has come at a cost. White's queen immediately snapping off a pawn there. White is now a pawn ahead. But Rajabov, his king will survive. The position is more blocked now, more closed. So uh, sometimes that's just what we have to do to stem the tide, um, to stop your opponent's attacking momentum. We have to give up pawns. And Rajabov, he made that decision very quickly, but he is ticking under five minutes. Um, Levon Aronian now looks like he's in charge. Extra pawn and more time on the clock. Wow. Okay, it's uh, it's getting very excited in this uh, game now. You know they are fighting to be the winner in the first major of the Champions Chess Tour. The winner takes home sixty thousand dollars, and that is also actually related to our question of the day, Ivanka. Yes, we are asking everyone, how would you spend $60,000? And uh, definitely we want everyone to get creative and uh, ha use the hashtag Chess Champs to respond. What would you spend $60,000 on, David? I'd be very boring. I'd uh, <laughs> put it in the bank to gain some interest. <laughs> interest rates aren't very high right now. Um, 
Maybe I didn't. I'd get a chess coach so that I could learn a few things here and there. I'd hire Magnus Carlsen for a day. That's probably his price. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you could buy one of the Air Things devices, which is the price. So, it, the, well, if you are the winner of the quiz, yes. uh, then you don't uh, have to buy it because you'll win it. Yes, the, that's a fantastic prize. It's one of these Air Things devices that monitors the air quality of the room. And I'm absolutely obsessed by this. I just love looking at the statistics. I love looking at the CO2 levels. Yeah. And I'm thinking, actually, that we saw that actually had a big impact on the players. We saw Anish Giri had bad carbon dioxide levels. And uh, we also saw Magnus Carlsen was suffering... Oh, the Oslo studio. We have a <laughs> studio we are sitting in. Uh, humidity is horrible where we're sitting. Uh-oh. <laughs> and 20 degrees. Okay, it's a little bit warmer here today. It's been down to 19. Uh, it's been snowing outside on some days as well, so I'm surprised it's uh, <laughs> that warm. Uh, but okay, we, could we do have good carbon dioxide levels. And we do have a move, David, and I know it's getting interesting in the game. Yes, it's getting tense. And actually, um, Timur Rajabov, he angled for a queen trade just a few moments ago. Um, he tried to swap off those queens. The white queen looking very, very impressive. Um, white defended his queen with a knight. So the queens are looking at each other right now. Um, and there is a bit of a pin in the position. That is why Timur Rajabov, he took a time out to improve the black king. The reason white can't capture this knight, this undefended knight right now with his queen, is because the queen cannot leave this diagonal. The white king is behind it. Um, this white queen... Um, is, t is pinned right now. It cannot leave this diagonal. We could see a queen trade, but white doesn't want to capture this queen because then black would capture back. His pawns are now better. His pawns are all connected, um, more control over the center, and this would open up a line for black's rook. So actually, both sides are a bit stuck. Um, both sides want the queen trade, but white doesn't, uh, white doesn't want to capture because then it would help black improve his pawns, improve his rook, and likewise, black doesn't want to capture, um, for example, um, on the last move, if he had captured, suddenly White's knight gets improved. So both sides want the queen exchange, but they want to wait for the other side to go for it. Um, a bit of a waiting game right now. Yeah, tense, uh, absolutely tense. You know, you have both sides trying to angle for that trade and uh, the trade would actually benefit both of them if they did it. So we're going to see a bit of a standoff there. And uh, both players with under five minutes on the clock. And we've kind of mentioned it before, five minutes is like a bit of a magical number when the players actually start to notice and feel the pressure. If they go under one minute, that is when they start to panic. And under 10 seconds, well, <laughs> only Rajabov can survive in such, <laughs> <laughs> such uh, treacherous conditions. Should he? Well, joking aside, should he actually feel the most confident if they go into these uh, intense time trouble here because he's been so solid. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, he we saw saw him play absolutely brilliantly in time pressure. And uh, just look at him, how calm he looks. He looks like he has absolutely everything under control. In fact, uh, Jacob Sykes says, Rajabov looks like he's more in a Beatles cover band that <laughs> sings songs about chess. So chill. <laughs> <laughs> Beatles cover band. <laughs> All he needs is to just grow his hair a bit longer. Then he could either be Severus Snape or a Beatle. Ooh. Yes. And maybe join in a band with you, David, because uh, we heard rumors you were in the school choir. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago. And you played drums, I heard, right? I, I, I did once, once, but it didn't turn out very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and meanwhile, we do have a couple of moves. White did step forward with a rook, actually breaking the pin. I highlighted that diagonal. So White's queen was no longer um, tied down. It could move. So therefore, the white queen is also attacking Black's knight. That knight now has protection. Rajabov defending his knight with his rook. He's going for that very kind of traditional logic. When you're getting low on time, just defend all your pieces, defend everything. And uh, Timur Rajabov uh, centralizing his rook there. He is still a pawn down though. White's extra pawn should make itself felt somehow. Um, all White needs to do is improve that white knight at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen uh, of the board. That white knight is doing nothing. So I think it's time for Levon Aronian to centralize that knight. Um, Timur Rajabov, meanwhile, he was, again, closing his eyes there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was praying, meditating, <laughs> could have been anything. Um, I like White's position with the extra pawn, but if they both tick under two, three minutes, then really anything could happen. Black does now have very far advanced pawns. Wow, oh. we see a queen sacrifice <laughs> by Levon Aronian, but it ca the queen cannot be captured. Um, we have to bring up the analysis board there. The White Knight jumping forward um, with this last move. The White Knight was protecting the queen, 
It no longer protects the queen. It jumps forward. But if black gets greedy, if black captures this queen, we'll see a knight fork. The knight takes this bishop in the middle, attacking the king and attacking the queen. White would emerge with an extra piece. And that is why, after this knight move, um, Timur Rajbov said, no, I'm not going to get greedy. I'm going to try and challenge your knight in the middle of the board. And the rook defends the bishop. Lots of pieces about to be traded. Um, we do see the queens leave the board. And now, can white grab another pawn? Well, he he's does. done it. He's done it. He's grabbed another pawn. And uh, now black really has problems with their structure. Not only being two pawns down, but some weak pawns there on the left. Yeah, these two white, uh, two black pawns, sorry, they're isolated now. They're very weak, potentially. So black now two pawns down. Um, and he justifies that by trying to attack the white knight. The knight retreats. Um, meanwhile, black does have a very strong pawn here and a potentially a knight. A nice knight, the black knight, might jump into the position. Um, black pushes forward with another pawn. Uh, Timur Rajubov, this is desperate times. He's pushing forward. He's trying to find some compensation for his two-pawn deficit. But he has chances. Those white knights are not coordinated right now, and they won't be for the next few moves. One white knight is out there on the bottom right. One knight <laughs> is out there on the left. Um, yeah. Personally, I think that's a great practical decision by Rajubov. But two pawns, it is a lot, potentially. Yes. Um, and uh, one of the things that's quite intriguing is that if you look at the bar, the bar should say two-pawn advantage, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It says uh, 0.8. And uh, this is because of the compensation that you mentioned, those two knights not kind of coordinating nicely. And if you look at Black's pawn in the centre, that is one amazing pawn. Look how it clamps it down. So definitely a lot of compensation. And uh, I just love that Black pawn chain. <laughs> Yeah, actually, all of Black's pawns on dark squares and his bishops on light squares. So together, they control everything. Um, this is very, very important, I think, when you're learning chess strategy in general. Always try and put your pawns on the opposite colour to your bishop because then together, they'll control everything. And uh, yeah. that's what Rajabov is aiming for. He's got less pawns, but the pawns he does have on the board are very strong. Mm -hmm. So do you think this was a happy accident or do you think... Uh as Rawad Ched, uh, Chedid asks, how many moves ahead are the players considering? How does this change in different formats? So is this something do you think that uh, Rajabov has considered and uh, calculated way in advance? I think he might have seen this in advance, but maybe he just missed that qu temporary queen sacrifice by Levon Oronian and he just had to react. And this was the first way he could see how to survive. And maybe it's a bit of luck as well. He not only survived um, by giving up that second pawn, but he also found some very active play mm -hmm. um, in returns. And how many moves on average do you see ahead? Oof, about one. <laughs> Maximum. <laughs> um, now, now, David. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I do think in these rapid format, especially now the players, they both have under three minutes, they'll only be looking two to three moves ahead each, but they'll be looking in the key variations and they might be looking in two different uh, lines, they might be looking at two different variations and they'll be looking a few moves deep in each of them. It's not, I mean, you just don't have time to sit there and work out five, ten moves ahead because mm -hmm. there's a chance that your first move in that variation might be wrong. Um, they have to be practical. They just have to see um, deep enough into a position where they think, okay, I've got that one under control. They don't have to, uh, they just look two, three moves ahead. They say, okay, this looks playable. This looks like it suits my style more than his. This looks like it helps improve my position more than his. Mm -hmm. And that's enough. Um, you can't look any deeper unless it's all about checks and captures and attacks. Yeah. Then then you have to, yeah, you have to calculate that. And uh, one other thing is that when, when the clock starts ticking down, that's when instincts come in. And this is where it comes, some players are very, very natural. They know which, where to put the pieces and what squares. They know how to harmonise everything. And uh, if you look at Rajabov's position, it's so beautiful in terms of harmony. Every single piece is working nicely, those beautiful pawns. And, uh, but... Two pawn deficit <laughs> still has to be playing on the back of uh, Rajabov's mind. Yeah, you, you did call it, Yavanka. I mean, now the computer only gives white a 0 0.3 advantage despite having two extra pawns. Um, and now actually even black has the advantage despite Whoa. having two extra pawns, uh, despite having two pawns less. Um, this one is in the balance. Um, white sl slowly starting to bring that knight, which was offside there on the right side. He's bring brought it towards the centre, but maybe it's just a bit too slow, this manoeuvre. Um, who would you take here, Yavanka? Would you take the two extra pawns or would you take black? Two pawns down, but look at that black knight in the middle of the board in white's camp, supported by two pawns. Beautiful outpost there. Yes. No, I would start taking black because it's so much easier to play. And uh, with the clock ticking down, both players under two minutes, 
it's just easier for the player with the momentum and you can see that you can actually, actually let's just look at the player's mm. body languages. Levon Aronian knows that he is in a trouble. Just look at the way he's concentrating furious, furiously. And uh, then we have Rajabov, who, as Omar Aghala says, well, his calmness is just mesmerizing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he knows. He knows that the trend is in his favor. Yeah, Levon, he's bobbing <laughs> up and down again. We've seen it so much, that nervous energy. Just He's trying to channel that into gaining a bit more speed, to finding some good moves. But he is taking a long time here. He spent a minute now on this move. He spent half his time on this move. Um, and he just needs to find a way to survive. That Black Knight, he needs to kick it out somehow. But it's not easy to achieve. Um, this Black Knight, it is dominating the position. He's attacking this pawn as well. That is why White, no, White's Knight jumps forward, attacking Black's pawn in the middle of the board and also bringing some protection with his rook across. Um, this Black Knight, though, it is beautiful. And, OK, Black defends his pawn in the middle here. This Black Rook, black rook defending this pawn. Meanwhile, how do you ever get rid of this knight? I don't even see a way to even undermine it, let alone kick it away. Um, Rajabov's position is just easier to play with black mm. here because this knight is so beautiful and so dominant. Just like it's even better than those two white rooks. You know, those two <laughs> white rooks are not moving anywhere, are they? And they're just looking very sorry on those bottom two lines. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you called it. Levon Aronian is bobbing with uh, nervous energy. And he just looks like a man who is slightly desperate. Yeah, and I did actually just a few moments ago see Rajabov on his face. You saw the reflection of a very bright screen there. I think maybe he just wanted to bring up the camera to look at Levon mm. to see his his facial expressions. Oh. Sometimes the players do this just as they approach time trouble. They try and look how nervous or how confident their opponent feels. And um, maybe Rajabov, he feeling calm, he just decided to check. What do you look like right now, <laughs> Aronian? Are you getting nervous? And I think Aronian is certainly getting nervous. Um, mm -hmm. Rajabov, OK, he retreats that Black Knight, which was so strong a moment ago. Um, I mean, you call it an Octo Knight that night. I mean, all of its tentacles were uh, <laughs> out there controlling everything. But that Black Knight retreats. He's attacking a White Rook now. Um, White's Rook will have to move. Um, Levon Aronian, though, I'm surprised he didn't move that Rook immediately. Um, White's Rook under attack. Um, OK, he does make that move finally, but he's got 40 seconds now. And the Black Knight brings itself back to the middle of the board. Could we see the position repeat itself? I think Timur Rajabov. OK, this is the second time we've seen this position on the board. Timur Rajabov, will he play for the win? Oh, no, he's repeating the position. Um, yeah, he's... Uh, uh, wow. So this could be a strategy to kind of get more time on the clock, but it also could be just that Levon is sensing that his position is very uncomfortable, not so much space, and just look how active Rajabov's pieces are. So we, you know, the two players actually don't even have access to the bar. They don't know what's going on. And, and 19 uh, they seconds. Have to... Okay. Yeah, yes. Um, okay. Actually, We're going to see it. It's a draw. It's a draw. It's a draw. I'm shocked that Rajabov didn't play on. Everything was in his favour, the clock, the momentum of the game. Um, OK, he was still two pawns down and he still needed to come up with a plan, but he could have put, put the pressure on there. Um, both these first two games, Rajabov, so impressive, just not finding that killer blow. Wow, OK. Well, after two games, it's still equal between these two, a draw in the first game. And now, also, a little bit surprisingly, a draw in the second game, so still everything to play for today with two games rem uh, remaining and we definitely will have four games today with this one ending in a draw so we're happy about that um yeah i guess we are a little bit surprised Yvanka. yeah i mean they've been very close games and um, especially that second game it was so close you know mm -hmm. but uh what can i say rajabov found a way to kind of put Levon Aronian off and just use his activity. Mm. So a little bit surprising in terms of the material, but what can I say? Rajabov's calmness wins again. Yeah, and, and uh, David, you said you did like White's position here for quite a long time. Um, where, what was sort of uh, the highlight in this game uh, that eventually ended in a draw? Yeah, so we did like White's position. And at this point, Levon played a move that shocked myself, shocked Ivanka, a move that I hadn't seen before. And actually... It might have been a strong move. Maybe there was even stronger. But Rajabov got a bit lucky to survive this in this position. Aronian moving his knight to the middle of the board, attacking this black bishop that's undefended. But this was potentially a queen sacrifice. Um, Rajabov did not capture the white queen now because we would have seen a knight fork. 
White's knight. I mean, this is a family fork attacking the king, <laughs> attacking the rook, attacking the queen. Uh, White's knight there um, doing a fantastic job. Family dinner. Family dinner, mm. exactly. Inviting everyone to the party. Um, instead, um, after the knight jumped forward, uh, uh, Rajabov decided it's time to sacrifice a second pawn. Black already one pawn down. He brought his knight forward. And after a queen trade, we did see White snap off a second pawn. Personally, I thought that this would actually signal the end um, or the, the beginning of the end for Timur Rajabov. Often in the end game, especially with queens off the board, if you're two pawns down, it's very hard to fight back. But over the next couple of moves, Timur Rajabov showed his fighting spirit and his, the depth um, of his ideas. He pushed a pawn in the middle here, all the black pawns on dark squares, complementing the light squared bishop. And look at this, a couple of moves later, he installed a huge knight deep in white's camp. These two white rooks actually are completely blocked in. This is why maybe we favoured black's position at the end when they took the draw. White's rooks are completely blocked. Meanwhile, black's rooks are nice and active. This rook, very active. Um, black's other rook, potentially very active. Um, I think that black should have played on in this position. Um, instead, they did repeat um, here. The black knight attacked the rook. The rook moved. The black knight jumped back and they repeated this position. I personally think Rajabov, he should have played on. The third game between Timo Rajabov and Levon Ronian in the final of the Air Things Masters. It is equal after two games. Still everything to play for in the first match. This is the standings. After those two games, we have two draws so far. Two games remain in the first match. In the final, will we have a winner or will it be tied before the last and second match? Wow, okay. Two draws so far, Ivanka. Uh, who has impressed you the mo most so far? Or is it, like on the score, just completely equal? I think it's completely equal. I've been impressed by Aronian's willpower to fight. He came up with some brilliant moves. Again, I have been very impressed by Rajabov's resourcefulness. He has been finding consistently good moves. And the way he generated play just to catch uh, Levon Aronian off guard when he was two pawns down mm. was just very impressive. Mm, David, a little bit surprised you were that Timor uh, agreed to go into this move repetition and go into the draw here. He does have the white pieces in the next game. What should we expect from him? I think he might go for a similar strategy to that first game. We might see the same opening. The players, they've actually had that twice before in the preliminary stage and in this final. Um, it felt like Timor Rajabov... He had a small advantage there and he was the one dictating the play. He was the one forcing Aronian to find good moves. So I think Rajabov, he'll just be aiming for more of the same, but he'll be aiming to take his chances when they come. He hasn't quite uh, been able to move in for the kill mm. quite yet. All right, two fantastic chess players in the final of the Air Things Masters playing already. Some brilliant chess. We are waiting for a win for either of them. But chess players, I mean... I think they're geniuses, but do they agree? Are all chess players geniuses? No, no, no. Maybe I am, but most of my colleagues are not. The brain is uh, supposed to be capable of so much more than just chess. Well, geniuses is too, uh, too much, I think. When you don't... Um fully understand uh, the way they're doing it. It seems that they're geniuses. I do think if you start measuring like the average IQs and all that, probably chess players have above average. No, I think by definition, uh, there should be very few geniuses. After, uh, otherwise, it's not ge geniuses. Somebody, you know, out of ordinary. Yeah? If there are many geniuses, it means nobody is a genius. The geniuses I would call maybe the world champions. Uh... To be honest, I think they all are. Bobby Fischer, Gary Kasparov, Capablanca, Magnus Carlsen. We're not necessarily geniuses in life, just like Mozart is not a genius in life, but he was a genius in that specific field. I cannot speak for other top chess players, but I would say myself that I'm not a genius. I'm just a regular guy who is very good at what I do. My mother used to tell me that uh, you are good at chess, but for the rest, uh, you are nothing special. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic uh, by David Anton's mother there. And I just love Wesley so in this one. Everyone's so humble saying, no, 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 we're not geniuses. And Wesley saying, yeah, basically, yeah. I think most of the top <laughs> chess players are geniuses. What do you think, David? 
well, yeah. being one of the top chess players. Well, I think compared to these guys, uh, I'm not quite there. But yeah, these guys, especially at the top, they are geniuses at what they do. Um, I've seen them in real life, though. There are some <laughs> skills that are lacking. So, um, yeah. Interesting question, though. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear what the viewers think as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Are all chess players geniuses? Uh, Yamaka, what do you think? What do I think? Well, I, I do think that they're very talented. Most of them are quite intelligent. There are a few agree with David there are a few that are mm. but uh, actually interestingly enough I do remember in the city of London that they were recruiting chess players because they were very interested in their math skills and yeah. their kind of probability kind of assessing the thing so yeah I don't know I think chess does have some transferable skills I, and I do think that I mean the skills and the brains of chess players they, they do work quite well those brains so I would call them geniuses. Well, we Anyways, have, but we have chess player hands. Not good. Uh, <laughs> what is chess player hands? Useless. <laughs> <laughs> don't count on us to do any DIY whatsoever. <laughs> the, brain, the hands just don't work. It's like uh, Levon in that video earlier, failing to kind of. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> the scooter failing to understand how it works, and it's like me skiing. We do have uh, <laughs> gaps in our uh, hand to eye uh, coordination. coordination. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the genius player that will win this tournament, he will take home sixty thousand dollars. And that's what we asked uh, the viewers about, Ivanko. Yeah, we asked everyone, well, how would you spend $60,000? And uh, of course, the prize is one of these Air Things devices, which measures the quality of air in your room, which I must admit, I'm obsessed with. Okay. But uh, yeah, we have some cool answers. We have Manav Gabra, who says, with $60,000, I'll open chess clubs in many places, mostly in villages, so that even villagers can play chess wow. and represent their areas. If some money is left, I'll pay for the good players so that they can improve free of cost from good mentors, even grandmasters. Fantastic. And uh, then we have a second tweet that says, from Kai Ramos, the first part of the $60,000, now I really like this tweet, I would use to invite all of you commentators, including Simon, to a place with good air quality <laughs> and temperature for exceptional and entertaining ride throughout the tournament. The rest of my family. <laughs> yep, that is a great I'm way coming. to spend. I'm coming. I'm joining. <laughs> and then finally, we have another answer from Jonas Verhelen, who says, I'd buy 60 Norwegian <laughs> forest cats. Now, that is a very beautiful cat. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Apparently, it costs $1,000 then if you can buy 60 of them. <laughs> Wow, that would be a lot of cats to take care of. It <laughs> would be. They must be remarkable creatures. I've uh, I've never actually seen a Norwegian forest cat. Have you? No, never. I, I don't think I have. I don't I don't know if I would recognize uh, one if I saw one though. But okay, different ways to spend six, sixty thousand dollars. I definitely want to be invited to that warm place, David. Are you missing traveling? I am. Um, I haven't been in a jacuzzi for for months. <laughs> um, yeah, I am missing traveling. That's one of the perks, actually, of being a professional chess player. That there are tournaments all around the world. You get to meet some cool people, see some amazing places, and I do miss that. Hopefully, in 2021, though. Yeah. yeah. And if anyone has any cool answers, every creative answers, well, please tweet us using the hashtag #ChessChamps, and uh, we'll feature them on the show. Mm, all right. Well, playing chess, you can win a lot of money. We know in this tournament, the winner taking home sixty thousand dollars. And if you want to start getting really good at chess and maybe learning a few tricks, well, David Howell is teaching us how to. want to impress your friends, your colleagues, your opponents, then there are two very quick checkmates that you can try to go for. The first one is called Scholar's Mate. White normally pushes a pawn forward in front of the king. Black copies that. White brings out the queen, attacking a black pawn. Black might defend this pawn with the knight. Next, white brings out the bishop, attacking this pawn twice. The pawn is only defended by the black king. If black is careless now and forgets to defend against that threat, maybe developing the knight, then white can capture this pawn with the queen. Giving check, protected by the bishop, black's king is trapped, and this is checkmate. The other tricky checkmate to impress your friends is called fool's mate. This does, however, require white to be very suicidal 
at the beginning of the game. This occurs if white pushes a pawn forward, black might react, pushing a king, uh, the pawns forward in front of his king, two squares. It also works just one square forward. Now, if white is careless and moves another pawn in front of his bishop this time, white has opened a very vulnerable diagonal here, and black can take advantage of this by bringing the queen out, delivering checkmate. White cannot block this check, nothing can take the black queen, and white's king cannot run away. Therefore, this is checkmate. Wow, all right, David, when was the last time you fell for this? Or have you ever? I, I think I did. My first few games I <laughs> fell for this. Uh, when I was young, when I was at school, all of my rivals, they would try this four-move checkmate. That's why they call it scholar's mate. It happens a lot when you're at school. Ah. Um, fool's mate, though, it's only happened once in my career, and that was against my cousin. <gasps> um, he, I think he was just learning the rules of chess, and he pushed the wrong pawns. He fell for the checkmate. Mm. Is this a, a nice trick to learn, though, Ivanka, in the beginning? If you yes. just want to, you know, maybe win a few games with your friends or, or yeah, family nice, at home. It's a nice party trick mm. and it's certainly something that every school child actually learns. And they learn some kind of sophisticated ideas, like there are different type of move orders and they learn to refine it a little bit and enhance their sneakiness. But I have to say, on this kind of subject, there is a chess variant called Atomic Chess, mm. which I have played. And I must admit, there are probably some scholar mate versions which I keep falling into. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. And I just keep, like three moves in, I'm like, I lost. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> Yeah, all right. Women's Grandmaster Ivanka Hauska falling for that too in well in a chess variant. variant. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Um, so we know uh, Champions Chess or online tournament players are sitting in their homes playing these tournaments, and we did get to see where Timo Rajabo is playing uh, his tournaments. Here's where I live. I bought all the stuff because I mean this uh, apartment is actually not prepared for all the stuff. I was not preparing to play from here. You see this one, the armor S Royal. I guess it's fine. Um, it's like a gaming chair, whatever it's called. What should I show you else? The, 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 the area where, I, where I'm playing. There's the cam that I bought, the one that I have in, um, in Baku as well. And the same compi, a bit faster, but it's Mac. Uh, even though they tell me that I have to use Windows as a real chess player, because uh, you know that on Mac, uh, the Windows doesn't, I mean, all this um, chess-based stuff doesn't work. And uh, they tell me that I have to buy, you know, the Windows Combi if I want to be a real streamer, the pro streamer. But okay, this is uh, this is the next level. And okay, there, there is the there is the old mouse I used for all the other tournaments. This one. Uh, there is a fridge, and in the fridge there is not that much stuff as you can see. Okay, some uh, wine there. Well, I mean, for winning the skilling open is not enough. I mean, there is just half a bottle. And the rest, uh, actually, I'm ordering. And uh, here, what else I have? Okay, some ice creams. Not that much, not that much, but uh, yeah. I'll fill it up, I'll fill it up uh, closer to the first tournament. During the games or between the games, I usually don't eat. Because like, uh, for example, in Hunting Mansinsk in the World Cup, more or less the last tournament that was uh, like really long lasting. Yeah, I was, uh, I think, skipping the, skipping the lunch and uh, had some kind of snacks in the morning and that's it. And then there was a dinner afterwards. Especially I'm, from time to time, I'm superstitious. So uh, as it was going very well, uh, I was just uh, doing the same all day, all the time. Yeah, I also lost a lot of kilos there, so it was cool. Finished the tournament as a you know top model. There is a chessboard that is never used because we're always working on the compis now. This one. Uh, there is the martial stuff for the music and little parts from time to time. This one. Napoleon that is always with me. The stuff I always take it to the tournaments. I don't know if it brings luck, but uh, at least it brings some uh, you know some joy from time to time when I see him because I won a lot of tournaments and uh, the statue was with me. I think I took him in Corsica or something like this when I was okay. there as a present and uh, always kept it in my luggage and stuff. So it was kind of cool. <laughs> Team Jabo, that's where he's playing and he's sitting and the game just started, David. What happened? Yes, and the game has started. We actually have seen this. Um, all before the players are repeating exactly the same game that they played in the first round today. Um, we do see that white has sacrificed a pawn again, just like last time. White's king as well has not castled. Um, the white king has, well, it has been checked. It's had to sidestep and misplace itself. The players, they're continuing down this line. Last time we saw them play 26, 27, 28 moves that they played pretty much instantly. All of their preparation, all of their homework um, that they've kind of cooked up at home um, with their coaches, maybe. Um, and the game, it continues in uh, <laughs> exactly the same fashion. Um, black there pushing a pawn forward. The white bishop had to retreat. 
and Black's Knight jumping into the middle of the board. Um, we did see this move as well. The players, one of them has an idea in mind on how to improve on that last game. Um, Timur Rajabov, we thought, was doing quite well um, towards the second half. But Levon Aronian, maybe before that, he'll come up with an improvement. Well, here we have it. Actually, and Black has just made a big change. So in the other game, we saw Black Castle. Now we're seeing a completely different approach. The king is going to stay in the centre and instead Black focuses on developing the bishop. But this does come at a cost, as uh, Rajabov has shown. Well, he grabbed that pawn. Yeah, so Aronian, he's the first one to differ to... Um, to choose a new move um, compared to that last game that we saw. And now the Black King does jump into safety. So Aronian giving back his extra pawn. The material is level now, same pawns, same pieces on the board. Whose king will be weaker? Um, last time we saw Rajabov slowly start to manoeuvre, maybe win a pawn. But this time it's a bit different. Maybe Aronian in the 10, 15 minute break between the games. He was the one with the computer there studying, how can I improve? Or maybe he had those coaches that we mentioned a bit earlier. Maybe his coaches were working hard during the games and they called him up. They said, OK, play this one this time. Uh, <laughs> that will work better. And that's why Timur Rajabov, he's got his head in his hands, um, just trying to maybe meditate, trying to recall what he has studied before. Both players gained a lot of time there. Aronian, he's got two minutes and 40 seconds, more than he started with at the beginning. That's how quickly these guys have played. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to be a fly on the wall because, you know, at t this top level chess, the seconds are, uh, you know, the coaches and the seconds, they're like a different type of level. I wonder whether there's like a call, as David mentioned, or perhaps there's a, a file that drops into your computer and then goes, play this, <laughs> look at this. Yeah, and we have seen, I mean, this is completely different to the last game over the last few moves. White's pawns on that right side have thrown themselves forward. Um, this time we do see Aronian trade a pair of rooks as well. Meanwhile, on the other side, White's most active rook in the enemy territory was traded off. And both sides, they must have studied this position before. Just the speed they're playing at. Um, so many big decisions there. Black could have trade, traded queens. He could have taken the queens off the board. But Levon Aronian continuing to play instantly. He's now built up three extra minutes compared to uh, what he started wow. with at the beginning of the game. Up to 18 minutes now. Um, I think that is the biggest like built-up time we've seen in the tournament. <laughs> Definitely, um, that's how I mean. That's how seriously these guys take the final. That's how much they've been preparing. Probably mm. the whole of this morning, they were just studying this exact opening, um, trying to memorize things, trying to understand the reasons behind every move. Um, and now White's rook under attack jumps up to attack the Black Queen. Both sides creating threats now. The Black Queen does retreat. So, David, this actually queen move to the left actually was a new move, never see, been seen before. Everyone had traded queens. But guess what? It had been analysed. It's in mm. there. <laughs> and it was last analysed in December. So, yeah, this is definitely super exciting. And White's rook jumped up there to attack the black bishop. Black's knight was forced to retreat to defend the black bishop. Um, suddenly, the last few moves, black is the one retreating, white is the one jumping forward. Um, so personally, I like the trend for white. But meanwhile, Aronian, clearly he's done his homework. Um, he knows there's not too much to worry about in this position for black. Um, it's hard to say who is more happy out of this opening. I think both players, they'll be... They'll be acting confident, but inside they're thinking, oh, I thought I would surprise you, but <laughs> you've also studied this. And um, this one is very impressive, the homework they've done. Um, that being said, maybe just the fact that they've both studied this position before, it will just balance that, uh, balance out that surprise effect. And um, we will start to see a more balanced game. But Timur Rajabov taking a bit of a think for the first time here. He's got a lot of choice. Maybe this is where his homework has run out. He's now on his own. Um, trying to come up with ideas uh, from scratch. Um, this is, <laughs> I think we will see some exciting moments. Still queens on the board, rooks on the board, both kings potentially vulnerable. Uh, meanwhile, white's knight jumps forward and the tension, okay, black's last move um, creates a lot of tension here. If we bring up the analysis board, it's all about this bishop um, in the middle. White's rook is attacking it, white's knight is attacking it and the queen also attacking it. That is why with black's last move, bringing the rook across here. He's trying to get rid of this white rook. Um, potentially, there might be a set of trades. The rooks might leave the board. If white gets greedy and takes this bishop, um, we will see 
OK, Black has options here. He could just capture this rook, but he could also capture the white knight, and maybe this will backfire on white. So this is a critical moment. Which piece will white capture? Will he trade the rooks, or will he take this bishop? Um, mm -hmm. Lots of choice here. Um, <laughs> I Definitely. <don't... laughs> Let me just tell you, David, that the analysis that was performed in December the 23rd, they just investigated capturing the rook. So this is very interesting. Perhaps this is Aronian's uh, seconds analysis. Yeah, and the rooks, they have left the board. White did capture the rook. And look at Aronian's clock time. He's got 18 minutes, 46 <laughs> seconds. Remember, he only started with 15 minutes. He's gained so much time. He still studied this position before. We're on move 27. Um, but he must have looked at this actually in the break, even um, between the two games. Remember, in game one of today, we had something similar, but Aronian differed. He played something brand new this time. Um, he studied it before, but imagine spending the whole break between the games memorising all these mm -hmm. complicated moves. Um, this is <laughs> deeply impressive stuff here. Um, we should mention as well, White's knight is currently under attack from the Black Queen. That's why White steps up with the Queen, protecting that knight. Um, the onus is back on Aronian. Will this be the first time he properly thinks? He's got 18 and a half minutes. Yeah. He's got so much time now and the game has already progressed so deeply. Wow. Yes, yeah, so can you believe that? There's uh, 27 moves and the players have just bashed it out. Yeah, absolutely unbelievable stuff. And now, again, this has been analysed before, this move, and Black's response in that analysis was to move over all the way to the left and just to protect the pawn that is attacked. So the idea would be to bring the queen across to this square, protecting this pawn, this isolated pawn. It needs a bit of added protection. Also, potentially, if this knight moves, the black queen will be on a great diagonal, aiming down into white's camp. So shall I shall I add some more lines? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> white, well, this is what was analysed. Uh, the queen takes one step forward to attack the pawn again, and uh, the king comes forward to defend. And uh, again, white is just trying to massage any kind of position any advantage slowly and just improves the bishop. So that is some lines of analysis there. And uh, mm. I just love this, actually. You can see what people have been looking at yeah. with their engines and uh, <laughs> perhaps not realising that they should be a little bit more cautious with their own uh, analysis and the revealing what they're studying. Exactly. And actually, I think um, Tani earlier, when we interviewed him, he gave some great advice. He said he likes to, he prefers to analyse over the board. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you study things over the board with a friend um, or um, just a club mate, for example, then that won't be logged on the database. Your opponents, your future opponents will not know what you've been studying. Um, I, I am very secretive. I prefer not to put things on the online database because then my future opponents, they'll know what I've been looking at or they know that someone has been looking at that. Mm. Um, I prefer to keep my new ideas for, for myself and maybe one of their coaches, these guys, Rajabov's coach or Aronia's coach, he's been looking at this and he's just forgot that his information is out there and it mm. is available. Wow. Well, that could actually be like a new profession, like a chess spy. Because <laughs> there is so much information out there, so every chess player should have a spy just... Well, there is actually, you know, you, you <laughs> it sounds a bit funny, but when you're a trainer, for, especially for junior competitions, and you're like, OK, well, there isn't so much av information available... Part of the main job is actually to research your opponent. You're looking at uh, Googling them. You're looking in the chess databases, online databases. You're looking at absolutely anything you can find because uh, knowledge is power. And uh, yes, it's a very fascinating game. At times, I have felt like a detective. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one thing that I've noticed is, uh, and I'm not the only one to have noticed this, we have a tweet from Jackie the Alien who says, Crocodile ring is on. Watch out, Raja. <laughs> right, he's got that lucky ring. Uh, he said he reminded him of Ponchuk. And we did see uh, when Timur Rajabov showed his house that he had that Napoleon figure uh, to bring him good luck. Who's most lucky now? We, we finally see Levon Aronian thinking. Yeah. Uh, Still, though, over 15 minutes, the time he started with. That's right. Will he um, succeed in proving that one ring to rule them all? Levon <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Aronian, um, he has been thinking three minutes. Um, this is maybe not the, the critical moment, but he does have that boost of the time that he gained from earlier on. And the, remember the position, it has been simplified. All the rooks have left the board. Um, lots of trades so far. Uh, we're not quite in the end game yet. There's still a lot of pieces, a lot of pawns. 
But Aronia knows he does have that luxury of spending time. And I think that's right. When you have been surprised, this is the first position Aronian hasn't studied. When you have been surprised, that's when to pause. Human instinct is to continue rushing, to be a bit nervous and just to make a quick snap decision. That's where you just have to calm down. You have to breathe a bit. And Aronian, he finally does make a move. He brings his queen up one square. Uh, we mentioned that isolated pawn, black pawn at the corner there. It is also protected now by that black queen. Um, a decent move, maybe not the best one, but a very solid move there from Levon Aronian. And um, yeah, it is small margins at the top level in chess. And um, yeah, some of those factors you guys mentioned earlier, um, I think they will decide this semi-final. It's just, I mean, sorry, this final even. Mm -hmm. It's just so tight. Both players playing such good chess. Yeah, and he, uh, Rajabov is still increasing the pressure. You know, he has that one target in mind, which is that pawn that is all by itself on the left. And he wants Rajabov to, uh, sorry, Aronian, to do something with it. He uh, either wants the pawn to advance or perhaps even maybe to get, just ignore it so that the position actually becomes a lot clearer. Yeah, it's all about this pawn right now. Look at White's pieces, all of them, the queen, the rook, uh, the queen, the bishop and the knight, sorry. Um, they're all ganging up against this poor pawn. It's attacked three times, it's only defended twice. Therefore, White is threatening to capture it with the knight on the next turn. Does Aronian step forward with this pawn? It might continue being a target. White's queen might even step back, attacking it yet again. Um, so this pawn might never be safe. Or does Aronian just say, OK, forget about that pawn. You take it. You'll have to spend a couple of moves doing that. Uh, meanwhile, maybe he's considering getting this queen and bringing her into the enemy camp. And um, this queen could potentially cause havoc, start making some checks, start hitting some pawns. Um, this is a key decision. Does Levon Aronian um, react to this attack against this pawn by going active? Or does he go on the defensive? Um, Timur Rajabov, meanwhile, playing so confidently. Um, yeah, I mean, going for that pawn. He's doing the right thing. If you sense your opponent has a weak spot, you should focus on that and that should become the target. Mm -hmm. uh, but he made that decision very quickly. I'm very impressed. Mm. All right, and it is Levon Aronian thinking again. Now, we did see uh, before this game Timur Rajabov showing us uh, his home. It's not actually his home. Uh, he was playing in Moscow, the first tournament, the Skilling Open. I'm not quite sure if he is in Moscow now or if he's in Baku, uh, where he's originally from. Do you guys know? Uh, my spies haven't told me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might be back in uh, Azerbaijan, but... Um... Can't mm. confirm it. Mm, all right. And uh, we did. he did say that uh, he did have a, half a bottle of wine in there. He would pop it if he won the Skilling Open. He didn't win the Skilling Open, but he is. He very much likely could be winning the Air Things Masters. And that, I guess, would call for a celebration. Uh, 2020, a year without a lot of chess, over-the-board chess, of course, almost none of it. And it must be a long time since these two players won any big tournaments. Yeah, I think maybe the last time Timur Rajabov won, won a big tournament was back in 2019 when mm. he won the World Cup. Yeah. Levon Aronian, I mean, he wins a lot of these over-the-board tournaments. But in the online era this last year, he struggled a bit. He, he's been doing OK, but nothing special. And um, I mean, for him, this would be a huge boost. Um, it will be a huge statement of intent um, as online tournaments are set to take over. Mm. And... Um, set to continue in the new year. I mean, it's look a great you. start to the new year. So yeah. I just imagine you're playing in a tournament with 12 of the world's best players and you emerge victorious. Mm. Uh, I think it just sends absolutely all the right signals. It's what everyone dreams about. Exactly. And that, I think that's what Timur Chapo is doing right now. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> and, and he was actually sitting like that for like a minute or so. Uh, I just love his like style of thinking. He's just, it, it, it's very obvious when he is thinking very hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. these guys are like the opposite of players like Magnus Carlsen and yeah. Hikaru Nakamura, who are so expressive and uh, who get their energy in different ways by just getting those emotions out. Um, seems like Rajabov, he's <laughs> internalizing everything and that's how he gains his energy. And uh, that's fascinating to watch. And meanwhile, Levon Aronin, he still hasn't solved the issue of that black pawn. He's still contemplating, does he push it forward or does he sacrifice it? Does he allow White to capture that pawn? Mm -hmm. Um, actually, in the last game, in well, sorry, in the first game of today, um, that was the pawn that White won. That was the mm. pawn that Black gave up. Um, but he managed to find some counterplay to, later on and equalise the game. Um, will Levon Aronian try a similar strategy? Give up that pawn and go active? Or will he just push it forward? What do you think, Ivanka? Would you keep that pawn? I, I don't think I would keep that pawn. It's... Uh... It's not really doing too much. I think the kind of the the real essence of the position lies in White's 
unsafe king and I would be looking at ways of putting that king under pressure. Um, I just remember some of the... OK, well, we see, there you go, here, that uh, Lavon is kind of defending the pawn at the minute because... Uh, Oh, he's not been defending the pawn. So he's not defending the pawn, so he's gone for the active strategy. Yeah, and if we bring up the analysis board, we can see Timur Rajabov. He will debate uh, with himself whether he can capture this pawn now with his knight. This pawn was, un well, it is defended only twice. But remember, white has also got a lot of control over this square. So it's all about this square. But if white captures this pawn, maybe he'll go on the counterattack. Maybe black will drop his queen down, give check to the white king, or he might drop his queen the other direction. He might bring it to the middle of the board, start to attack some pawns potentially. Um, Timur Rajabov has to weigh up uh, in this position. Does he get greedy? Does he take this pawn? Or does he just try and sit still and control the position, not take too much risk? Um, mm -hmm. He's not taken too much risk at all in the final so far. Um, he's been very controlled with his approach. We saw him take the draw by repet uh, repetition in the last game. Um, I, would, yeah, I was about to say I would be surprised if he took that pawn because Black's queen would get so active. Um, instead, he retreats with his knight. Yes, uh, I do quite like that retreat because I think it's all about control. And I, I, we've seen uh, Rajabov be so aggressive and also Levon be so aggressive with the initiative. And I think in this type of position, it's all about just kind of keeping control, posing your opponent some, some very unpleasant questions. But uh, yes, yeah, um, intriguing, intriguing because, you know, Black's knight isn't quite working. It's, it's just defending the king and that's about it. Meanwhile, white has lovely kind of harmony. The knight is moving, working. The queen and bishop are working. The only problem is the unsafe king. Yes, and um, white does have this problem of the unsafe king. Meanwhile, black does need to activate those pieces quickly. The black knight, the black bishop. Um, normally, actually, knights are not so bad on that square. So the black knight is on a decent square. Um, that square is actually it's called F8. And I was always taught by one of my first coaches he said, knight on f8, there is no mate. Um, and it means that you won't get checkmated, the black knight doing a defensive job. But here, it doesn't need to do a defensive job. Um, the black king is safe anyway, even without that knight. So that is why um, Levon Aronian wants to improve that knight a bit later on. But first, he improves his bishop. The black bishop was actually attacked by white's queen there. So the black bishop, it's on the longest possible diagonal now. It's on a great square. Um, how will Timur Rajabov react to that? Oh, and we see it. He has moved the queen forward. So he wanted a trade. He kind of did a quick ass assessment that his position would be better without the queens on the board because of the unsafe king. And that is why Levon Aronian instantly retreated the queen. Yes, and Levon, with that last move, he's showing he wants to utilise the fact that White's king is potentially more open um, than his own. Uh, White's king is very airy. It has lots of open squares around it. Um, the black queen, it looks like it's on a passive square. Back to, the start, back to the square she started from, actually, but she will potentially drop down on that open line a bit later on. And meanwhile, White drops back with the queen as well, eyeing up that black bishop. Would you say that uh, Rajabov's opening choice, considering that they both bashed it out for 27 moves, would you say it's been a success or would you kind of say that Black is OK? I think Black is OK. Um, I think this opening choice would have been great if your opponent didn't know it was coming, if it was a surprise weapon, um, if your opponent hadn't had that time to study it and prepare in advance. But clearly both of these players, they've studied it in so much depth. Mm -hmm. um, I know if Timur Rajabov, for example, with White, if he played this opening against me, he would have shocked me. He would probably have a huge advantage by now, but he has kind of shown Levon Aronian where he's been doing his homework, what he's been studying in advance. Mm -hmm. And I think for these players, they need to maybe mix it up, find something a bit new because they're just balancing each other out right yeah. now. They've studied everything there is to study and uh, neither side really gaining the advantage. Yeah, but actually, if we go back to the board, uh, Levon Aronian has played a rather surprising move. He's, he has moved his bishop and he's seemingly just giving up a pawn. And uh, why on earth can White just not capture that pawn? We do like our little guys, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> we do like our little guys. So White can capture this pawn, but suddenly maybe um, White is giving up control of this square. This square was covered by the bishop last move. Maybe Black's queen will suddenly drop herself down, give check. It's not the end of the world, but this is scary. The white king would suddenly be under attack. White's king it could step forward, but black's queen would continue giving checks, suddenly giving check, attacking this pawn and attacking this pawn. Maybe it's just too scary to allow this. You don't want to take any risks. And Rajabov in this position, he will think twice before grabbing, well, sorry, before grabbing this pawn. 
at the side of the board. I love the way you say maybe, because it's not maybe. Definitely. <laughs> it's definitely. <laughs> <laughs> David showing his strength that I just wanted to point that I love. Maybe the Queen can come down and just cause all sorts of problems to the King. And that's exactly why that pawn should not be captured. Yes, and um, White does offer a Queen trade, um, just preventing that idea um, that we mentioned, Black Queen potentially trying to get very active. Um, in the last game, actually, between these guys, when Timur Rajabov had white, so in game one of today, we saw the queens dance around, trying to <laughs> one side trying to trade the queens, the other side trying to avoid that trade, and it happened <laughs> for six, seven moves in a row. And we might see a similar case again. Yeah. Levon Aronian, he's already run away from that queen trade a couple of times as black. And normally these players, they're very stubborn with their psychology. Once they've kind of ruled out one idea, once they've said to themselves, I'm not going for a queen trade, They'll never go for the queen trade until the right moment a bit later on. And that's why he blocks with his knight, improving the black knight and stopping the queen trade mm -hmm. all in one go. Yes, uh, I, I agree with you. What I li really liked about that kind of idea was that Rajabov is, isn't actually calculating. He's just quick doing a snap assessment. Well, if the queens are off, I have greater chances of winning that lone black pawn on the left and then I can start pushing my past pawn and uh, causing all sorts of problems. So this is why Levon is just like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm absolutely not, not a chance. Uh, but he, with that move, he does allow White to take a step forward because one of the important things in chess, especially when you don't have so much time on the clock, is to go by instinct. And uh, there's consequences of the knight moving there. You must first of all look at the move. Okay, and there you can see it. You can, there is a consequence to blocking the queen with the knight. And now he can play the move that wasn't possible before. And uh, this is, as we know, the Russian school of thought. Ah. Yeah, every move has consequences. Yes, and the consequence for black is that white's queen now is very, very active. Um, he could have traded those queens off and maybe said, okay, the queens balance each other out. But now he's allowed white to... In entrench his queen in the enemy camp. And um, if we bring up the board, we can see this is a crucial moment for Levon Aronian. His bishop is attacked. What to do with this bishop? Remember as well, this pawn is also a potential target. But he could jump forward. Um, he could capture this pawn, this undefended pawn in the middle of the board. This would have invited trouble though. White would have jumped forward with his own knight and causing a double attack, attacking the knight. Also attacking his opponent's knight, uh, attacking the bishop, sorry, and attacking his knight, opponent's knight. And the black knight is pinned cannot move because then the Black Queen would be under attack. This is why Levon Aronian said, no, I see your trap. Um, I cannot take this pawn as Black, not quite yet at least. And therefore he sidesteps with the Queen, getting his Queen to a safer square, defending the Bishop and defending the pawn, a multi-purpose move there. Um, this is, I think, the best chess players in the world. Every move they make, they always achieve at least one or two of their goals wow. with those moves. So um, yeah, Levon Aronian finding the best defensive move there. And I have to say, uh, I think those white pawns look very, very nice to, to my untrained chess eye. But how about those two double black pawns? Will they be a problem for Levon at some point? Maybe in the end game. Um, at the moment, while queens are on the board, um, it's going to be hard to push anything or hard to get at those black pawns. And the black pawns, they keep the black king very safe, at least. And white's pawns, they might look impressive, but they're very far advanced. Mm. And actually, maybe they want to be slightly further back because then they give more shelter to the white king. Yeah. Um, it's always interesting. It's always, I mean, we say pawns are the soul of chess, knowing when to push them forward and to gain space, um, knowing when to do that or when to keep them back, keep kind of controlling weak squares. Um, that is one of the trickiest uh, nuances in chess, really. And black's doubled pawns, long term, they might be a factor, but temporarily, at least, um, they do an okay job of protecting yeah. each other and keeping the Black King safe. Mm. Yeah, for the, everything in chess is always temporary. So at the time, for the time being, they're really good defenders. And, but if you take the queens off the board, when there's no need for those pawns to be defenders, then it all becomes about pushing those pawns. And those double pawns, they're going to find it a lot tougher to start advancing. And if you can imagine there's a race between the left and the right side of the board, well, I think white will be superior there with their one pawn. But uh, yes, for the time being, it's safe. It's safe. And the thing about double pawns actually is they're very weak when they have no other pawns on the lines next to them. At the moment, black has these two double pawns. Uh, we see at the bottom there on the F line, um, those black two black double pawns, um, they're fine because they have a pawn next to them. So they mm. can always kind of protect each other. If the pawn next to them wasn't on the board, then they'd be extremely weak and they'd be huge targets. Um, and that's kind of the scenario we have to avoid at all costs. But as long as your doubled pawns have other pawns on the lines adjacent to them, um, then they're kind of okay.
Okay. Yeah, but uh, with Rajabov's last move, he's really upping the pressure. Have you noticed every move of his is like an attack or a threat? Because now the knight has centralized itself and is attacking the bishop. And now the question to Lavon is, can he just move the bishop? Or does he have to worry about any potential attacks? Because that knight is now there and it's an octo knight and it could cause some problems. Okay, so the bishop has retreated and uh, now we have a very critical opportunity that uh, actually the computer is suggesting. Ooh, so what is this opportunity? Is white going to get brave and yes. go for the attack in this position? Yes, this is the radical opportunity, which is basically to capture the pawn in the center, to sacrifice the knight, to open everything up against the king. And so the point is, is after pawn takes knight, queen takes pawn check, the king has to move, and uh, now things get really <laughs> shaky because now the bishop will come in and start attacking the knight. And we could see white potentially line up um, an idea here. Another move that I would be very attracted to, I'm not sure if it quite works here, is to bring the bishop um, across, threaten, lining up the queen and bishop on the same diagonal, trying to create some potential checkmate threats. Actually, if black is careless here and moves a pawn forward, we would see a checkmate, black's king trapped and the queen protected, the white queen protected by her bishop. This is a courageous, it's a very courageous move because you balance the, you alter the balance like irretrievably, you cannot go back. And so that is why Rajabov plays a little bit more flexibly and just goes, okay, fine. I, he, I th I'm sure he's aware of the possibility. He just doesn't want to commit to it just yet. Yeah, and maybe if he had two, three more minutes on his clock, he's, he's only down at six minutes. If he had a bit more time, he would have at least studied that opportunity. And personally, I think he should have gone for it because the worst comes to the worst. White would likely have been able to give perpetual check and make a draw. Um, so I don't think there was too much risk involved with that sacrifice. But Rajabov, he missed that opportunity. Um, will that come back to bite him? He has had to oh, retreat well, his knight. Well, well, things are sharpening up dramatically because he's captured a pawn. He kind of really took that philosophy. You go back, I go forward. And now the bishop is in the air. And... Uh, I think Lavon, just looking at the webcams, Lavon looks satisfied. He's bouncing up and down. He's a confident man. Yeah, he is a confident man. And meanwhile, Rajabov, he's trying to um, just get, try to maybe make Lavon feel slightly less confident by offering another trade of queen. So Black's corner pawn there, Black's weak pawn, the isolated one, it has been captured. Uh, we have seen a trade of pawns. So still equal pawns, but Black has given up his wing pawn for a central pawn. And now we will see, does Levon go for the queen trade? I think he will not. He will try and keep the queens on the board. The black queen might bring herself down on the same line, try to edge towards the white king. The white king potentially still a target. Um, this one, it is heating up. And Levon, he likes his position, just his body language, the fact that he's bobbing up and down, <laughs> despite having quite a lot of time on the clock. It means he just senses that this is quite a critical moment. He's sensing he might get a chance. White's last few moves have been a bit odd, bringing the knight forward, then bringing it back and um, allowing this central pawn to drop. And there we see Black's queen bring herself into the white half now. Black will try and use his queen and the bishop to team up to get at the white king. The computer loves it. Now, would you now, uh, if you came to this uh, chessboard, would you choose to be Black? If I just looked at this position... Um, without knowing the players, without knowing anything, I would choose black for sure. I think black has nothing to risk. White's king is the weaker as long as queens remain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the queens just have to stay on the board. And it's just, if once the queens are off, it's going to be all about racing those pawns and white will have the advantage there. So the queens must stay on the board. And uh, Rajabov is like, let's let's swap off queens. He's insisting. Surprise, surprise. Okay. And I, I suspect that Lavon Aronian will say no. I uh, fully expect him to move his queen. Thinking about it, how does he keep the queens on the board in this position? How does Levon maintain the queens? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, you have to slide the queen to two squares to defend it. And uh, then now this is where it gets sneaky because if white's like, come on, let's really try to swap off queens. Well, black can actually throw in a rather unusual check. It's kind of a little bit unexpected and it's a consequence of the white queen abandoning. Okay, we might even see it now. We get to... And, and if this happens, then white's king could actually take off this bishop. But the fact is that the white king has been deflected away from the protection of his own bishop. And suddenly black's 
uh, queen would be doing a lot of damage, giving check to the king and maybe winning a pawn a bit later on. Um, this could well happen. Um, I do think that we're headed towards this position. Black's last move is to bring the queen across. Look how scary this queen and bishop <laughs> are together. The perfect combo, the queen on dark squares, the bishop on light squares. Um, this is why... OK, we are headed towards this exact position. Rajabov, he's asking for the queen trade. We've seen Rajabov give a check. The bishop has to be taken. And now white's bishop will also be taken. Um, this is the current position. I do expect Timur Rajabov to drop his queen back again, begging for the queen trade and indirectly attack, uh, defending this pawn at the corner. So black cannot go a pawn ahead here. But Timur Rajabov, in this position, he's having a think. White's king is still vulnerable and Levon Aronin as black not risking anything as long as the queens stay on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is it, it's, it's, it's getting interesting. Do you think now one of the players will win this game or is it still most likely a draw? Well, it, it really is most likely a draw. But uh, to be honest, when the queens are on the board, anything yeah. can happen. The queens and the, especially the queen and the knight, which is like the perfect combination. You know, those two pieces can whip up a mating net if you're careless. So I, I do expect the position to end in a draw, but still, mm. still a lot of uh, ways to get there. Yeah, and so what Black is aiming for now is to get at the White King. Black needs to improve his own knight. The Black Knight now currently not participating in any attack. He needs to coordinate that knight, harmonise it with his own queen. Queen and knights, great attacking combos. The knight is the only thing that can do, the only piece that can do stuff that the queen can't. So if Black can get his knight towards the White King, then Black might have a winning attack. If the Black Knight cannot coordinate with its queen, then meanwhile, white has this corner pawn. White's pawn there on the left flank. Imagine if the queens disappear, that pawn will just have a clear run through to the end of the board. It will become a new queen. Um, and knights, remember, are so bad at stopping these corner pawns. That is why white wants to trade queens. Black has to go for the attack. I think a draw may be most likely, but still a lot of life left. Both sides have something to hope for. Mm -hmm. And it is Levon Aronian in the move. Uh, he is, uh, well, thinking for one minute there. Uh, will the time be an issue here? We see both players down to five minutes ish. Potentially. Yes, potentially. Mm. And uh, David is really calling it because that is why we have seen Aronian move his pawn forward. He wants to mobilize the knight, reroute it so that it can cause some kind of headache or problem for the black, for the white king. Yeah, the pawn has stepped forward, creating a square now for the black knight. If white just gets careless and makes a move on the other side, this knight will jump forward. And again, now there's a monster threat, a killer threat, maybe a winning threat even. The knight will jump into this square. Again, if white is careless, the knight will jump forward. And this is a double attack, a mm. fork on the king and queen. Um, white has to prevent this. Black's last move, aiming to get his knight to this square. White has to find a way to stop this. And therefore, he goes for the trade of knights. Um, this is actually a pawn sacrifice. Um, the knights have left the board. Um, and now Black's queen will jump forward. It's giving check. Black giving check. He's going to win this pawn now. White's pawn here on the left. Black will have four against three on the right side of the board. Will that be enough to win? I'm not sure. Um, there's no pass pawns. Black can't get any pawns to the end of the board quite yet. But he does have the advantage. Black is the only one who can win this game. Wow. Uh, Levon Aronian now in the move, thinking about his next move. We have seen a very like, slow start to the final with uh, two draws, quite fast draws. You were actually quite surprised that Timur Rajabov yeah, went into that move repetition in the last game. Is it simply the mentality of it being a final that has made it sort of a slow start and maybe now we're seeing them they're getting into the mode. Well, it's a very slow start in terms of results. Yeah. But what we've seen on the board has been so tense. Mm. We've seen some deep, deep opening preparation where the two players are kind of like sounding each other out yeah. and asking who's the better player prepared. We had another position where it looked like Levon was winning and he was two extra pawns up. But, uh, you know, R Rajabov was so resourceful that he managed to find a way to hold the balance. And here we see exactly the same scenario happen again. It's all a question of who is better, being better prepared. And uh, what we're seeing here is a very fair result, actually. I think it is just going to finish in a draw. But uh, it's been a very level game. Yes, and White, meanwhile, has gone down a pawn. So he's trying his best to cause a nuisance. And the thing about Queen End Games is that it's all about checks. And here, White has given a couple of checks. White's queen now attacking the Black King. The, maybe the issue for Black is that it's just impossible to stop these checks. Um, no matter what you do, White's queen will continue mm. giving these checks. Um, we might be, see the position repeat itself. This 
if, if white moves the queen up, this is the third time they've repeated the position and black's king could not escape. It is a draw. An other draw in the final, the first final match between Timur Rajavo and Lavon Neronian. It was getting interesting. You said that the game was heating up. Why are we seeing another draw here? Yeah, I think it was just um, that great creativity from Levon Aronian trying to go on the attack, but it was just balanced out by Rajabov's calm, I mean, just very calm, perfect defence there. Mm. Um, attack versus defence and both sides just cancelling each other out. Mm. And, and where was it? Uh, it? Because you said, OK, it started to look interesting for Black especially. What happened in this game, David? Yeah, so I think the key moment came very close to the end there. Um, we did say it was all about could the queens be traded off. And Rajabov, as white, if he trades the queens, he has a big advantage due to this corner pawn. This corner pawn would have a clear run forward if the queens leave the board. Uh, Levon Aronian, he found this beautiful idea, this tricky idea. Always look for checks in the position. And the only way he could avoid the queen trade was to give a check with his bishop, attacking the white king. White's king uh, had to take this bishop. If it steps to the side, this pawn would disappear with check. He could not allow this. He could not let pawns drop. So therefore, he captured this bishop. We saw a trade. White's queen blocked. And a few moves later, we saw this position. Uh, Black's knight threatening to jump into the game and start attacking this white king, this kind of defenseless white king. And Rajabov, he found maybe the only way to defend this game, the only way to hold the balance, he traded the knights. Um, the knights leaving the board because of this double attack. And once they do leave the board, Black gave a check. Black actually even won a pawn. But white was able to save the game by giving continuous checks with his queen. And the position repeated itself three times. Uh, very, very tenacious defending there by Rajabov. In just a few minutes, uh, Ginger GM Simon Williams will join us. He's going to give us an update on the match for the third place, but obviously also his thoughts on the final going on right now. And here we have it, the standings after three games. It is still all in the balance between Levon Aronian and Timur Rajabo. Three draws so far. The question is, can one of them win the final game of today and take the first match? Be the leader before the final and decisive uh, game. What do you guys think? What do you think, David? Last game, will we see them? Go for a win. I think Levon Aronian, um, he actually maybe impressed me more in that last game. He was the one trying to make things happen. Rajabov was just trying to prevent um, any catastrophe. And Levon Aronian now has the white pieces as well. And it's like having the home advantage maybe in football. It just feels, or having the serve intense, yeah. it just feels like you can dictate the play. Um, he will be the one deciding, does he go on the attack or does he just play things a bit safe? Mm. I think Aronian, if he's in the mood for a fight, we will see a full-blooded battle. The, the difference is so huge, though, Ivanka. A win going into the final day with the lead. Uh, but then you have to, of course, maybe take a few risks in that last game to go for that win. Because if you lose that one, I mean, it's devastating then. Yeah, if you lose that one, that is the worst feeling possible because you go into the second day with a loss. And it's not just a, a game loss, it's also losing the whole match. So that's not what they want. So I think both players will be slightly cautious. But we have seen some impressive opening preparation from Levon Aronian. You know, they've had titanic battles mm. in the same variation. And with the white pieces, Levon was the one putting pressure on Rajabov. So definitely he has a slight advantage, but uh, still anything can happen. All right. It is uh, so tense, so interesting. Two of the very best chess players in the world fighting in the Air Things Masters final. But who do the chess player think is the all-time best chess player? Fischer. He was alone against the Soviet Union and uh, it was hard. Beating all of them by analyzing on your own, imagine without the engine. I, I don't know how he did it. It was Mission Impossible against the Soviet Union where everybody is preparing together and they were all uh, kind of working against Fischer. I certainly do not uh, share his uh, like political views, but uh, as we're talking about pure chess here, I mean, this is the, the, the best chess player ever. Most likely Garry Kasparov, the best all-time chess player, because uh, he's done so much for chess. Also, he was dominant for at least 20 years. For now, it's still Kasparov. Uh, I always said that uh, Kasparov was the 
the best uh, player of history. But I, I think Magnus now is, is competing. We'll see when Magnus uh, stops playing. I think we can talk about uh, who is the best between these two. It's still Kasparov, but uh, Magnus is already very close to him. And uh, probably if Magnus continues at uh, the pace he is having, then by the end of ca- his career he will surpass Kasparov. The level of chess has uh has been growing in general. So in that sense, I guess currently the best player is the strongest player. I think uh, Kasparov is the all-time best. And uh, I do hope one day when I'm looking at my career, not in in the present, but in in the past, that uh, I will be up there with um, some of the big names. Magnus Carlsen hoping at some point to be the all-time best uh, chess player. Many, many, most of the players, though, saying uh, it is Gary Kasparov, the best chess player of all time. Except uh, Anish Giri. He's saying Magnus Carlsen there. That's a little bit surprising. Yeah, that's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Anish Giri maybe a bit younger than some of the other players. So he's just grown up with Magnus at the top for so long. Um, personally, for me, it's Gary Kasparov. He was so dominant mm. for so, so many years. And we are now joined by another great chess player, G- Ginger GM, Simon Williams. I'll put you on the spot right away, uh, Simon. Who is the all-time best chess player? I, well, I would probably have to go with Gary Kasparov, mm. but um, my favourite player would be Mikhail Tal, who wasn't actually mentioned there because he loved sacrificing all his pieces for the attack. So um, quite a personal choice there. Ah, Tall, like so, like Daniel Dubo. Then maybe you, you know, you said so many times he likes to sacrifice. Definitely, yeah. There's certainly shades of Tao in Dubov there because uh, Tao was a bit crazy, and it's before computers <laughs> assess the position. And he he loved giving his pieces for the attack, and we've seen Dubov doing that as well. We, we've kind of mixed results so far. Yeah. Uh, you are actually, Simon. I mean, we do know there is also a battle for that third place in the tournament. We haven't been talking too much about it. I've just seen a few results. It looks like it's very interesting. Can you give us an update? What's happening there? Yeah, certainly. So there's a battle between MVL and Dubov for this third place spot. And uh, we can maybe bring up a position from round one on move 22. And, uh, well, we saw MVL maybe not on top form yesterday, it seemed. And Dubov was just crazy as always. And um, in this position here, it's black to play. And you can see that black's got these two rooks lined up there. And two rooks on a sort of open line is a very powerful thing to have because they work on open lines. But this next move is just typical Dubov. He goes, rook takes knight. Now, the idea of this is to open up the white king, but you've got to remember the rook is worth five points. The knight is only three points. So it's a sacrifice. White now takes the rook with his pawn, and the other rook now joins in the attack. And uh, this is just typical Dubov. It's a very risky approach. Nothing is totally clear here for black, but he has opened up that white king a little bit. And he he went on to win uh, a fantastic game here with this sacrifice. So a very nice play. Wow. And uh, I do see the score now. So Daniil Dubo did win those two first games, but Maxim has been able to strike back. Uh, He won that last game, so it is 2-1 before the final game. Why do you think, Simon, it is that we're seeing explosive games and, and decided games here? And in the final, we're seeing draws and, you know, the players may be testing each other a little bit more. I think it's a bit cagey in the final. I mean, you can sort of relax when you're playing for third place a little bit. Obviously, it's a big thing to get, but you've already lost the day before. So it's like, oh, okay, I've lost. I'm going to I'm gonna sack my pieces, have a bit of fun, and, and just play with less stress. And I think the final, it really is stressful because, you know, there's that saying, you don't really remember who comes second, right? So these guys, they've both played so well, but we're only going to really remember one of them, I think, at the end of the tournament. And that's that's what they're playing for at the moment. So re- really stressful. Yeah. And uh, I mean, even if the games have been draw, super interesting games there. And, and you have chosen a move that you particularly liked in this one too, uh, Simon. Yeah, I, I thought round two in general was a very interesting encounter between these two players. And um, well, in this position we see here, I mean, I'm, I'm always going to point out this move. I can't stop myself. You know, any move with Harry the H pawn is something I've got to show. And in this position, we see that now white uses Harry the H pawn. I think Aronian was white here. And this this seems like a really weird move, but 
when you play chess, and this is a great tip for those players out there trying to improve, it's not just about your own ideas. You've got to get into the mind of your opponent and you've got to think, what is my opponent trying to do? How can I stop my opponent's ideas? And to win at chess is doing your own ideas but stopping your opponent. And Black really wants to move this knight um, out of the way because at the moment it's like a traffic jam in the middle of the board. The knight is blocking the bishop. But after the next move, we can see, I'm not sure, I think Black pushed the pawn in the middle of the board. And now Harry moves one square forwards. And the whole point of this idea is not necessarily to do anything with white, but it's to stop Black from moving that knight to g6 and then moving the bishop. So it's a very clever way to get, you know, stop your opponent doing what they want to do. And that's, that's something which not everyone thinks about when they're playing chess. Um, and also this game, I would like to mention, it was very interesting, even the final position. I don't know if you have a chance to bring that up, but the final position I, I found quite fascinating because I think it shows a bit of the mentality between the two players. In this position, Rajabov, I think, has great compensation with Black, and he could have played on. I think Aronian is the one who's on the back foot, but that knight is stuck there, like an like, octopus with many arms in the middle of the board. And I think Black could have played on here, but Black now decided to repeat the position three times. And for me, that's a little bit of a psychological hint that, you know, um, a little bit of sign of weakness on, on Rajabov's part. I think he should have played for the win in, in this position. All right. Uh, yeah, David. Yeah, I fully agree with that, Simon. It did feel like the momentum was all with Black um, in that position. But we did actually have a guest earlier, 10-year-old Tani, yes. and he's one of the most exciting prodigies in world chess. What tips would you give him and what did you do as a 10-year-old to improve your game? Um, well, I think the first thing we can learn from that last position is to never take draws. <laughs> I mean, I think I think I think when you're a kid, it's very tempting because you're kind of scared and you like draw and you kind of just want to get a draw. But I think the first thing is to learn to fight. And if you never take draws as a kid, you have to play. And OK, you're going to lose a lot of games, but it's going to teach you a very important lesson, not just in chess, but in life as well. So that's that's very important. Don't take draws. Fight to the end. And uh, yeah, if you always try to win, you, you can't really go wrong, I feel. Hmm. And uh, Simon, who's looking like your favourite between Aronian and Rajabov? Well, I, I think after that round two game, I, I'm going to have to go with Aronian, but it's it's so tight and uh, they've both been playing great chess. There's clearly not much between them. and It's now just on this final game. I think Aronian has the white pieces, slight advantage. So I'm going to slightly pick Aronian, but I wouldn't be surprised if Rajabov uh, comes up with some time trouble magic as he's been doing so often in this tournament as well. And uh, I also have to ask the question, we are running a Twitter quiz where we're asking everyone, as the first prize is $60,000, how would they spend the money? And uh, Simon, ah. <laughs> <laughs> the question to you. How would I spend the money? I, I, I might buy another jacket. Um, <laughs> I've sort of seem to be running out of jackets, but no, I, I don't know really. That's that's a lot of money, isn't it? I yeah. mean, um, would I get a beard trim? Mm, I'm not <laughs> sure. Or would I get it braided? Of course, so many decisions to make. <laughs> I, I I really don't know. Did you guys decide how you you'd spend it? I I'm gonna say traveling. If I'm allowed to travel in 2021, I would spend it on traveling. Yeah, I'm going to invest in objects. <laughs> <laughs> I might do that as well, to be honest. <laughs> I'd, I'd be boring. I'd either save it up or I'd hire Magnus Carlsen as my chess coach. Oh, wow. OK. You'd probably get one hour of him at that price, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Bargain. Bargain. Yeah. laughs> All right, Simon. Wow, the exciting final game in the first final match is coming up. Exciting. Are you excited? Very excited. It's going to be great. Can't All wait right. to watch it. Perfect. Thank you for joining us, Simon. We'll see you again tomorrow. Okay, see you see. tomorrow. Bye. Yeah, it is coming up. The final game of the first match between Levon Aronian and uh, Timur Rajabov. They are all equal after three games. So if we have a winner in this one, we will have a winner of day one. Final expectations for this one, Yovanka. Oh, I think it's going to be it's very, very tense. The, Simon and David have said it has been very cagey so far. I think the players will still continue with their manoeuvres. But... Uh, Anyway, who knows? Because I have to say, Levon has introduced a new chess yeah. piece into the arena. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and you can see it. Lev Aronin has introduced with his crocodile ring. <laughs> there you go. It is a chess champs. Yeah, it's just a beautiful, beautiful 
I love that ring. Yeah, I know, I know. And he said, uh, it said he reminded it. Wow, um, it's a reminder of his dog. Uh, actually, okay, so there's supposed to be 15 minutes in between. They actually started the game a little bit early, so we're just a little bit late in here. What's happened, David? They're, they're impatient to kick off, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Timur Rajabov, he has not gone for the same approach that he did two games ago as Black. As Black last time, he played the Sicilian defence. It's a counter-attacking opening. It leads to very kind of, uh, well, fighting games. Instead, he's gone for something a bit more dry. He's gone for the Berlin defence, the mm. Berlin Wall, because it's called the Berlin Wall. It's just hard to break this opening down. And Levon Aronian, he's famous for playing this opening as Black. This time he's playing it from the white side. Will he have learnt from maybe his clashes against Maxime Vashel de Graaf in the semi-final in this opening? Uh, Timur Rajabov surprising us there in the, in the opening, surprising uh, Levon Aronian in the opening. Um, this opening does have a bit of a drawish tendency, but Black with that king, Black's king now moving for the second time in the game, not castling. Um, Black is often the one on the defensive in these early stages. Um, fascinating um, opening battle here. It does feel like these two players, they're like great boxers, just trying to land that punch on the mm. opponent, but somehow just sizing each other up still. And uh, a bit of mind games here by Timur Rajabov. All right, they are changing it up, the players. And Yvanka, you, you were mentioning that uh, that crocodile ring that uh, Levon Aronian uses. Yes. Um, I think we had a tweet about you. We mentioned. did have a lovely tweet from uh, Tim Fox where it says, Love Aronian's new chess piece. And uh, there you can see it on ah. the screen. <laughs> Ferocious. Yeah. Uh, I have to, have to admit, when the ring comes on with such a big, impressive ring, as uh, David says, the ring to rule them all. <laughs> <laughs> one comes... ring to rule them all, one ring to bind them. <laughs> exactly. One ring to rule them all, and in the darkness. Find them. <laughs> You're a movie. Oh, yeah. a movie Nerd. geek. <laughs> <laughs> also, someone really likes the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, I just like Levon's ring. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with his ring and with his finger, he is uh, pushing out the moves. What's happening, David? That's right. And this is one of the most aggressive approaches against the Berlin Wall, against the Berlin defense. Timur Rajabov, that's why we see him with his head in his hands right now. He studied this before, for sure. But he needs to be accurate as black. I've actually seen this position. I've played this position before from the black side. With mixed success, I lost here as black against uh, Fabiano Caruana, the world number two. But I managed to fight back a couple of years later and I managed to beat Samuel Shankland, an American champion. Um, as black, you need to know your stuff. And that's why it's worrying for me that Timur Rajabov, he's thinking here. Um, there's only, I think, maybe only two or three acceptable lines for black. And if we bring up the analysis board, we can see why he is thinking. It's all because of, look at these white pawns. These pawns advance. I mean, they're so brave. These pawns on the white side, look at this. They're heading towards the end goal already. The queens are off the board and they're just pushing forward. Black pushes on the other side, meanwhile. Black pushing a pawn here to create some squares for his bishop, maybe. Um, but I would expect white to continue pushing forward. Maybe this pawn running forward. Look at this. Um, you love your pawn chains, Kaya. Do you think this is impressive? I love it. Um, yeah, and white does have this four versus three majority on this side of the board. These four pawns, are, one of them wants to become a queen later on. But David, uh, we've seen a very new move uh, appear on the board and this is not something that you've actually played because I had a quick glance at your, your <laughs> games and uh, this has only been played twice. Yeah, this pawn push, very, very rare, actually. I mean, the moves that I've played in the past are to move on the other side of the board to fight against white strong pawns. You can push the knight back. You can also push this pawn forward. Um, sorry, in this position, uh, you can push this pawn forward to try and create an open line for the black rook. There's many opportunities. Um, you can also push a pawn forward this side. Many, many different choices. And it's not clear which one's best, but uh, Timur Rajabov, maybe he was unsure of the kind of consequences of those moves. So he just doesn't commit himself on the right flank and he plays on the other side instead. When you say uh, Berlin Wall, you said this game uh, went into the Berlin Wall. I keep uh, thinking back to the 2016 World Championship match when Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin kept playing that opening and all the games ended in draws. Yeah, it's got a very drawish reputation. Um, White normally has a small advantage, but Black's just so solid, it's hard to break him down. Um, that being said, um, these both, both these players, they will have studied those games, they will have studied thousands of games in their lifetime in this opening. Um, so they, they will have ideas, I mean, especially Levon Aronian, he'll have ideas as White how to break down that wall. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, he's created his own wall, those pawns on the right side, those white pawns. I think they're beautiful, um, but will they be a strength? Will Rajabov prove that they're a weakness later? Maybe the white king 
Um, despite the Queen's being off the board, the White King can sometimes become weak. Mm. We see uh, Rajabo now trying to create his own cane of pawns here, like a nice family who just supporting each other all the way yes. up to the end. They're supporting each other, those black pawns on the left there, but they're not really advancing um, too far forward. They're not scaring White mm. um, as much as uh, Aronin here is trying to scare him with those pawns on the right flank. Um, a very kind of subtle move there by Timur Rajabov. The reason he pushed that pawn forward as black there is to create a square for his king. So the king wants to move next next turn to the square that the pawn just came from. Um, yeah, very tense here. I think Levon Aronian, he just needs to activate those white pieces. The white pieces need to support the white pawns and the pieces there at the bottom left of the screen, the, especially that rook in the corner, somehow they need to centralise themselves in order for the pawns to become a strength. Mm -hmm. And do you think that uh, Rajabov is playing into his preparation or do you think that this is somehow or other he wasn't expecting this line? and uh, just is making it up. I think they're both kind of slightly freestyling, um, but they, they will have done their homework. They will have studied similar games, maybe not this exact position, um, but something very, very similar. I do think, especially Rajabov, maybe he's just bluffing slightly. He is the one who doesn't regularly play this opening, um, especially compared to Levon Aronian. Levon is one of the world's experts in this Berlin defence. Um, especially with black though. So maybe he's just hoping that Levon, this time being on the other side of the board, having the white pieces, maybe that will be uh, cause some unfamiliarity and um, just cause some confusion in a way. But Rajabov, he has played quickly, you're right, despite potentially being surprised. Mm -hmm. And Levon Aronian, what is he thinking about now? Is it still advancing those pawns and, and getting them even further up the board or is it something else? Yeah, I think Levon Aronian, again, if we bring up the board... Well, okay. he, he's ah. listening to you, Kaya. <laughs> you are now mind. officially a chess <laughs> commentator. <laughs> you, you guessed it. <laughs> he's advancing the pawns and like, taking their space. Yeah, and why not? Why not? That was his plan. And in chess, you should always be consistent with your plans. That's the key. If you've come up with an idea, don't change that plan halfway through. Don't start suddenly playing on the other side of the board. Um, just stick with your plan, for better or worse. And um, Levon Aronian pushing forward there. Look how scary those pawns are. Um, Levon, Aronian, uh, Levon Aronian pushing the, pushing those pawns. And Rajabov, he's reacted, developing his knight, improving his knight. And now White's pawn, actually that central pawn right in the middle there, no longer protected. Um, so Rajabov attacking a pawn in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I would expect to see Levon Aronian play quite a quick move here, bring his bishop out. The White bishop not doing anything. That bishop can bring itself out and protect um, a pawn in the middle there. Um, Levon Aronian just taking a while to kind of calm down. He likes his position. He's, mm. He knows that this is pretty impressive for White, especially those pawns. He just needs to make sure that he doesn't kind of rush too much. He just needs to take a step, take a bit of time now to consolidate the space that he's gained. Yeah, and I think he's also considering what is Black's position, what, what is Black's plans, because it's not, you know, you always have to remember there are two players playing the game. And so, yes, that knight could be attacking the pawn, but it could be headed to greener pastures, perhaps centralising itself and making an octo knight. Mm. And uh, those are the kind of moves that he'll be thinking about and he'll be kind of, OK, well, I have a reaction to that. Mm. And a great comment on Twitter by D4 Damager, why is Levon's king social distancing in the corner there? <laughs> Good question. <Yeah. laughs> Actually, yeah, if we uh, bring up the board, we can see this black king. It is social distancing. It's keeping a square away from the black rook and from the black bishop. Um, the king maybe wants to slide itself forward into a very safe So hole. Levon's king, though. Uh, oh, Levon's king. Yeah, look at that, David. That's, that's even more they're social both. distance. <laughs> but they're both doing both it. Of them. <laughs> They're both following the rules of 2020, but it's a new year. And um, White's King, it is social distancing as well, even more so. <laughs> yeah. I think this White King is keeping the two metre rule. The Black King maybe only keeping the one metre um, <laughs> distance. And um, yeah, this White King, it is social distancing. But actually, after White's last move, protecting this pawn, I do sooner or later expect the White King to start maybe marching forward to support those white pawns. Mm. Um, yeah, a very tense position. I love White's decision to just push and hope for the best. So the White King uh, and both the kings lost their queens. So now the, the White King wants to protect the pawns. 
to get a new queen in his life. That's right. The, oh. When the queens are off, the king comes along and tries to steal the glory. Yeah, he needs a second wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just... I've never thought about it like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I have. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't just want one wife. Maybe he wants more than one wife. He mm. wants all the queens on the board. Uh, he wants to push all those pawns forward. Um, yeah, this is uh, it's definitely pressure on Rajabov here. How does he stop the advance of those pawns? Those black pieces, look at them. Apart from the knight, they're all on the back rank. They're all asleep. He's still playing with his only active piece here, Timur Rajabov. And look at it, the white king is tired of social distancing. Mm. He wants some friends. He wants to party. And that white king steps forward. And this is actually a pawn sacrifice. Um, Black's knight now can capture a pawn on the left there. Um, this is... <laughs> I mean, that was so brave. Levon Aronia played the move instantly without thinking. Black's knight, though, is attacking a pawn. What happens if he snacks on this pawn? Um, he doesn't do that. The black pawn, uh, the black knight could have taken this pawn. The white rook would move across. Maybe Rajabov, knowing he has to retreat, maybe he just thought this would take too much time. And instead, um, instead of snacking on this pawn here, he just pushed uh, his own pawn, kicking back white's knight. The white knight will retreat to either the central square. I know Yovanka loves her knights in the center. Or it might retreat, um, for example, here to try and get rid of black's mm -hmm. uh, only active piece. Maybe actually I like this one even more just to get rid of Black's best piece right now. Yeah, uh, certainly I agree with that one because it also fits in conveniently with my philosophy that when a piece is on your side of the board, you shouldn't let it just camp there happily. You need to dislodge it. You can exchange it off or just kick it back with a pawn. So I'm really liking that David's suggestion of just retreating the knight, challenging the only piece that has advanced, even made a move, really. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I'm really liking White's position. I'm a big fan of pawns, and uh, I like what White's done. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I like what White's done, especially... <laughs> I got confused with the kings there. Um, but <laughs> that White King, no longer social distancing if the knight comes back to keep it company. Mm. Um, yeah. It's, almost like, it's almost like a beautiful uh, story. So once upon a time, in the year of a pandemic, there was a white king who lost his queen and was very depressed, social distancing. But suddenly there was a vaccine. And the king, as you said, David, could join the party. And in that party, he's going to look for a new queen. Exactly. New year, new life, new queen. Yes. Yeah. It's a <laughs> good year. Like. Yeah. 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 Um, Sounded like a Disney movie, though. Yeah, Once right. upon a time, there was a king <laughs> that had something, and then and 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 uh, because of that, and because of that, that's how it works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Until right. Finally, mm. <laughs> but who's the evil one in this one then? Ooh, I think it's that evil black knight in the yeah. middle, and that's why white knight should ride to the defense of white's king, what ride to support his own king, mm -hmm. and get rid of that evil enemy black knight in the middle of the board. Yes, um, that octo knight. But I, I just, look, sorry, I'm just still obsessed with your, the king gets a second wife. I have never, ever thought about that, ever. And now we have until finally yeah. the well, king. <laughs> this, is why, this is why it gets interesting when non-chess players come, come to the board and try to, try to understand what's happening. But we've heard it before with many of Yvanka's uh, stories. She loves yeah. to make these analogies. Yeah. And that's, that's a good way to help your memory when you're trying to mm. memorize ideas or trying to recognize these patterns all the time. It's good to have that trigger word or that kind of phrase yeah. or idea. To... I actually have a notebook when I'm trying to memorize all these opening lines that I have because sometimes you're looking at like reams and reams of analysis and there's just no way for my brain to kind of process it all. Mm. So what I do is I go through every single line and I kind of have a trigger word. So if I have a lot of conflict or tension in the center, I'm like, horns. The ah. horns are locking. And then I remember that's the kind of... That's the kind of way I should go for. I, I either make a mono of pawn chain and then just play normally, but just have that pawn chain. Yeah. And I do this with every single line that I play. And I try to make make kind of like mental signposts. Wow. Where like, okay, I can guide myself. And uh, okay, David has called it because the knight has retreated and is now challenging its counterpart in the center. Yes, and that uh, black knight now is under attack. Will we see the knights being traded off? Black can still get greedy. If he wants, Timur Rajabov, he can snap off a pawn. Um, Levon Aronia, remember, did leave a pawn unguarded on that last move. So Black's Knight can drop down, win a pawn. I'd be very tempted to do that. I think that Black's position, I mean, he needs something to at least cling on to. And he's suffering at the moment, those black pieces in the back rank. He might as well grab a pawn and hope that he can survive long enough for that pawn to make a difference later on. Um, if the Knights get traded, 
Um, I just feel that White's King will step forward even more. It will be improved. White's pawns, it's going to be hard to stop those guys later on. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised though. The one thing that surprises me is Levon spending a few minutes on that last decision. Four minutes down on the clock now. Um, for me, it was very natural. Just you need, use logic. You get rid of your opponent's best piece. But it did cost him time and that might come back to bite him. Mm -hmm. Didn't we see Levon play quite good? Because he did get uh, uh, quite low on the clock in many of his games in the semi-final. Still playing very good then. Maybe it, is he sort of trying to wake himself up and give himself, um, well, some pressure? Well, these guys are the best players in the world. We can't forget that. So mm. they are used to playing under pressure. They also are used to playing amazing moves with the clock mm. when the clock is ticking down. Mm. I haven't seen anyone reach Rajabov's level of yeah, composure ever in my life. But, you know, hey, that doesn't mean anything. He's absolutely fantastic. And uh, what we're seeing, there's been some moves on the board. And what we're seeing is that basically David has called it again. If Black is going to suffer, you might as well suffer with an extra pawn in the bank. Yeah, so Black's Knight did go on a bit of a trip there. It did snap off a pawn. All of White's pieces, though, meanwhile, are looking beautiful. The two White Knights nicely headed towards the centre. The White Bishop um, also looking great. There's White Rooks on uh, one of them on an open line, one of them on a semi-open line. Um, so White has pretty much the perfect position, but Black is a pawn ahead. So it's just about whether White can break through now. Um, what <laughs> made me chuckle a moment ago was the fact that Rajabov, he pretty much had his eyes closed and then the move happened on the board. So he's like, <laughs> <laughs> is, he is, using, is he using his Jedi mind tricks just to move the pieces without even having to <laughs> wow. uh, use the mouse? Um, <laughs> it would be, it so would be quite cool like if there was a camera and it panned out and he was like levitating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Rajabov. Because you had it's possible to make pre moves, you said. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you don't think that's what happened? I think it's maybe too dangerous to make mm. pre moves in this type of position where there's lots of pieces on the board. So pre moves, um, so essentially you make the move in advance so that no matter what your opponent plays, that move will be played instantly. That will be an instant reply. And there are such a type of things as safe pre moves. It's when you automatically recapture on a square where a piece stands. So it only makes that move if your opponent mm. follows the plan. But sometimes the opponent won't follow, won't follow the plan, so you may have to make sure that your move is safe against any possible reply. And I think in these long games, you gain 10 seconds after every move. There's no reason to save one second or two seconds by making those pre-moves. It only really matters in the Blitz and the Armageddon tiebreak games. Um, yeah, in the Armageddon, it's, uh, the last 10 seconds, this is what you're relying on. Mm. You're just making some random move that is pre-moved and you're just hoping that... Uh, your opponent has played a move that's going to fit in with your pre-move. But uh, yeah, it's very risky. You, you can't, you have to be clever with your pre-moves. You can't just... Uh... <laughs> uh, and that's why we say that the players, they actually practice with the mouse um, before tournaments. They practice by playing hundreds of online games just to make sure they've got the speed and that they know when or when not to make these pre-moves. Mm. Um, because that's where online chess and over-the-board chess, they do, they do differ. And these two guys... Maybe not the most experienced at online chess, but they are showing that they are getting used to it and mm -hmm. uh, playing some fantastic moves right now. And meanwhile, the Black Knight has to dance all the way back, um, continuing the retreat. But that knight has grabbed a pawn. All yes. of White's pieces looking great. All of Black's pieces at the back rank there. But how to break through? What yeah. is next for White? How to continue improving? Well, they're kind of they're, there's two automatic plans for improvement. First of all, there's like Kaya's plan where you just go forward with your pawns. <laughs> And uh, the second one that is appealing to me is to go forward with a knight. Do you know? You know how much I love my octo knight. So I would. My preference is just to dance in with that knight and uh, start pressuring black. Maybe potentially attacking mm -hmm. this pawn. Um, at the moment, it's only attacked once this pawn, um, but you can see this bishop eyeing up this guy as well. So if white's pawn later steps forward. The bishop will be unleashed and the knight will also um, create some havoc. I like that idea. This knight, very hard to get rid of. Maybe black will just try to trade it off. <laughs> just say, OK, your knight was too strong in the middle. I'll try and get rid of your strongest piece. Um, a bit of psychology here. Does Levon Aronian immediately go for this move? Does he save it for a, a bit later on? They do say the threat is stronger than the execution. Maybe later on this idea is stronger. But I agree, Yovanka. I like this move. Uh, also, you kind of clear... Uh, a bit of space for this rook potentially to attack the uh, black king. Maybe later on, if you can break down this pawn, maybe with a pawn advance, um, if you can start opening things up on this line of the white rook. Um, okay, he does it. Oh, he he does follows it. your advice, Ivanka. Um, 
White's pieces are looking so strong and so impressive right now. Mm -hmm. Is it worth a pawn? Um, hard to say right now. It's very hard to say because I really loved your response to my move, which was just to go, cool, you got a cool night there, but I'm just going to exchange it off. And, uh, and s s the thing is, when you sacrifice material, you you kind of want to keep your pieces on the board because otherwise you're in danger of losing the momentum and losing the initiative because the more pieces that get traded, the much more it's, it's a lot more difficult unless you have something concrete to take advantage. So I really liked your idea because then I, was be, I would be forced to retreat my knight and then say, kind of say to you, it's kind of a bit of a weird game where I say, okay, your knight's now a bit silly. Well, okay, we're going to see it on the board because Rajabov has played your move, David, exchanging. Yeah, and I think um, maybe there are other moves, but that is just the most natural, trying to get rid of White's strong knight in the centre there, trying to trade down because black is a pawn up. Um, but yeah, um, Rajabov, the main thing that's impressing me right now is the fact that he's playing so quickly. Um, maybe there wasn't, you know, another obvious move, and that's why he just decided, this is good enough. I'll play it. Um, I did notice the computer did like Black's position there. Because Black had the extra pawn, it gave a small advantage. And now, after that knight move, it's gone back to the middle. So maybe it wasn't the best move, but the fact that uh, Rajabov played it quickly and confidently, that will put pressure back on Aronian. Um, the onus is back on him now to maintain the active pieces that he has and to justify his pawn sacrifice. The clock times are not looking good for Aronian, meanwhile. Oh, no, yeah. yeah, just look at it. Three and a half minutes and ticking down. Seven against... minutes behind Timur Ajabov. That seems very uh, dramatic, actually. And the bar is saying uh, equal. OK, let's take this move Ooh, first. Yeah, so White's knight did not allow that trade. The White knight stepping back. But if you go back, it's not normally a, uh, a great sign. And um, I think that's a natural move for a human. You definitely don't want to allow those trades. You don't want to make your opponent's life easier. So I think it's a very sensible move. Computer might disagree, but okay, I think the computer um, judgment isn't so relevant right now with so many pieces on the board when it's so tense. So, okay, so with the board uh, and the clocks, <laughs> what side would you pick here to be? <laughs> Ladies first, Ivanka. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a, a hard tough call. one. It's a tough one because there's always that psychological pressure that you've given up porn, mm. and it all depends on how Rajabov consolidates his position. Because if he finds a natural plan of just development, then suddenly the real onus is on white. What are you going to do? And are you comfortable with doing nothing? Because it could be the situation that uh, the best move is actually to advance a little bit on the, with the pawns on the, on the right and then just wait and let black untangle themselves. But this art of doing nothing that's actually very difficult. Mm. Most people have to feel some pressure. They're like, I have to do something. Let's go forward. And uh, they're unable to sit there and wait. I, I would prefer, okay, I'm going to say, but in a normal kind of game, if the clock times are level, I'm choosing white. Mm. But uh, because of the clock situation, I think it's going to be slightly easier to play black. Mm. How about you, David? Uh, and um, I do think white's position is fun to play, but... I would definitely choose black, and that is purely because two reasons. I have a pawn extra, and I have the two bishops, and okay, also the fact that I've played similar positions before. <laughs> I have some experience there. But um, those black two bishops, they might not look like much, but if things open up, if they get a bit more lively than the black bishops, they might start to uh, dictate the play a bit later on. And meanwhile, Timur Rajabov, he's brought his knight back to the same square. So actually, he was offering a repetition of moves. If Levon Aronian... Whoa, his... what's happening? happening? That not happened. <laughs> if Levon Aronian had put his knight back in the middle of the board, we would have seen a second time that position has been repeated. But Levon immediately showing he's going for the win, pushing one of the pawns forward. Um, maybe that was just too soon. That was very committal. I'm surprised he pushed that pawn. I would have been trying to push the other pawn, maybe. Um, if we bring up the analysis board, we can see white pushing a pawn on the dark square. Normally, you want to put your pawns on this opposite colour to your bishop. That is why um, I think maybe the computer doesn't like the decision for white. Um, it's just very easy to block that side of the board now for Timur Rajabov. Um, yeah, I think maybe Levon Aronian, just by trying to play for the win, not going for the repetition, he might have rushed a bit too much. Yovanka called it. She said, sometimes you just have to sit and just yeah. do nothing and just slowly improve or wait for your opponent to kind of go wrong. Mm -hmm. But Levon Aroni, he's trying to force the issue and that's because he's panicking. He's got less time on the clock.
Yeah, actually, I've never seen this porn advance um, in, in, in all my experience of watching the <laughs> Berlin Endgames. It's always the king's pawn that has advanced forward and, and, and is the thorn in the side. Um, this is most unusual. It kind of goes against chess logic because normally it's like the free pawn, the pass pawn, the one that doesn't have a rival that you push. So very intriguing. Um, I'm... I don't like what, uh, I really don't like what uh, Aronian has done. But okay, it might be understandable if he's thinking, okay, I'm going to get a grip. I'm going to secure some post for the night. I'm trying to get into his mind and think about what he's trying to do. So, interesting. Yeah, and um, maybe the computer doesn't like it, but Levon Aronian, he's actually playing to dominate one of Black's bishops. One of Black's bishops cannot move anymore. Okay, he moved... Uh, Timur Rajabov there uses the light squared bishop just stepping forward um, a very sensible move improving that piece but note black's dark squared bishop the bishop still on its start square that bishop cannot move right now it's dominated by the white pawns so that is what Levon Aronian is playing for long term but will that be enough of a factor to justify the fact he's a pawn down I'm not so sure um, these top players they're so good at knowing when to play for these kind of long-term, mm -hmm. um, just long-term control though. So I, I know Levon Aronian, he will have reasons behind that last move, but it's not normally what you go for. It's very unconventional. Uh, <laughs> it's creative, but will it backfire? But uh, again, once again, I'm going to draw attention to Rajabov's composure. He looks like nothing will face him. And uh, in fact, Sasha Moore points out, is Tamor Rajabov using the force? And will it work? Yes, indeed. Will it work? He just looks so cool. You know, like, like this is just a normal move. We found it surprising. We reacted. But to him, no. Yeah, um, he didn't react at all. At all. And he played, a re uh, he replied very, very quickly. He's five minutes up on the clock. Levon Aronian, after playing that controversial move, he's gone for another controversial decision. Whoa, and um, look at Levon there. He's super, like, well, you can happy see the, with his move. Yeah, or like no, not happy, maybe. Are there. You know, you can just see it. He is there. He just, it just has to explode out of him. Mm. You can feel he's, the t he's tense. He's also excited because that kind of move is like a rush of blood to the head. <laughs> And you start thinking, yeah, I'm going to win. But, uh, but is it a blunder, though? I think he's overestimated his chances. He likes the white position, and that's because uh, Levon, as Yovanka, he's, he's Mr. Center. All of white's pieces are ready for action. That's why he's trying to explode things open with the pawns. If we bring up the analysis board, we can see what he is trying to do, Levon Aronin. With this last pawn push, pushing the pawn forward, he's trying to open up a line for his rook. I mentioned it earlier, this white rook is actually standing opposite the black king. So he's trying to get rid of all the obstacles in the way, everything in the path of this rook. That's why he pushed this pawn. But I don't think there's actually a threat, really. This pawn is very well solidified. It is protected twice by Black's pieces. Um, it just feels like he's going for things. He's sensing that this is the moment, but he's rushing. Yes. But he has he has a one big point. And OK, well, uh, Rajabov has right. played a different move. But his point was, and this is why I get excited about it, because Black actually couldn't capture the pawn. It was way too dangerous. In fact, if Black had captured the pawn, well, Levon Aronia would be winning because then you can just go pawn takes pawn on the right side. And uh, once you've decoyed the bishop, you have pawn takes pawn and suddenly everything has aligned beautifully. Yeah, David is pointing it out. There is going to be all sorts of horrible things happening to the left side of the board. So that is why he got so excited. And uh, this, the problem is, is that once you see one forcing move, you get so carried away with the emotions behind it, you forget that, like David said, and as Rajabov has proved, actually, you don't need to capture that pawn. Yeah, and Rajabov just very calm playing on the other side now. Uh, he pushed a pawn, a black pawn on that right flank, kicking back White's bishop. White's bishop was forced to retreat. Now, though, the problem for Aronian is what is next? He's four minutes down on the clock. He's got a pawn less. Um, it does look like Timur Rajabov defending very solidly solidly right now. Um, I don't really see any problem for Black other than maybe the fact that his dark squared bishop is trapped and that rook, the black rook on the top right-hand corner, it is also a bit block, a bit boxed in, a bit trapped. Um, it just feels like Levon Aronian. I've seen him play this type of position from the black side. Maybe he's just not realising that from the white side, going this direct, it rarely works. Even if all your place, uh, pieces are placed perfectly, black is just so solid. This is why they call it the Berlin, Berlin Wall. Black 
He's got everything protected. Everything in Black's camp, pretty much, apart from the Rooks, are protected, are solidified right now. Um, that last move by Timur Rajabov, blockading White's central pawn. And now that White's central pawn is blockaded, and White's two central pawns, they're on dark squares. They just block in the white pieces. White's bishop on the dark square is blockaded. Oh, well, it's just blocked in. It's mm -hmm. hemmed in. Um, I, I'm struggling to see a follow-up for Levon Aronian. And there's no natural, easy follow-up. And he's got two minutes left. That's why it might be a struggle, these next few moves for him. Yeah, he has to think about manoeuvring his knights. But uh, I look at, the, <laughs> look at that black square bishop that has all controls all the light squares. You know, it's absolutely dominating. And it's, it's a very strange position because I remember one grandmaster saying to me, bishops are a bit of funny creatures because you can actually leave them in their starting squares and they're still pretty powerful. And uh, if you look at the black bishop that is still in its starting squares, it's doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it at all. The only thing is that it's kind of jamming in the black rook in the corner. But hey, as long as that bishop is on the board, it's holding the position together. And it can let its uh, sibling, that it light squared sibling, just uh, work, start working some magic. Yeah, and black does have the bishop pair, remember. So black's light squared bishop, the bishop that just moved, it has no rival. Um, white will struggle for control over those light squares. Um, that is why Levon Aronian putting his pawns on dark squares just doesn't really feel consistent, doesn't feel logical. He's just lost all control over those light squares. Black's light squared bishop, completely dominant. Um, Yvanka, you called it, like these bishops, they're happy on their start squares sometimes. Um, Peter Lecco, uh, another commentator for Chess24, he joked with me that I love to retreat my bishops to their start <laughs> squares halfway through the game for no reason. But then it always seems to pan out, it always seems to work in the end because they are long-range pieces. But look at the clock, Levon has been thinking for over two minutes and he is down under 30 seconds now. Timur still got... Six More minutes, than six minutes. Is, uh, six and a half minutes. Oof. Yeah, it is a serious 20 seconds now. Clock. Yeah, and it's ticking down. And it's a, a serious, serious time deficit because the position is far from simple. And uh, Levon using the time to advance his rook. Yeah, to me, though, that shows that he suddenly realised there's no plan. Actually, he shook his head very slightly there. He realises white. it looks like White's improving a rook. White's all of White's pieces there on the third line, uh, the Rook, the two Knights and the Bishop all lined up together. But actually, they're not attacking anything. They're not hitting anything. And Black, meanwhile, has lots of useful moves. Black improves his king there, um, just clearing his king off the back line. Uh, slowly, Black will start to advance forward. Remember, he's still a pawn up. Um, Levon Aronian just lacking a plan and under 10 seconds. Seven, six, five. He has to make a move. Four, three. Okay, okay. And uh, he's just doubled the Rooks. Oh, it's so tense. Yeah, those two white rooks lining up against each other right now. But they're just <laughs> they're just staring at Black's strongest point in the whole <laughs> position. That black pawn is defended by another pawn. It's defended by the black bishop, the black dark squared bishop. And um, But there's, again, just applying the principle of consequences, actually, that rook moved from an open line. And since those two beautiful rooks are actually doing nothing because they're just looking at a pawn which is protected by a bishop, why not just take that line, put that rook on the line that has now been vacated and get motoring. Yeah, so the move we're looking for now, the very strong move for uh, Timur Rajabov is to bring his rook to the middle and look at Black's rook suddenly. It's the dominant rook controlling so many squares. What are these white rooks doing? They're just staring against a pawn. And white, these white rooks, um, they're not going to be able to break through. Meanwhile, Black's pieces are coming to life. This rook is fantastic. Now, this bishop, though, this is the MVP, this bishop. He found it. Okay, he found it. And white immediately replying by putting a knight into this square. But the knight's not actually attacking anything. It's nice, beautiful. It's anchored. He's hoping that black trades off the light square bishop for this knight. But black will never even dream of doing that. Um, this knight, it's nice and pretty, but actually it's not really achieving much. It's time for black to start maybe putting pressure on this side of the board. I would start pushing my pawns on this flank now. Um, if black can get this bishop into the game, black will win. With five minutes more on the clock, Timur Ojabo is in a great situation here. Ooh, how do you think Levon Aronian is feeling now, Ivanka? He must be aware that it's uh, getting difficult for him. Yeah, he. W I think he will go into uh, a mode that I call bluffer mode, oh. which is basically where you know you don't have enough time on the clock. You just have to get active and uh, see what happens. And you just have to mentally prepare yourself that you're going to go look out for some chances because... I think he realizes that uh, basically he is playing against a wall. You know, he's just no inroad into the position whatsoever. So when that happens, just throw your pieces forward and uh, see what happens.
Yeah, and he really has, has come up against the Berlin Wall here. And the Berlin Wall used by so many players with black just to frustrate their opponents. Um, it was first introduced, well, introduced at the very, very top level at these World Championship matches by Vladimir Kramnik to frustrate Gary Kasparov, one of the greatest players of all time. White never broke through in those matches, mm -hmm. never managed to win. And here again, it's likely to happen. White pushing forward with some pawns on the left side there. Black's knight. Retreating to a bit of a bad square. Black's Knight not on a great circuit right now, but more importantly for Black, okay, he's trying to break things open. Black has a four versus two pawn advantage on the left half of the board. So Black will try and, try yeah. and utilize those pawns to win the game. And he has a plan. He has a plan now. You know, he's thinking, okay, well, the knight is bad. I have a, I have a hook that I can start attacking white's pawns with. And uh, it's just a nice, nice, easy plan of improvement. So Lavon now has 20 seconds left and ticking down and no easy plan, actually. No easy way to go forward. Yeah, Lavon, Aronian, look at those two white rooks. They're just staring at a pawn that's so well protected. White's two rooks have placed themselves on the wrong line. Five um, seconds, four seconds. He has to make a move. Okay, so that's why he's just moved the king. Just anything happens. When you, <laughs> when you, we've kind of spoken about it. When you get to less than 10 seconds on the clock, you tend to panic and you're just there with your mouse just going, make a move, make make something. And there's no kind of thought process whatsoever. It's just random hand moves. Yeah, and Levon Aronian, he's been so calm, looking so kind of peaceful this whole tournament. But there he shook his head quite violently. He knows this has gone wrong. And it's all his own fault. I mean, the last few moves have been like a cold shower for him. Um, he was the one trying to win. He had the opportunity to repeat the position, um, to be very safe in this game. But he gave up a pawn, he pressed for the win, he got his own strength, his own white pawns all blockaded now. Um, it's just all gone wrong for Levon Aronian and um, Timur Rajabov. Meanwhile, that black knight on a beautiful square. Uh, we, we will quite likely see a trade of rooks now in the middle. Um, Levon Aronian, <laughs> he's a pawn down, but he realises there's nothing better to do but trade. Uh, it does look like it's getting desperate. Uh, Rajabov so focused, he will not let this one slip. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, he just has to control his excitement and carry on with the philosophy of uh, giving Levon Aronian some choices. Uh, just give him the opportunity to go wrong. Don't necessarily need to do anything. I mean, you, you were the one that taught me that, David. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best things is just not to force the issue, just simply, OK, show your idea, show your strength. And if your opponent has only 20 seconds on the clock, if they've got a bad position, often, if you just keep everything solid, they'll beat themselves. They'll just lose patience. They'll lose kind of just lose control. And then you pounce at the right moment. And um, Rajabov, it does look like he thinks this is the moment to pounce, judging, just judging by the way he was thinking there. Um, he knows he can go for a trade of rooks with black on that open line in the middle. Um, he has options as well. He could keep the rooks on the board. He could block that line up. Um, he just needs to maintain a time advantage. He knows he's got the time. Uh, he knows he's got the advantage on the clock. He's uh, on the board, sorry. And um, yeah, he has frozen slightly here, mm. just taking a pause. But maybe he's working out the most direct way to try and win this mm -hmm. game. All right, well, exciting stuff also in uh, the match for the third place where Daniel Dubo started the day with two wins, but Maxim Vajelagrau has made a very impressive comeback and he's won the now the two last games. So they are tied before the final day uh, in the match for the third place. All right. And we do have a new uh, move in the final. Yes, and we did see a set of rooks leave the board. So rooks have been traded and black planting a knight in the middle there. Um, just such sensible, logical stuff. Knights are fantastic pieces in the middle of the board. Um, black's knight now attacks the white rook as well. Where will white's rook run to? There aren't that many safe squares, actually. Levon Aronian went down to three seconds when he played that move. The white rook, <laughs> that is depressing. <laughs> That's the move that he would not have enjoyed playing. No, white's I mean, it's, now... it's on the same diagonal as the black bishop. So I would be looking at pushing a pawn. Yeah, um, logical. But white's rook forced itself back to the corner, blocked off by its own pawn. And um, if we bring up the analysis board briefly, we can just see this bishop, um, black's problem piece, is this bishop. This bishop cannot move. So why not push a pawn forward? Suddenly unleashing this bishop. He's done it. This bishop, it, well, I mentioned it earlier, as soon as it joins the game, black will win. So white tries to block this diagonal, uh, block the bishop off. Uh, the white knight also giving check. I expect to see that piece just captured, just remove that piece from the board. Uh, black edging closer to victory. Now he doesn't have to worry about this piece uh, being dominated anymore.
Okay. Wow. Now Timur Ajabo is thinking he's still far up on the clock um, <laughs> with his uh, last move, the rook move. Yes. So we did see the dark square bishop, black dark square bishop, which was <laughs> just completely, completely just chained up for the whole game. It's finally been traded off. So black has got rid of his problem child, his problem piece, and the black rook activating itself as well. The first time that rook has moved. Um, Rajabov doing the right thing. He's a pawn up. He's using all of his pieces together. All of Black's pieces are pretty much centralized now. Um, Rajabov also centralizing the white bishop. Um, Timur Rajabov, he just needs to find a winning plan. I think it will come down to the fact that Black has a three versus one advantage on that left side. Um, that being said, there are opposite colored bishops on the board. White has a dark square bishop. Black has a light square bishop. So if the knights disappear, if the rooks disappear, maybe that's white's best chance of saving the game. That's something that Lavon has to hope for. Yeah, I agree with you, David. He has to find a way. It's kind of, I have to say, it is a little slightly tricky kind of position because there is, there is no kind of clear plan because he's, there is a plan of pushing the far advanced pawn, but Rajabov hasn't prepared for that. He's put his rook against the white pawn in the center and if he advances the king, then he's going to give uh, Levon a free move, such as a check, a knight check, and that, that might be a little bit unpleasant. So I think this is why we see uh, Rajabov just uh, make a move, just move the knight, and again, ask Levon Aronian, hey, what are you going to play next? What are you going to do with 15 seconds left on the clock? And um, I, I know the computer there, we do see the evaluation bar. It does say plus four for black. Um, that is a huge advantage. But... It isn't so easy on the board. Um, Black still needs to come up with a winning plan. Until you find that plan, it's not clear whether you will be able to break through or not. So mm -hmm. I disagree with the computer that the advantage is that big, but it is with best play. Mm -hmm. um, if both players had one hour on the clock, then Rajabov, he would win this game. It's not easy to come up with a plan, though, with one minute left. And Black's plan, Timur Rajabov's plan, is to plant a knight in the middle of the board there deep in the white camp. That's the second time he's done this. He did this <laughs> two games ago as well. He put his knight... Deep in the enemy, uh, deep in Aronian's position. And Levon has only five seconds. Okay, he just made it with six seconds left. So he has well also recentered his knight to attack the white, the black bishop. And uh, that is why Rajabov retreated the bishop. He's like, I'm not going to give black any easy moves whatsoever. What? And uh, well, Aronian is just making moves. Yeah, so the white king does step forward, um, slightly improving the king. But um, I think it's just time for Black to start improving his rook now. The Black rook can enter an open line. Um, okay, there uh, we you, see it. Yeah, you see it there. And uh, again, Aronian playing quickly, trying to recover. Shaking his head there a little bit, though. He's not happy. Uh, he, I mean, normally he tries to keep that poker face. I've played him in losing, when he's losing, and he tries to keep that poker face, but he knows now mm -hmm. things are going against him. Black's last move, using his Black knight and the Black bishop to gang up on White's corner pawn there. White pawn on the left, it is doomed. It's attacked twice, it's only defended once. That pawn is soon going to disappear. Also, Black's Knight is potentially threatening some forks, some knight jumps. Aronian down to one second. Oh, oh. oh. yes. <laughs> and shaking his head again. He is not happy, Levon Aronian. It is now Timur Rajabo in the move. Yeah, and he's yeah. leaned back. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a sad sight to see that Levon, he's got nothing better to do than trade a set of rooks when actually we've mentioned it before you don't want to trade when you're down on pawns necessarily and um yeah i think Rajabov he'll welcome that rook trade um he'll just go after white's pawn at the corner there um, yeah you can see him doing it there he yeah. has played a check the king has retreated and i think i'm gonna see like knight takes bishop and then i think i think uh Rajabov will just get greedy three pawns on the left that is and that is seriously good yeah, and the knight does capture the bishop. Uh, he's just simplifying his own task. He's just eliminating all risk if he can. Oh, he's mean. This Ruthless. is mean. <laughs> so efficient. So instead of grabbing the pawn, which he's like, I can take that any time. He's like, well, you know what? There's some annoying pawns on the right-hand side and the centre. Let's just get rid of those ones first and... Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is a double attack, and chess is all about double attacks. Black's rook eyeing up two of white's pawns there. Mm -hmm. Aronian, he's got nothing else to do other than trying to attack one of the black pawns. But remember, black's already one pawn up. All of white's remaining pawns are weak. Another one drops. Um, black's temporarily two pawns up. Um, he will be two pawns up in this game. And notice, 
Um, now all of white's pawns are on light squares, on white squares, so there'll be mm. easy meat, easy pickings for that uh, for the black bishop. Um, Black's bishop will win all those remaining pawns. Um, Levon Aroni, he's just making moves because he doesn't want to resign yet. And okay, nobody's ever won a game by resigning, but um, he knows that there's nothing left to do in this game. You can just see it on his body language. Yes, Levon Aroni is giving up very soon. Yeah, probably. and he has resigned. There we have so, it. So uh, Rajabov has won the first match. Wow. Okay, such a tense day. We had three draws. And then coming to the final game of the first final match, Timur Ajabo is the winner of that. And that means he is the winner of day one in the finals. And they are keeping calm. We can see it on the webcams now, both players. But what's going on inside the, the heads now, Yvanka? Well, I think uh, Levon will be so disappointed. You know, I think he'll check through the lines and just see where he went wrong. But he, yeah, he will be feeling frustrated because... He was so close to a draw and ultimately it was his eagerness to push forward really hard for the win that kind of backfired on him. And uh, after three games with those draws, David, uh, what happened in this final game where sort of uh, a lot of uh, the tension was sort of released and we did for a long time see uh, so much drama on the board? Yeah, a lot of drama. We saw Levon Aronian pushing, throwing everything at the win there. Actually, he could have even repeated the position at one point, but he mm. played for the win and we liked his position. We don't blame him for playing for that win, mm. but it was just this one decision he, uh, that he made that cost him long term. Um, we love White's pawns here. White's pawns, especially on this right side. Look at those. Four pawns, so strong, gaining so much space and backed up nicely. Uh, that's an important factor, backed up nicely by White's pieces. But he maybe pushed the wrong pawn. He put his pawn on a dark square. Um, these two pawns now actually block in White's bishop, also on dark squares. And we saw a few moves later that um, he, Timur Rajabov, as Black, was able to blockade these pawns. As soon as Black got his bishop to this blockading square, suddenly... What is this white bishop doing? It's just blocked in completely by his own pawns. The pawns can never move anymore. Remember, black was also a pawn up at this stage. And um, once he made this blockade, Timur Rajabov, he never let, control, let go of control. He just traded off the right pieces. He eventually picked off white's weak pawns. And from there, it was all downhill for Aronian. Wow. Um, this was it. The, the, the game, I mean, after those three draws, Yovanka, all like the tension was just released in, in this last game. Do you think this was uh, Timur's plan the whole day to keep it calm and then just bring everything to that last game? Well, he, he did actually mention that he loves to counterattack. So uh, you definitely see that this was his strategy, that he was going to let Levon Aronian just be a little bit eager and then if the chance presented itself, then go for the win. So definitely part of his game plan. And here he is, Timur Rojavo. He is the winner of day one final against Levon Aronian. and he is joining us right now. Wow, Timur, congratulations. And what about that last game? How happy are you now? Yeah, I mean, I'm not celebrating in advance because I know what it is. Uh, I've played against the Wesley as well, the the other event, and uh, I was quite happy about the first day. And then the second, uh, everything was just really different. Um, certainly, uh, well, it was tough. I think in one game I was just completely lost or something, like really close to it at least. Uh, in the game in the Sicilian, I think I was really having problems there. I mean, this knight b3 also at some point, I think when I played rook c8, he had this knight a7 at b5 stuff. Uh, seemed really bad for me because I've lost uh, some pawns as well and, you know, the position was, uh, like, really awful. I mean, it's, it's not what you want to get out of the Sicilian, certainly, no counterplay more or less, and just uh, why this kind of pressing on c5 and stuff, you don't have to make too much counterplay and stuff. So I played for this f4, trying to create some kind of counter chances, otherwise I would be uh, positionally smashed there, I feel. So, uh, yeah, in the last one, actually, uh, I played this knight d7, knight c6, but he didn't want to repeat. Um, yeah, and then he went for f6, which was very surprising because f6, uh, I don't know. I mean, there was no threat, actually. I don't know what he missed exactly there. But, um, yeah, I mean, after that, I didn't see any, uh, any chances for him at all. I mean, there's just no play and uh, there's no play for the pawn already. Mm. So I'm having a pawn up there, but... Uh, yeah, it, it's a tough, it's a tough match. I don't know, it's a tough match already. Uh, I mean, all all of these games are very tense, and certainly, um, I almost misplayed it as white, and in in uh, game number what three, I think was it. Yeah, already started to go a bit astray. I felt, and uh, also tiredness is 
is telling, of course. But uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, anyway, uh, I have my strategy, which uh, still works. But uh, let's see how it goes till the mm. till the very end. And and Timor, we saw. I mean, you mentioned it there. Your white games. We saw in both your games with white these very long, well prepared variations. And we were wondering, do you guys? I mean, do you have a coaching team who are helping you during this tournament? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about Livon, but on my side, uh, I mean, I'm working on my own. Certainly I get some advices and stuff, but, uh, I mostly work nowadays, uh, on my own or with Chuchilov, Vladimir Chuchilov from time to time, depends. But certainly here you don't have that much time. You know, you have to also, uh, come back to the normal shape more or less after, uh, not only after New Year's Eve celebrations, but also after some, <laughs> some other matches. Yeah, so you have to be in shape. And it's really hard because it's like going every day without any break. And uh, for, uh, you know, for old people like me, it's not so easy to keep this tension going. <laughs> yeah, And also the opponents are very strong. So it's like uh, every day you are, I mean, you don't have any any kind of, you know, um, games that you come and you play just uh, calmly with, with, with some, some uh, much lower rated opponent. So every day is like uh, Super Grandmaster that uh, wants to beat you and uh, yeah you have to be uh, on top of your game to to uh, keep on competing mm. and uh, how do you prepare for these um, games uh do you want the entire process like or well like, you know just talk us through roughly what you do in the mornings yeah, before each game i mean turning on turning on my chess base from time to time and uh, also looking at some games of uh, certainly levon and uh, uh, the openings that i'm thinking that he's going to play but um I didn't expect E4 match today, but it was kind of surprising for me. I thought he will go for more close stuff. And um, yeah, that's the way, well, actually, looking at the openings, ideas, checking uh, the lines once again, which I'm going to play. Or um, beside, yeah, as well, also, I think that uh, trying to find ideas to press somehow. So I twice went on this line uh, that you saw today, but uh, first time, I think I was able to slightly press there. But he um, he really played some, some bad move there, I think. Some, some queen e5, queen c5 stuff. He had a good position there. But uh, mostly this kind of preparation, yeah, openings and uh, trying to relax. Because otherwise, uh, I mean, there will certainly be a lack of energy and you will never guess the, the, the openings, uh, like, you know, precisely. Mm. So mm -hmm. your preparation is kind of, uh, you know, estimating chances and then checking some lines or repeating them and so on. Mm. Yeah. And, and finally, Timur, I mean, we love uh, watching the webcams and you keep leaning backwards and closing your eyes. What is the tactics behind that? Well, I mean, that's a usual thing for the chess, for many chess players, at least. I mean, for me, for, uh, let's say, Peter Swidler as well and so on. We don't like to see the board while calculating because you, you have this kind of, um, uh, you see the board. And then some of the pieces are on their initial squares. And in your mind, they're on different squares. So sometimes you just uh, miscalculate things because of that. And uh, yeah, of course, certainly we, we can do both. But uh, from time to time, we're just kind of, uh, I mean, Swidler does his stuff with, with you know, turns the head all the time and all that. All that. I also do this during the OTB tournaments. But uh, yeah, I, disclosing the eyes usually is like a calculation stuff or trying to calm down with the uh, breathing techniques. Mm. Mm. All right, well, teamwork. Final day of finals tomorrow. We're wishing you all the best in that one. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Timur Rajavov, he is able to win that last game in the first final match. We are now joined by Levon Aronian, uh, who unfortunately lost that last game. Um, yeah, Levon, what's your reaction after that game? Uh, well, of course, I'm upset. Uh, I remembered that this line is very dangerous for Black to play, but I didn't remember why or how I'm supposed to uh, continue. So it's uh, it's a mistake on my part in my preparation. Mm. And there was so much tension in all the games today, the three first one ending with draws. And is it sort of the tension of it uh, being the final? Are you sort of feeling that? Uh, uh, yeah, of course. You uh, you try to uh, play um, your best, so you know that you're facing uh, a strong opponent. So uh, there's always tension in a game of chess when strong players uh, play against each other. So. Mm. And this time, of course, it's more because uh, it's it's a major tournament, so. All of us want to win. Mm.
And still, obviously, one more day to play. Uh, we have seen you make compacts before, Levon. What will be your tactics and what is it all about tomorrow? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to um, play better, I guess. You know, not to miss chances like I did today. Mm. So that's the plan. That is the plan. Okay, Levon, we're wishing you all the best tomorrow. We're looking forward to that final day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. All right, two very uh, different, um, well, moods there, obviously. I have to say, Levon seems very, very disappointed, David. Yeah, he did seem deflated for sure, and that's natural in these big moments if you do have setbacks. You do need a bit of time to recover sometimes, but um, he'll try and get an early night. He'll try mm. and, we mentioned, he does hike in the mountains. He does sometimes yeah. go for a run. He'll find a way to switch off and come back and just take tomorrow each game as it comes. Yeah, disappointment now, Yamanka. What is uh, sort of the plan out for Levon to make that comeback tomorrow? Well, he just has to reset, refocus, have a chat with his seconds, kind of organise his openings because uh, he, he, there were some very titanic battles and mm. a certain variation. He needs to perhaps adopt a different strategy. And uh, of course, as David mentioned, he loves to exercise. He loves to hike in the mountains, go there, you know, just breathe in life and uh, enjoy the chess. Mm, all right. So we are done with one day of the finals. And this is the standings after that first day in the finals. Levon Aronian. Well, he did lose that last game to Timo Rajabo after they played three draws. And that means that Timo Rajabo, he is the winner of day one in the final. And that means Levon Aronian, he needs to make a comeback tomorrow. He needs to win the second match to take it to tie breaks. It's been a long tournament after the preliminaries. We had quarterfinals, two days. Then we had two days of semifinals. And here they are, Timo Rajavo facing Levon Aronian. And Rajavo, he is up by one point before that final day. And we also see the battle for the third place. They are equal after day one and everything to fight for tomorrow for Dubov and Maxim Vajelograv. But obviously we are mostly excited about that final. And wow, David, they started uh, on scratch today before the first match. Tomorrow we know that Levon needs to make a comeback. What should we expect from second day of the final? Well, I think a bit of more of the same in a way, but Levon, he just needs to take his chances when they come. He had a few moments. He could have just been a bit more ruthless. He needs to somehow feel fresh, feel inspired, just feel invigorated. And um, if he does, we'll see a titanic battle again. Fantastic. And we know the winner takes home $60,000, <laughs> a lot of money at stake as well in the tournament, Yamanka. Yes. And this was the theme for our question of the day. This was our twi Twitter question. Uh, we asked everyone, if you had $60,000, how would you spend it? And we had some very good answers. We had a tweet from Bartek Konet Triskotovsky, who says, for me, it's around 11,000 boxes <laughs> of pizza. <laughs> I like that one. And then another tweet from Vientis, he says, hashtag chess champs. I'd spend the 60k on reforging the shards of Narsil so I could defeat Aronian and the Ring of Power. Mm, and, I appreciate uh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. And then we had another tweet from Maria, Marianne Otetea who says, with $60,000, I'll make amazing places for African people and organize chess competition in every country in Africa. I've always dreamed of this to succeed. People from Africa would love to play chess and will grip and will greatly increase the number mm. of chess players. Good point that um, certainly it would be much harder. And this one is also hey. from female nurse. <laughs> Once upon a time, there were two travelers who found a generous king. <laughs> the three of them were looking for great answers on what to do with $60,000. <laughs> and then we have King David. And while well, we have a pop star, Kaya, yeah. and I'm just dancing with the flowers. I like your, I like your dress, Yvonne. <laughs> yes. And then our winner is from Kai Reimers. Yay! The first part of the $60,000 I would use to invite all of you commentators, including Simon, to a place with good air quality and temperature for your exceptional and entertaining ride throughout the tournament. The rest of my family. <laughs> I love, love, love that tweet. I'm, I'm coming on that journey. Well, Definitely. Congratulations, Kai. You are the winner of one of our Air Things devices and uh, someone will be in contact with you shortly to obtain your details.
Congratulations. Perfect. All right. Well, hopefully we get to travel again in 2021. But before anything of that happens, we have to decide who the winner of the first major in the Champions Chess or the Air Things Masters is. It's going to be Levon Aronian or Timur Rajabov. Timur Rajabov, he is up by one point. So it's going to be so, so exciting when we finish it off tomorrow. We hope to see you again then for a very exciting day of chess. Thank you for joining us and goodbye.